Should he be concerned? About what? What he's just talked about. Oh, Salah's I, form. I switch off with you. <laughs> Honestly, it's the same. Oh. I just go like that. Just, uh... <laughs> oh, all right, Pep. Pep. <laughs> uh, yeah, because the season's unravelling. Uh, the, what am I going to say? His form since he came back, which we sort of, Salah's that is, not Klopp, is was kind of attributed to the injury and the African Cup of Nations and they're coming back injured from that and blah, blah, blah. And it's just going to take time to get back up. But he hasn't looked him old, his old self. He, he just hasn't. And it's either something sublime from Salah, yeah. yes. sublimely good, just you go, wow, where would that come from? Or you just go, oh my God, how has he scored so many goals? Yeah. Some great goals for Liverpool. There's no... There just seems to be no middle ground with this guy at the moment. He's either really on form or he's off form. And unfortunately, he's not the only one at Liverpool at this moment in time, but he's one of the key ones. Yeah. And it couldn't have happened at a worse time of the season for his manager. Uh, that's the thing, is that the timing of this? Yeah, I, I mean, themselves and, and Arsenal now have got themselves in a little bit of a pickle, haven't they? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and that puts the pressure on, the fact that... There's no leeway now, you know, they were top of the league, now now they're not, and so are Arsenal, and all of a sudden, this is good old City are up there again, so that piles the pressure on, and, you know, I think some of the flaws of this Liverpool squad this season are starting to come through, and, and I, again, that's unfortunate for for uh, Jurgen Klopp, but I, if I was going one way or the other, I'm in the camp that they'll at least this weekend pick themselves up and go again. I, I just don't think they're going to have enough to go all the way with City. What do you think is more likely? Than to get things together, finish like a train. Oh, <laughs> well, well, what's the second option? Oh, please? That's, that, that, I, <laughs> I, I think they get themselves up. Right. And and I do think, in the case of Mohamed Salah, what's frustrating with him in particular is that he'll go 85 minutes where he looks like less than an average player, where the ball is just bouncing out his feet, where where he's just having turnover after turnover after turnover, and you. I believe that Stevie has learned how to kind of ignore that, knowing and expecting that at, in the end he's going to get you the game winner. Well, what's happening is that you're getting those 85 minutes in which he's having turnover after turnover after turnover, but that game winner goal is not coming. And so then all the frustration, all the built-in frustration and built-up frustration just shows up and you understand that this is a team that if it's not Mohamed Salah, and you're then leaning on Darwin Nunez, and with Darwin Nunez, it's like, oh, please, please, Lord, please keep it on target, and it doesn't quite happen. And so then you start looking for options, and seemingly you're running out of options for Liverpool. I think they pick themselves up. I think they finish strong, but certainly they win this weekend. There, I cannot see a, a scenario by which Liverpool are not able to, to win this weekend and, and at the very least put some pressure on Manchester City and let them know that they're not going away. I will... you, were going, you were going along pretty well there mm. until you said Stevie has learned well. <laughs> not to shout at the TV. Well, right. We know that, come on. Uh, That's a stretch. Speaking of El Clasico, let's look ahead, shall we, to Real Madrid against Barcelona. Um, tension in the dressing room, says the front page of Sport. This is, of course, after Kundawan criticised Araujo and the manner in which he got sent off in that big Champions League tie. Araujo hit back and said, look, I live by a code of ethics and I'm not going to say anything about it, but I don't feel this is right. Kundawan responded today to what Araujo had to say. Here he is. You know, that's um, how the most successful teams uh, develop, you know, and um, improve by communicating, you know, by uh, looking into each other's eyes, you know, and um, speaking um, for the benefit, you know, of every single person. But also at the end of the day, the ultimate target is for the benefit of the club, you know, because we are all here to make the, the club better, to bring the club in the best possible situation, you know, um, and to be successful. And I think uh, from day one that I'm here, um, everyone is aligned with that. Of course, uh, there are sometimes situations you know, where, you to, where, where you have to clear things. But uh, the intention from every single person in this club is very genuine towards, um, towards the success of this um, amazing club. And uh, that is just uh, to reach our potentials you know, and um, to try to, to, to win as much as possible. 
Uh, Ian, back with us. What's interesting, Craig, that he had that, that this interview was almost an opportunity to say, look, I, I shouldn't have come out and said it. I should have kept it within the dressing room. He hasn't. He's doubled down on it and said, look, I want to get this team better, and by doing this, this will help. No, I, and I completely disagree. Uh, by harnessing good team spirit is if you're going to have a disagreement or a bit of a scrap or be frustrated, you do it in the dressing room. You don't harness any team spirit in any sport by coming out when teammates make a mistake. And that's what it was. It was a mistake. It wasn't the worst decision in the world. He put himself in a difficult position Ronald Arujo with a bad pass. He then had a very, very quick player bearing down and go, what do you do? You don't have five seconds to go, oh, I'll phone a friend. You gotta, you gotta make a decision. He tried to lean on him. He then tried to lean on him, hoping to put him off and, you know, gives away a, a it could have been a penalty and, and uh, he would have saved himself for sending off. Uh, but the referee decided it was a smidge outside the box and, and he goes. So it's not the most egregious poor decision I've ever seen. If he punched somebody or two-footed somebody or did something utterly stupid, then that's different. But he didn't, and for Ilkay Gundogan to come out and say, oh, this is just the most, this is just stupid, it's cost us, is basically what he said. Mm -hmm. It's cost us. I, I think is completely the wrong avenue to go around because the best teams keep it tight-knit. When everybody makes mistakes, and everybody does, people miss chances, people give balls away in the middle of the park, goalkeepers don't come for crosses, and defenders make bad decisions. And when that happens, you keep it in here. That's how you foster. Do you hear Real Madrid doing that at the moment? They foster the spirit at Real Madrid with the injuries and the players they've lost, and they've got it together, and they're in the Champions League semi, they're going to win La Liga, probably, and they've done that not by airing all their dirty linen in public, and that's what he's done. This is a veteran. This is a guy who's won everything domestically. Surely he knows better. He does, but I think Ilkay Gundogan, we have seen this from him before, because following first El Clásico this season, he was very adamant in how disappointed he was with the reaction, reaction or lack thereof inside the locker room, that he wanted to see disappointed players and in fact what he saw, guys that didn't seem to be as affected by the result, the outcome or the performance as they should have been. He said it back then. I imagine that he was asked specifically about the red card and he went with Honesty is the best policy. I'm going to tell you exactly what I believe and disregarding those codes and ethical values mm -hmm. that Ronald Araujo is referring to. My problem with this, and you just mentioned he's a veteran, right? This is a locker room that because of the way it is made up, you have the young guys and you have the much older guys, veteran guys. If indeed you're going to go after one of the young guys, and Ronald Araujo would be kind of the leader, one of the leaders of the young guys, then you also have to go after one of the veterans. And in this game, specifically, there is a very good example of that. When Vitinha is about to shoot the ball on target, ends up being a goal, Robert Lewandowski is the one player that can step out and actually close down the space, and he slow jogs it. He slow jogs into position to where maybe you can make an argument that he's making a challenge, but he really isn't. So, if indeed you're gonna make a, a statement in which you hang out Ronald Araujo out there for everybody to criticize, you also have to then be sort of uh, an equal critical player and say, uh, what about Robert Lewandowski? Mm. And that's where you have a problem. Because you can't pick and choose who is it that you're going to criticize within the team. And that's why you don't begin this process. And, and if you're if you are Ilkay Gundogan, what are you gaining here? In, in being as, I suppose we like it because we have something to talk about. Yeah. But as a team, what do you gain? That didn't resolve an issue on the day. And it hasn't, been, it hasn't resolved an issue during the season. The last thing I'll say about this. I think he's bringing this up because he's been seeing mistakes from Araujo, from Jules Koundé, and really all of the back line from Barcelona throughout the course of the season. And he's saying, I've had enough. I've had enough. I've been asked about it. I'm going to tell you what I think about it. And he didn't think enough in terms of what this, the impact could be in the locker room. Uh, we just got... Uh, well, just one second. He, uh, the, the, the problem is, is that he's frustrated. And I don't agree with the fact that that's the right way to do it because that frustration is not going to help airing that in public. 
but I don't think he. Re Never mind for sure. I, I, I get the feeling he doesn't respect him, and it, but it, right. he made the move. It was his choice. He wanted to go yeah. to Barcelona. Maybe he's getting a bit of sun on his back that he wasn't getting in Manchester, but he's certainly not getting the performances, and he's not playing. What's the well. sun got to do with anything? Well, when the football's not great, at least you're getting a bit of nice weather. <laughs> Manchester, great football. Crap rain, weather. rain, rain all the time. Fish and chips, rain, <laughs> dull and dreary. Barcelona, a bit frustrating. Nice beach, lovely sun in your back. However, and we were talking about this earlier when we did a live class, the build up to the classical show, was did you ever hear him call out one of his Manchester City teammates in public? Mm. And I, maybe, I, I, you know, somebody can prove me wrong and bring Saham up. But if that was, you know, we talked about it, Vincent Company, a big, strong centre half and a leader. Unless Vincent Company, and I don't remember this, ever went through his Man City career without making any mistakes, he never ever called him up, did he? Mm. Never went to the press and said, well, Vincent Company's cost us this big game, Vincent Company's done this, or whoever it may be. He never did, because he respected his teammates. And here I think he doesn't respect them, in my opinion, and he's also given them a lack of respect by saying this. Just before, just before I go to Ian, what should Xavi do, if anything? Not a lot he can do. What do you mean? To, to address this. Do, do you drop him? Xavi's not giving the stuff. Xavi's gone. He's, a, he's on the beach. He's on the beach. He's not Already. quite. He's, he's, got, got, he's back. one leg on the beach and he thought he'd one leg back at Barca. That's <laughs> <laughs> some long legs. They've got to be tight. There's got to be a siege mentality. And I think, you know, he's not going to win too many popularity contests That's with the other players. One or two have gone on Instagram and said, without naming him, look, we win and lose as a team. And that's right. Oh, Ian's all over Instagram. Oh, that was the gram. What if, we there call out, what if we call out bad internet? Is that not been a team player? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't go out and criticise the internet. <laughs> um, what sort of game are we expecting on Sunday? Well, hopefully a good one. I mean, I, I we talk about big games. I firmly believe this is the biggest club game on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one that travels the world globally. It's the biggest for me. I mean, people may argue about you know South America and different places, but. And there are some big games, but th th this is this is the one. It just it just feels like it's not quite hasn't quite had the anticipation this year because of Barcelona's season. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, until recently, well, it was a few weeks now, but Girona we had down as the nearest challengers, and they've taken a bit of a falter, and Barcelona have stepped up. So I, I'm I'm expecting I, I'm expecting an open game because what are Barcelona going to do? A draw is no good to them. Defeat's certainly no good to them. So they've got to, in some sense, go to the Bernabeu and at least take it to this Real Madrid side. If you're going to go down in this, this season, and yeah. it looks that they are, go down fighting. And maybe we'll see that from them this weekend. Uh, let's take a look then at the predictions. How does everyone think this is going to go? Um, we heard Luis Garcia actually uh, earlier on today on our classical special say that he thought oh. it was going to be... <laughs> he thought it was going to be a wait, Barcelona wait, wait. win. Craig, I thought, I thought Barcelona was <laughs> going to bring the right attitude <laughs> and are. mindset and all uh, of that. Uh, but, but, you're going for Real Madrid victory as well? Well, yes, because uh, there's been some conversation as to what the mentality and, and the physicality of the midweek would do against Real Madrid. And I would say, well, I can make that same argument about Barcelona. And if you have both teams that are struggling physically and mentally because of what happened in the midweek, I imagine that it's best to go with a team that is, hey, hey yep. that is carrying positive momentum into this match. And they have a unique opportunity, Real Madrid does, in delivering what I would consider to be the death blow for Barcelona, given no chance. No chance whatsoever. It'd be a great story. Maybe you're back in the title race. No, you're not. And we're going to do it here at home. That's a powerful position to be. I think Real Madrid will thrive in that powerful position and they beat Barcelona 2-1. Don't fret. Yes, sir? You've still got one more shot, at least, before this game kicks off. Yes. To get Luis Garcia to change his Never mind. in a no. million years. Never in a million years. I, I think you've got a chance. No, not a chance. Not a chance at all. You reckon? Uh, you reckon a draw, Ian? Yeah, I think so. Barcelona are unbeaten in 10 games in La Liga and they've not conceded, I think, in the last six games. It's kind of like Xavi's last stand, isn't it? It's Barcelona's fight, really, to save the season. It's dead if they lose this. The big plus for Real Madrid, if they win this game, they go 11 points clear. They can rotate their squad around the semi-final with Bayern Munich. So that's perfect for them.
But I think Barcelona, you know, I remember a couple of seasons ago when Real were on their way to the title and Barcelona came there and won 4-0. I think Aubameyang was kind of in a starring role that mm. day. So it, you know, seems longer ago, doesn't it? But um, yeah, I don't know. It's just a punch. You never know. As I always say predictions are, are there to make fools of us. But yeah, I could see Barcelona getting the draw. Uh, for a lot more on our Clasico, we recorded a Clasico special along with Gemma Soler, Luis Garcia joins us as well, along with uh, Craig and Ali. An hour long. Yeah, you a little over. <laughs> you can check it out now. <laughs>
When we opened up, they started yeah. to show to yeah. do. I like that. Open mouth. He had his mouth open a bit as well. And somebody was talking, which is which I'll put, I'll, I'll say that's you. Yeah. And he's just looking. Yeah. This is this is finding this is seemingly this is my week. Utterly bored. Right. With somebody talking. Okay. Right. <laughs> But, I'm not quite sure where we're going and yeah, which direction no, we're we face. Did you know he just hates press conferences? Yes, clearly. Yeah. Not, I know. I know it can be very. Mundane. Yes. But I was having a little grin when Ali was talking because I had just got this vision in my head right. with Ian's internet. Right. That we come. <laughs> we come. We come back and uh, and we, we go back to Ian and in the background. I don't know why I'm thinking this, but Don Hutchinson is trying to fix his internet. Oh really? Uh, Don and Stevie. To get them both <laughs> around there. To, to, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Let's just get this. Uh, Ian, what have you made of, of Harlan's dip in form? Um, well, you know, the guy's hit, what is it, 90 goals or something as he got here at the, from the start of last season. As long as they're a service. And see, that's the other thing. See, we focus on, on Erling Haaland, rightfully so, because when you go through a quarterfinals of Champions League and he is nowhere to be found, and he was nowhere to be found, Mm. That's the truth. Whether that's the job of Antonio Rudiger or Nacho or whoever else or whatever Real Madrid did defensively, they're wearing many signs of life from Erling Haaland. So that's going to bring a whole lot of attention. But this is a guy whose skill set does not include, I'm going to turn, I'm going to get the ball, I'm going to dribble three guys and I'm going to create a chance myself. I need service. And you don't see Manchester City often providing service. An early cross, whip the ball across, Put it in and allow your big guy to go and get it. That's not part of their makeup as a team. And it's something that they could utilize to broaden their spectrum and their variety of attack. They want to pass through teams. Eventually, if you have a guy that can be dominant, that can be dominant in the air, that can be dominant attacking a ball inside the 18-yard box, put it in there. Just, so, for, just for a change of pace and just to give him a little bit of life. A little bit of, hey, hey, here you go. It's a little something, a little nugget to keep you entertained, to keep you excited to be out here so that you can continue to make your runs. You don't do that as a striker, you lose interest. And in the case of Erling Haaland, he's just not often used in the place that he's most dangerous, and that's inside the 18-yard box. It's not like we finished the game and we went, wow, look, look at the chances he missed. Yeah. The, best two, the best chances fell to fill in this game. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had to have Phil Foden and Kevin De Bruyne. Yep. Kevin De Bruyne got himself a goal, but missed an even easier chance, really. <laughs> Midfielder coming on to it, side foot, no no real pressure, just got to keep it down. Blew his chance. And, you know, every, we've always talked about this, you know, Haaland and the form. And I've always said the biggest problem for them is they lost four goals over two games to Real Madrid. And they all will outscore the opponents doesn't really fly mm. and a lot of times when you're playing against these elite clubs so uh, they can look at the mistakes they made defensively rather than any chances I mean Erling Erling Haaland didn't really miss in the two games any sitters because he had the header that hit the bar but he was he was really shepherded well in Bernabeu and as Ali said they never got a lot of service to him in this game the chances fell to other people and, and they fluffed their lines that's it surely now yeah Hope See, so. there was a, he walked out of a press conference right uh, I think it might have been the night of the game uh, and somebody was banned because of shouting a question about it. I think oh. it might have been Neil Barnett. For, oh, really? Uh, somebody was banned anyway. Uh, so they were all a bit touchy about it. If it was embarrassing, they'll want it. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it just wanted it's somebody... unnecessary. It just wanted somebody... To, I mean, Cole Palmer, obviously, has been, been uh, sensational. And, you know, I think, was it... Did he get a hat-trick or did he get four? I can't remember. Uh, how many he scored in the game? Yeah, he got the four. He got the four. Uh, you know, for Madweki and Nico Jackson to be to be doing that, they just wanted, honestly, they just wanted a heavy slap. They needed somebody to take them to the side and bang their heads together. It's embarrassing. It's all me, 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 isn't it? Yeah. Me, me, me. I want. It's, it's, this is about me rather than you know just letting this 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 young lad who, by the way, is carrying the lot of them pretty much. So it was embarrassing. I think it tells you how it's a little. You know, it, there's no. There needs a. There needs to be a bit more leadership in there. Yes. Both from him, Pochettino, yeah. and some of the players. Uh, and that's the bottom line. Somebody, you know, normally somebody on the field there. I mean, John Terry, captain for years, and then Frank Lampard. Yeah. There have been others. There have been many. Even if Thiago Silva, you know, in his heyday, would have been like, hey, come on. Just absolute stupid. And, and that guy happened to be Conor Gallagher. Yeah. That actually stepped in. And, and you assume that, okay, well, that's where the leadership is coming from. But due respect to Conor Gallagher, <laughs> Look, he's got his own issues as well. And I appreciate the fact that he steps in and said, no, give it, the ball is... Yeah. There's not too many people taking much notice of him.
Correct. I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way yeah. in the Chelsea team. He knows they're not going to dominate games against these kind of teams. But you're in a conundrum. How do we approach it? And I think the way they approached those two teams, two of the, you know, of the four best teams in England, away from home, when everybody thought, ah, you're going to get a bit of a pummeling today. And they went out and they took the game to them and they harassed them, they put them off the strike. A little bit like Liverpool did to City at Anfield. Mm. We've rarely seen City as flustered as we did that day. They got away with it to an extent. Have Chelsea got enough belief to go to Wembley and, and do something similar and say, you know, this team have had a big game in midweek. They lost, they're upset, the pressure's on a little bit, you know, because they're not, they're out of the Champions League. Uh, we can go and we can really get at them. Or do Chelsea say, uh, I'm not quite sure we can do that again, set off and probably get beat. So I'm intrigued to see if they've got the stomach to go and try and take some of this game to Manchester City. I have no idea how they'll approach it, but that was certainly had some semblance of success for them at Villa Park and at the Etihad. Uh, let's take a look, shall we, then, at how everyone thinks this game is going to go. We asked their predictions. Uh, everybody believes that Manchester City are going to win. I mean, you're the same, Craig. Oh, that's oh, well, nice. So nice. clearly, uh, that's cute. That's clearly nice. what they did was they didn't take the pressing game. <laughs> and Clearly, the... everything you said has just been wiped out uh, by that's your prediction. Not, that's uh, normal. Ian, you've got it the tight right. You've got to go to extra time. Yeah, well, I'm remembering as well. Craig's talking about how well Chelsea played at Aston Villa there. Remember how well Chelsea played until extra time in the uh, Carabao Cup final against Liverpool? You know, there were chances at both ends that could have gone either way. They've done well, really, in games against the bigger clubs. I mentioned earlier the 4-4 against Manchester City at Stamford Bridge. And Chelsea, confidence up at the moment as much as it can be after this kind of weird season that they've had. I think they're going to give a very good account of themselves in this game, and I could see them running City quite close on the day. Uh, of course, we'll get a result on the day, won't we? However, news breaking uh, that next season in previous rounds, of course, you would have a replay. That isn't going to happen anymore. It'll be one-off matches. FA Cup war, the FA Cup decision to scrap FA Cup replays angers EFL clubs. We've talked about abandoning the whole competition, actually, uh, since this announcement. Ian, you, of course, followed the FA Cup, commentated on it for many a decade. What do you make of this decision? Well, it's another land grab by the Premier League, isn't it? It's a disgrace, really. It's a slap in the face in the tradition of, of the FA Cup. There have always been replays. I mean, I think the FA started to disband the FA Cup, you know, in its greatness, really. The year they let Manchester United opt out of the competition to go and play in that kind of make-believe world club club cup thing that was going on somewhere in central or south america i can't even remember now that was a disgrace um and they've done this really without really consulting a lot of the clubs in the the efl the football league so i think they've got to look at this again really because they're close to having a bit of a revolt on their hands what do you think craig well i mean there's two a couple of ways of looking at it i think the the irony the uh, anger and irony is coming at it from the fact that as Ian said, the, the bulk of this seems to have been done between the FA and the Premier League. Right? It's everything's to suit the Premier League. Now, if you're looking at the replays, how many replays actually happen for these smaller clubs and how much money do they get out of it? I think it would be quite a small sample. Uh, but then, if you're going to do away with the replays, more, more money has then to, to be guaranteed to filter down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, as somebody, I saw somebody pointing out, if some of these clubs need the replays to keep themselves alive, then obviously they've got to look at the way they're running their ship and their business model. I'm a little bit conflicted because of the whole schedule, but what I don't like, the one thing I don't like about it is how these governing bodies, and particularly the Premier League, can sort of wield its financial muscle and, and obvious strength and dictate what's happening at all the other, uh, all the other uh, stages of the pyramid. Uh, and it's already got enough power, more than enough power. And, and so it, it's a difficult one because we, we are seeing clubs playing a lot of games, but why should that affect the lower league clubs in English football when there's not more money being, being filtered down? I think I wouldn't have so much a problem with the no replays if the Premier League were guaranteeing 
there was even more money filtering down to all these clubs. I would have a less of a problem, is it? But we know they're not doing that. They're holding as much of the money as possible. And the argument of playing a whole lot of games loses value and loses its weight when you consider that it isn't all the teams in the Premier League that are playing a whole bunch of games because not all the teams are involved in Champions League, not all the teams are involved in Europa League or Conference League if you want to take it that far down. And so how many of these teams are actually having this, uh, this number of games that make it worthwhile or at the very least push it to the, to the point where you have to make a decision to disband the replays? Now, I would say that in Copa del Rey, they disbanded the replays. Yeah. And, yeah. and what they did is mandated that all the games would be played at the lower tier opposition or whoever lowest ranked uh, home team or home stadium. And you, you go through the 90 minutes and if nothing happens, then you, you're looking at extra time or you're looking at penalties and that's it. Games and match. And it seems to work in Copa del Rey. I don't know that there was as much as much historical pushback as there is they here in like, the They won't like that, Ali. won't like that. I would Ian, like to see that. Ian, Ian's said, thrown his internet. No, I'm just, I'm just saying what happened in Spain, I've just always, for context. Yeah, I, I like that. And, I've, and I like the fact that, you know, if, if you're a, any team, you go away to the, the, to the smaller team, whether it's the, the National League or, or League Two or whatever, you're automatically you, you're going down there. Uh, I, I do... Uh, I do like that idea, but it's it's just it's, there's no easy answer. To the, to there the never is, Craig. There never is. <laughs>course we'll get a result on the day won't we however news breaking uh, that next season in previous rounds of course you would have a replay that isn't going to happen anymore it'll be one-off matches FA Cup war the FA Cup decision to scrap FA Cup replays angers EFL clubs we've talked about abandoning the whole competition actually uh, since this announcement Ian you of course followed the FA Cup commentated on it for many a decade what do you make of this decision well, it's another land grab by the Premier League, isn't it? It's a disgrace, really. It's a slap in the face in the tradition of, of the FA Cup. There have always been replays. I mean, I think the FA started to disband the FA Cup, you know, in its greatness, really. The year they let Manchester United opt out of the competition to go and play in that kind of make-believe world club club cup thing that was going on somewhere in central or south america i can't even remember now that was a disgrace um and they've done this really without really consulting a lot of the clubs in the the efl the football league so i think they've got to look at this again really because they're close to having a bit of a revolt on their hands what do you think Craig? Well, I mean, there's two, a couple of ways of looking at it i think the the ira the uh, anger and ira is coming at it from the fact that as Ian said, the bulk of this seems to have been done between the FA and the Premier League. Right? It's everything's to suit the Premier League. Now, if you're looking at the replays, how many replays actually happen for these smaller clubs and how much money do they get out of it? I think it would be quite a small sample. Uh, but then, if you're going to do away with the replays, more, more money has then to, to be guaranteed to filter done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and then as somebody, I saw somebody pointing out, if some of these clubs need the replays to keep themselves alive, then obviously they've got to look at the way they're running their ship and their business model. I'm a little bit conflicted because of the whole schedule, but what I don't like, the one thing I don't like about it is how these governing bodies, and particularly the Premier League, can sort of wield its financial muscle and, and obvious strength and dictate what's happening at all the other uh, all the other uh, stages of the pyramid. Uh, and it's already got enough power, more than enough power. And, and so it, it's a difficult one because we, we are seeing clubs playing a lot of games, but why should that affect the lower league clubs in English football when there's not more money being, being filtered down? I think I wouldn't have so much a problem with the no replays if the Premier League were guaranteeing there was even more money filtering down to all these clubs. I would have a less of a problem, is it? But we know they're not doing that. They're holding as much of the money as possible. And the argument of playing a whole lot of games loses value and loses its weight when you consider that it isn't all the teams in the Premier League that are playing a whole bunch of games because not all the teams are involved in Champions League, not all the teams are involved in Europa League or Conference League if you want to take it that far down. And so 
how many of these teams are actually having this uh, this number of games that make it worthwhile or at the very least push you to the, to the point where you have to make a decision to disband the replays. Now, I would say that in Copa del Rey, they disbanded the replays. Yeah. And, yeah. and what they did is mandated that all the games would be played at the lower tier of position or whoever lowest ranked uh, home team or home stadium. And you, you go through the 90 minutes and if nothing happens, then you, you're looking at extra time or you're looking at penalties and that's it games and match and it seems to work in Copa del Rey. I don't know that there was as much as much historical pushback as there is they here in the They won't like that, Ali. They won't like that. I would Ian, like to see that. Ian, Ian's said, thrown his internet. No, I'm just, I'm just saying what happened in Spain, I've just always, for context. Yeah, I, I like that. And, I've, and I like the fact that, you know, if, if you're a, any team, you go away to the, the, to the smaller team, whether it's the, the National League or, or League Two or whatever, you're automatically, you, you're going down there. Uh, I, I do... Uh, I do like that idea, but it's it's just it's, there's no easy answer. To the, to the there never thing. is, Craig. There never is. Well, let's start by showing you some of our other reporters who've been out talking about this game. Alexis Nunes has been with Andrea Nana and Tom Hamilton speaking to Hadji Wright as we look ahead to Manchester United against Coventry. Well, the other semi-final, of course, is an all-Premier League showdown. This is Premier League versus a championship team. But we know that um, when you do play lower division teams, they, they come with everything. This is the biggest night for them. I, it's been a while since United have played Coventry. I think you were 11 years old the last time they played them. So sometimes unfamiliar rivals make it difficult. So how do you approach this semi-final with Coventry? Like a, fi like a, like a big final, no? like a final of Champions League, because at the end of the day, it can be a tricky game. Because uh, if you don't give them respect, you can, you can be they can be disrespectful. No? So we're going to face them like a Premier League team. You know, if they are there, that means they have a lot of quality. So we're going to be ready for them. And for us, it's very important to win. And we are going there with the winning mentality. It's no way to lose this game against them. So we are going there very positive and with all of respect, but we must win. What about Man United? Um, obviously, a huge club. Uh, extremely famous, perhaps not having the best season by their own standards. What, what, what do you make of them as, a, as an opposition? You know, it's a semi-final, it's one game. It could really go either direction. I think um, you have to take that into an account. And I think, uh, yeah, they're obviously a big club with a lot of great players who internationally club level tested and kind of been in these situations before and know how to play through them. But I think um, we'll find our opportunities so hopefully we can uh, create a few good opportunities and um, hopefully um, make them feel the pressure a little bit. We always use this phrase giant killing, but Saturday, Sunday, sorry, would be a, a huge game for you guys if you if you manage to beat Man United. What makes you guys so confident that you can that you can topple them? It's one game. Anything can happen in one game. It's not like we'll have to play them ten times or whatever it may be. It's just one game. Anything can happen in one game. Happen in one game. We just heard Andre or Nana there, Rob, saying that they're treating this like a final. They're going to have to because we're on upset watch here. How big an upset would it be if Coventry were to beat them? Yeah, it, it would be massive. I mean, you know, Coventry are a, are a championship side, a, a good championship side, but still a championship side. And United will be heavy favourites to win that game. So if, if they were to, to lose, it, it would be massive. It would be massive in terms of United season. It would be massive in terms of Eric Ten Hag's future as, as manager. I mean, the one thing that will give Coventry some kind of hope is that they know that they are going to get chances against Man United. I mean, Man United on paper should win this game. And like Hadji Wright just said, that you know, 99 times out of 100. But you never really know what you're going to get with Man United this season. Um, you know, they played Newport County in the FA Cup early in this season, eventually won that game 4-2. But, but Newport had 17 shots and, and they finished, or they're going to finish sort of mid-table in League Two. So that shows you that even against opposition that they should be they do give up a lot of chances they're not great defensively and then we've seen in the last round you know Coventry went to Wolves Wolves are having a great season in the Premier League went to Wolves and won 3-2 in really dramatic circumstances and, and you can understand why Andre Anana is sitting there saying that he, he's going to treat this like a Champions League final because to be honest if they don't treat it like that there's every chance that they may lose this game. If they're not to advance is that the end for Eric Ten Hag Rob? I mean, it, yeah, possibly. Um, I mean, Ineos have been quite clear with Eric Ten Hag in that they don't want to judge him on one game. Um, you know, the season as a whole, 
hasn't been great. You don't want to get in a position where you're judging him on one game against Coventry when anything could happen. You could have a man sent off in the first two minutes. You could get a, a Coventry could get a dodgy penalty. So Ineos have been have been careful to say that Eric Ten Hag will be judged on a on a wider sample size, but it, it certainly wouldn't look good. Wow. If Man United won the FA Cup, Eric Ten Hag could stand in front of us and say, well, you know, in a way this season has been a success because I finished it with a trophy. So if they weren't to win the FA Cup, they were to go out to Coventry in that way at Wembley on um, on Sunday, coupled with everything that's happened in the Premier League, he would be on very, very thin ice. Janish? Sure. I mean, I hear what you're saying. They don't want to judge him on one game. I mean, this has been an unbelievably terrible season. I mean, this is the worst season that I can remember. I mean, you know, we'll get to Coventry because they're not in great form, but I mean, the last four games, I mean, they haven't won in four games and you can make a case. They could have or should have lost all of those games, right? If you look at Bournemouth, if you look at Liverpool, if you, you know, the one that they lost against Chelsea, right? In one game, I mean, uh, uh, Brentford, I sort of can't remember actually now, but they probably weren't all that good anyway. Uh, so, so this is, uh, I mean, I would, if I were in charge, I'd definitely say, uh, look, I mean, if he loses to that, how can you possibly keep him? I mean, even if he gets to the final and say loses to, you know, Chelsea, who are very much like them in a way, right? So it's not the great Chelsea team or to their big rivals, Manchester City. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I think short of winning this competition, uh, I don't see how he keeps his job. And even then, I think you should sit down if you're the brain trust of the entire the entire operation and say, really, I, I mean, is he going to be able to bounce from that? Is he going to be able to continue and develop? players and and you know and and get a get us higher in the table at least in the Premier League next season I mean they're not making the Champions League the 13 points away from the fourth spot I mean 13 points so uh I, I don't know I think this this for Ten Hag is a, a for these players by the way as well because I mean uh, they're part of the failure that, that that has been Manchester United this season in my opinion so so look I, I mean if you Coventry City uh, you you honestly seeing Manchester United uh you give him the respect because you always do it's still a massive club it's at Wembley uh and all of that but I think you you if I was in that dressing room having you know Haji Wright 15 goals and five assists having uh, uh Ellis Sims uh, with 13 goals and that's what matters I like goal scorers if you're going to have a chance as a championship side you better have at least one player that can score they have two players that as you said uh Rob can hurt them as well so look Coventry's lost what three out of five since they've beaten uh Wolves in that great game so they're not in great form and they probably won't make the playoffs uh, uh in the championship but man I'd be sitting there for your Coventry City and saying to myself if there's ever a time to get back to Wembley this is it don't be we afraid Hey, don't be afraid. Now, uh, meanwhile, the other semi-final is Manchester United against Chelsea, an all-Premier League affair. Ahead of it, Rob did catch up with Oscar Bob. It's obviously a little bit of a disappointment last night. You've been around the players this morning. What, what's the mood like in the camp ahead of the Chelsea game this morning? Uh, obviously, everyone's very disappointed, uh, especially in a game where we feel like we had the chances, we created the chances. Uh, and we're the better team, but unfortunately it didn't go our way. Uh, but I think it gives us a lot of motivation to bounce back on Saturday and get into the final. I'd to say it's, it's a group that haven't really experienced with losing. Mm. Is it a group that finds it quite easy to, to put disappointments behind them and, and bounce back when you've got such a big game so quickly afterwards? I think so. I think. Uh, there's a couple, or quite a few players that have been around for a, a long time. Um, I was thinking earlier about the Champions League exit. I think it was two years ago against Real Madrid yeah. away uh, when they scored those two late goals. And uh, even though that happened, that was the same season as uh, uh, you know Gundo scored yeah. late against Villa. Yeah. And in a way that was what that season was remembered for so I think there's still a lot of players that played in those games and still won that Premier League and uh, uh, yeah I think the group if any group can do it it, it will be this one.
there, Rob. What's your feeling on what we're going to see now? A City even more dangerous given the, the way that they had to exit Champions League against Real Madrid. And on top of that, as well, there's been all that talk of Haaland and Kevin De Bruyne wanting to come off and Pep Guardiola making that public as well. So there just seems to be a lot going on right now there. Yeah, I mean, Oscar makes a good point there in that the, the way they went out to Real Madrid two years ago was so dramatic and that they were able then to go on and, and win the Premier League. You know, put that disappointment behind them and, and go on and finish the job in the Premier League. And I, I, I would expect them this season to go and finish the job in the Premier League. That said, I, I would be worried for them against Chelsea on Saturday. Um, you know, they played 120 minutes against Real Madrid. In extra time, they looked absolutely out on their feet. Guardiola regularly calls this week the worst week of the, of the season because it's always the, the second leg of the Champions League quarter-final, followed by the FA Cup semi-final at Wembley. City aren't happy at all that they were asked to play on Wednesday against Real Madrid and then have been given the Saturday semi-final. They think that they should have been given the Sunday semi-final and, and had a day's extra rest. You, know, you mentioned there about um, you know the players who came off against Real Madrid. De Bruyne had to come off, Haaland had to come off, Akanji had to come off. Um, it means probably that, that Pep Guardiola is going to have to, to rotate his squad a little bit. Chelsea, meanwhile, have played on Monday, um, beating Everton 6-0. Cole Palmer scored a hat-trick. They've had a whole week to prepare for this. Um, I would really worry for, for City, even though that, you know on paper again, you know, City should win this game because of their form in the Premier League. Chelsea haven't been great this season. But there's a lot of people at City, players included, who are looking at this game and, and thinking, you know, we could really go out here. Um, they beat Sheffield United in the FA Cup semi-final last season, but the three previous seasons, they lost at this stage. They lost semi-finals to Liverpool, to Arsenal and to Chelsea. And Guardiola puts all that down to fatigue. He said that he's, in all those games, he had to rotate players. The other team were, were able to put a full-strength team out and, and on the day, they just didn't have enough. And Chelsea, again, you know, just like Coventry in the other game, Coventry looking at the Man United game thinking we've got a great chance here. Chelsea looking at this City game on Saturday and thinking if we're ever going to beat City in, a, in an FA Cup semi-final, this is it. You know, we're, we're fresh, we're ready, we're in some kind of form. City have had a disappointment on Wednesday. They all look absolutely shattered. You know, really, Chelsea have got a great chance of, of causing something of an upset here. Just want to touch on the Cole Palmer point there, Rob, with you, because he's top of the Premier League charts right now, level with Haaland on goal scored, 20 at the moment. Would Man City take him back now? Well, yeah, I probably. I mean, he, Pep Guardiola in his news conference today was asked the question, was was it a mistake to let Cole Palmer go? And he kind of shrugged as if to say, well, yeah, obviously now, you know, knowing what we know now that he's scored 20 goals in the Premier League and 23 in all competitions. The point that Guardiola made, though, was for two years, Cole Palmer's been asking to leave. He says that this isn't a situation where in the summer he knocked on the door and said, I need to go. Guardiola was adamant today in his news conference that for two two seasons, Cole Palmer's been saying, I want to go. And that was all down to, to minutes. Um, he wasn't getting the, the minutes at City that he's been getting at Chelsea. The final straw apparently for him was in the summer when Riyad Mahrez left to go to, to Saudi Arabia. He thought that that was his chance probably to, to maybe get some real game time at City. And then City went out and bought Jeremy Doku anyway, who plays in a very similar position. And when Cole Palmer saw that Jeremy Doku was, was coming in, decided, well, that's that's it. I, I need to go. Um, I need to go and find regular first team football. Uh, you know, At the time, City thought they got a great deal for Cole Palmer. He was a young player who hadn't really played very much. You know, 42 and a half million pounds they thought was a great deal for a player like that. Um, and even though he was very, very highly rated, I'm not sure that anyone really saw Cole Palmer producing the type of form that he has done this season. Everyone knew at City that he was a good player. You know, did people think that he was a 20 goal Premier League forward at 21 years old? Probably not. You know, in hindsight now, it, it does look a little bit of a mistake for, for City. Who have you got, Janish, in this game? Yeah, I mean, mistake just quickly, you know, I mean, Foden was more patient. Same situation, right? I mean, sometimes you have to wait. If Pep Guardiola was absolutely sure that he was the man, he'd probably give him a time. But it could be a mistake. All coaches make mistakes. I hope that, uh, you know, uh, it's a big game, right? Because against some of the big teams, I mean, he scored some goals. United, four actually, I think this season, but we know where United is. Uh, so this is the sort of game that I think if Chelsea are going to have a chance, by the way, then Cole Palmer, Palmer ha is going to have to be at their best because uh, although I hear you, this is the probably best time for Chelsea uh, uh, to do it. I mean, they have zero excuse uh, uh, not to do it. I still think that 
even with the fact that Kevin De Bruyne and Holland and Manuel Kanji uh, asked all out, you know, I mean, it looks a bigger issue with Holland, who, by the way, was not existent in both legs, and and I think they can deal without him. They have done it in the past. Uh, they'll do it again. John Stones will come in, uh, and I still think that Manchester City uh, will find a way to to win a trophy and beat Chelsea here. Against Bayern Munich, talk to us about what you think is going to happen here. Well, by the way, we all got our predictions right, did, did we not? We had, for sure, we had this final four. Uh, I didn't. Interestingly enough, the one that I got, I got right was Dortmund. Uh, I don't know why Dortmund of all the uh, other favorites, but anyway, I mean, you know, uh, we've seen this uh, movie before on numerous occasions uh, when it comes to Real Madrid and Bayern Munich, and there's probably a reason for that, right? Uh, they are royalty of of this competition. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and 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 it's not just for the past, but in particular for uh, what they did in their uh, in the you know in the last matches, because I don't think they necessarily were the favorites. I'm not saying that Real Mad uh, Madrid are underdogs but I think after that result uh, at the Bernabeu 3-3 everybody felt that maybe we're going to see the same story as we did uh, did last season Manchester City are going to see it through they didn't through a, a, a extremely good performance from uh, Real Madrid heroic uh, in in maybe not a desperate way because some seem to uh, suggest that uh, and I certainly won't because I thought it was a tremendous uh, display of what Real Madrid are all about and same could be said about Bayern Munich uh, with Thomas Tuchel uh, knowing that he's not going to be in, uh, there at the end of the season uh, astute tactician as we all know right uh, Thomas Tuchel I think if you give him one or two games so he's done it with Chelsea when he came in January remember when they won it uh, I don't necessarily think that this was a superb Chelsea team certainly not their, one of their best uh and he saw it through and and once again he did his homework watching arsenal play against porto and took care of um you know the likes of Saka with the white game in general and 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 saw it through so again i'm looking forward to it uh, massive two clubs that have been or have met in this competition so many times that i don't even remember he was definitely helped along though Tuchel wasn't he because we actually saw a desire from these Bayern players that perhaps we haven't seen too much at all in the Bundesliga this year. This is a competition they showing themselves to want. They worked so hard in that game against Arsenal. Well they did. I mean obviously it helps a little bit that uh, that this is the only thing that's left for the mighty Bayern Munich. Uh, uh, you know don't forget about that because that plays a big role. I'm not saying if they were the champions of Bundesliga right now uh, uh, that they wouldn't uh, go for it but I think the momentum and, and confidence would have been so much different. So I think we always knew that this Bayern Munich team has been underperforming. There's a reason why Thomas Tuchel resigned um, otherwise he'd probably be forced to uh, uh, to go uh, and, and certainly you can't look at the season uh, as a good one because it hasn't been so uh, it's one way of uh, I suppose or a chance to salvage a little bit because there's so much quality in that team. Real Madrid's second leg at the Bernabeu Janish I know that's a big big deal when it comes to a tie like this. Of course, and we've seen uh, what, what uh, Real Madrid are capable of. As they've shown against Manchester City, uh, they're capable of going away, but certainly at the Bernabeu, a little bit like Atleti, right? I mean, they're a different team when they're home uh, and uh, when they're away, uh, uh, you know, they. Uh, they've gone through a gauntlet of teams a couple of seasons ago when they won it. They beat just about everybody, uh, you know, in terms of the big boys. So uh, uh, it, it certainly is an advantage. Uh, but but this time around, it's not just an advantage. Uh, uh, not just an advantage of second leg, but they are, I believe, slightly uh, uh, better team than Bayern Munich. So they, they'll be favourites, no doubt. They, they are favourites for me now to, to win it all. There you go. You've just answered my next question. So you've got Real Madrid in the final here. But who will they be facing? The other game is PSG against Borussia Dortmund. And I'll start with Borussia Dortmund because you said that's one team that you did pick. And it's not that surprising when you watch the Bundesliga because one thing we know about Borussia Dortmund 
is to expect the unexpected. You're just as surprised either way with them if they either play really bad or they play really well. Well, they have the pedigree as well. Uh, the teams that are left have the pedigree to a, to a larger degree or smaller degree, obviously in terms of winning. But they've won this competition. They've been very consistent over the seasons, even if things don't go well for them in the Bundesliga, which is the case as well for them because they're fighting for their lives. Uh, uh, to, you know, to get back. Although no, because five places are in Liga, so they're, they're fighting. They're they're fighting for it right now. Uh, but but they are a much different team in the, in the Champions League, and I think you know maybe that pedigree, maybe a little bit of experience with some of these players, key players that are still remaining with the squad of uh, of Dortmund, uh, uh, helps a bit. And as I've mentioned, Atleti away from home, not always the greatest uh, a team. Um, so um, yeah, I, I just felt that. Uh, you know, that one goal, remember, because, I mean, it was all Atleti in the first leg. And the first half alone, I think it should have been maybe 4-0 for Atletico Madrid. But it didn't happen. Some key substitutions. What I like about this Dortmund team, the couple of players that are so key to them are finally coming good. And one of them is Julian Brandt, one of my favorite players. Uh, you know, we not, we talk now so much about Bayer Leverkusen. Remember, you know, uh, when he was leaving, when, when Brandt was leaving Leverkusen, I think it has taken all these years now, finally, for me to see the brand from years ago, because uh, uh, he was the spark plug in the game in the game against uh, Atleti uh, away when he came uh, came in the second half, and and here he was absolutely wonderful. And and you know if you look at Zabitzer, my goodness, uh, I mean it's just all of a sudden you know against Gladbach, couple goals, also had that that, that weird penalty, didn't he? Uh, yeah. he scored, but it was then called back. And then in this game, a great goal and two incredible assists. Uh, the the cross to uh, to full crew for that header was uh, picture perfect. So, um, so you know, it's good when you key players uh, uh, contribute and start playing, you know, to that degree as well. We've seen their wide games as dangerous with that Amy and all that. So, uh, I, I like them against Atleti. Here, it's a different ball watch. And, and I'm saying that. But what are they going to, what, what's going to be their problem here against the PSG side with Kylian Mbappe? And if Kylian Mbappe is on his day, I just think that after all these great years, after the, the plastic project, after the Messi's, Neymar, the Mbappes of the world, the, the Galacticos of, 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 you know, or the second Galacticos, if you will, because you have to consider how much Madrid did, the real Galacticos. But, you know, as close as it comes to that, uh, after that push, which by the way was unsuccessful, although we have to say that uh, PSG were in the semifinal and the final of this competition, but now they changed it. Lucho has the experience, an incredible coach. He's trusted uh, the young players because there is a turn turnaround in terms of philosophy at PSG where they no longer want these big, big names. They want to keep some of the young French players that have gone elsewhere. Why have they gone elsewhere? Because there's no place for them uh, to be uh, amongst the Galacticos. They would never get a chance. Uh, uh, you know. So, so what I'm seeing right now is that belief. It's it's obviously I would imagine a lot less pressure now because nobody expected uh, uh, PSG to be where they are right now. But Usman Dembele, Lucio found a way to kind of rein him in somehow, right? Remember all the issues he's had. And by the way, Usman Dembele uh, uh, just played against uh, Barcelona's former team, and now he's going to be playing against uh, uh, Borussia Dortmund. And remember how he left. Nobody really knows because. If I remember correctly, Dortmund didn't even know where he was and, and what happened to him when, when he's left. So that's going to be interesting. But it seems that uh, uh, Lucio Enrique has found a way to uh, for him to be not selfish. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of goals, but he's one of the most dangerous players in, in all of Europe in terms of his contributions. Uh, so, you know, the story goes on and on and on. And Kylian Mbappé, um, um, obviously, probably wants to play against his future team. Assuming that Real Madrid, by my predictions, are going to be there, right? He's going to be taking the fifth and final penalty shot when PSG meet uh, Real Madrid. I don't you've know. got you've got PSG Real Madrid in the final. Going to penalties? Uh, phew, yeah. I mean, right now it's so early that I could say anything. People will forget, right? Uh, um, yeah. Why? Well, you know? Um, no, I don't know if it's going to be penalties. Uh, I don't want to see that. I don't want to. I don't want these players to go through what we saw with Manchester City. Another, you know, not just 30 minutes of of extra time, but you know, uh, 40, whatever it may be. So I'm going to go um, normal time. Normal time, and the winner is 
I'm sticking with Real Madrid. I mean, this this Man City was always like in seasons past. I mean, I don't want to see it was early final, but you know, I felt that one of those two teams would be favorites to win it. So have to have to um, hats off to Real Madrid. What an incredible, incredible performance! The, the best uh, case scenario for Real Madrid, if that were the case, would be like the World Cup final, where it's Real Madrid who win it. But even though he doesn't win it, Kylian Mbappe has an incredible performance that everybody praises. So they would win-win that way, knowing that's who they're getting. And yeah, because the, because the other scenario is, you know, I mean, you know, if PSG wins it and Mbappe plays a, a large role in it, I mean, you know, fans forget, but I, I think the the welcoming committee would be, I don't know, confused, so. confused, confused. It's a bit confusing of who to pick between Roma and Leverkusen in the Europa League because this is a great <laughs> story behind these. We've got. Here's the bracket, right? So we've got Marseille Salanta on one side of it. We'll get to that in a minute. Just a quick comment on that, to be honest. But Roma against Bayer Leverkusen is quite fascinating, really, because obviously we all know Bayer Leverkusen are now Bundesliga champions. Everything that Xabi Alonso has done with this team, 44 match on beaten run squad, loads of goals, just absolutely doing what they set out to do every week. They've been brilliant. And obviously they're still in this competition. They're still in the Pokal. They're in the final of that. So it could be three trophies for them at the end of the season. But Roma, since Daniele De Rossi took over, have really changed. And it's like they're all on board with Daniele De Rossi. Things are looking really good for them. And here they are now in a semi-final. It's quite hard to call this one, Yanish. What do you think of it? Yes, it is. I mean, you know, logically right now thinking, you know, it isn't hard for me because, we, it, yeah, we talk so much about Xabi Alonso, but we have to talk about Daniela De Rossi because now Roma are quite uh, uh, watchable. And this is not necessarily a dig towards uh, Jose Mourinho on my part, but it's obvious. Uh, everybody's enjoying playing. It's a different way of playing. I think, you know, at the very least, you have to give credit to Jose Mourinho because he's he's put a foundation, right? I mean, that's his team. He's put a foundation, winning trophies in Europe for the first time in history. Uh, so, so, so that is important. But obviously, the way these same players are performing and playing under Daniela De Rossi is totally different. Uh, uh, to that of uh, of Jose Mourinho, so Daniel De Rossi gets you know a young manager just like Xabi Alonso, uh, an experience uh, to a degree. Um, but but I think Leverkusen is is, is deeper. It, it's more talented in this one. Uh, the fact that they're uh, home in the second leg obviously uh, obviously is important. Although Roma hey, they won at the San Siro, uh, but but yeah, I, I would have to say Leverkusen. It's not necessarily because of, you know what's in front of them, how much they can win. It's just that when you watch them, uh, the, the sort of never panicking, playing the same way, the ability to change from game to game, six or seven players, and not. Nothing changes. The level doesn't drop off. It did a little bit uh, uh, against West Ham away, but look at how they recover, right? Yeah. No panic. You know, you bring in Frimpong and, you know, that, that changes the game just a little bit. A couple other players as well. So you have to say, uh, looking at the depth of teams, when we get to that, obviously there's going to be some other games um, uh, that are going to be taxing for both sides. Uh, I think that Leverkusen uh, uh, would have to be a, a favorites here. Yeah, Leverkusen always come alive after minute 85. The stats show it, and everybody who watches knows. There's a reason for that. I explained to you when we did the Champions. <laughs> I know. The, 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 you know, uh, people think that it's desperate them. and it's in the end. They find a way of what happens if yeah, one day they, they, they don't. That's not all about that. I mean, they sap you of energy. They continue yeah. to play the same way. Uh, they're a little bit like Manchester City, aren't they? Manchester City at their best when they have possession and they probe and they look for it. Something that they weren't able to do against Real Madrid, but they were close a couple of times. That happens in a game, but I don't necessarily think that this is this Bayer Leverkusen that kind of gets lucky in the end or or there's some story or destiny uh, behind all of that. Uh, I, I think it's very much calculated. When they score early, yeah, they can run it up like they did against Werder Bremen. And, uh, but, you know, sometimes it takes time to break down very, very good teams. And I suspect Roma is going to be one of them. Give me a quick pick on Marseille, Atalanta. Oh... Pierre Emerick Aubameyang, that's his that's his uh, competition, isn't it? I mean, scoring, uh, scoring. I don't know if he's last one. I don't think he did. In the right, uh, but anyway, um, uh, Gasparini. I mean, what a story. Bergamo. Uh, I mean, a uh, little bit of bias here, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna give it to Atalanta.
Hi there, this is the Athletic FC podcast weekend preview. It is match day 34 in the Premier League, but we also have the FA Cup semi-finals. My name is Adam Leventhal. Welcome if you are listening, if you are watching on YouTube as well. Alongside me is Tim Spears. It's lovely to be back in the studio with you, feeling your, your warmth, your vibes. Yeah, yeah, you too, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, Tim is here and Liam is also here, but remotely. How are you, Liam? Uh, not so good now. I felt that, that passive aggressive dig at my non-presence. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, no, I was remote last week. So I'm, I'm, I'm all aboard the remote train. So do not take it as a slight. Um, I wanted to ask both of you before we kick on with, with everything that we're going to be looking ahead to. I wanted to talk about penalties because Tim... Obviously, we've had a, a big Champions League week. Obviously, didn't go to plan for Arsenal against Bayern Munich. Didn't go to plan for Manchester City against Real Madrid. And it came down to penalties. And you wrote in depth about the penalty shootout. Did you enjoy that process? Uh, yeah, do, do you know? Yeah, it was, yeah. It was okay. Because you get to sort of pause and look at all this, the facial expressions. And, the, and you notice things that you wouldn't do normally. I found the person who nicked the ball... From after uh, nice. after Modric hoofed it into the, the the stand behind the goal, which was proved very costly because yeah. that ended up being thanks to due to my research yeah. the longest wait in between penalties by almost double. Uh, Bernardo Silva had to wait a minute before he took his penalty, it's which a ended big part up being, of it. So the fan who nicked the ball cost their team. Interesting. If you want to read more about it, I mean, it's on the Athletic right yeah. now, isn't it? Yeah. So we've got two three o'clocks on Saturday. Luton against Brentford, Sheffield United against Burnley. We will be talking about the relegation scrap later on, which involves obviously all four of those teams. Then at 5.15, it is Man City against Chelsea at Wembley in that first FA Cup semi-final. We'll have a focus on that as well. Then back to the Premier League at 7.30 on Saturday. Arsenal trying to get back on track against Tim Spears' Wolves at Molyneux. Yep. How much would you give for one day yeah. you to manage Wolves? That's not going to happen. Uh, uh, owning, maybe. Oh, yeah. oh so, so owning the club is more that's likely my only, than... That's my only route now. Okay. I've got to win the lottery and then, and then I'd buy Wolves. Okay, yeah. fine. So there's still a chance. There's still a chance. <laughs> we digress. Um, back onto Sunday... Uh, we've got Everton against Nottingham Forest, also part of that relegation scrap chat that we'll have a little bit later on. That's at 1.30. Uh, Crystal Palace against West Ham and Aston Villa versus Bournemouth is at 3 o'clock on Sunday. And then it is Fulham against Liverpool at 4.30. And then sandwiched between those Premier League games on Sunday is the other cup semi-final. Wolves' is Conquerors, Coventry against Manchester United. But we're going to be starting with Manchester City against Chelsea. So it is indeed the first semi-final. And Liam, let's focus on, on Chelsea first of all, because it's been another strange season for, for the fans, for the, for the people covering the, the side as well. Um, they're ninth in the Premier League, albeit they do have that game in hand. And if they win, they're going to be up to sixth potentially in the league. They've still got a chance to, to get into Europe via the Premier League. There's still a lot to play for. But it does feel like there's a lot riding on this this FA Cup semi-final and, and the potential of winning a trophy. Um, has there been a, a lot of focus behind the scenes on on winning the FA Cup, or is it just a byproduct of a of a topsy turvy season? I don't know if it's necessarily been a focus, but naturally, as the further you get into these tournaments, the more prominent it becomes in in the minds of the players, in the minds of the coach and in the minds of supporters that, that winning it could be a possibility. I mean, that notion took a blow when they drew Manchester City in the semi-final, yeah. just as it did last year when they drew City away in the third round of both domestic cups. That kind of uh, scuppered any notion of of lengthy cup runs at the, at the very start for Graham Potter. Um, but it is there for them now. You know, I, th I think they they know that they've played Manchester City well twice this season in two very, very different games. And so I think they will fancy themselves to a degree 
to come up with a game plan that causes City problems and to execute that game plan at a level that means we've at least got a competitive game at Wembley. Uh, I don't really expect it to be like the 4-4. I expect it to maybe be a little bit more like the 1-1 that the Etihad. Um, but no two games against the Pep Guardiola team are the same, I don't think. I think he'll have spent a long time looking at that Etihad match and how Chelsea cause City problems, the kinds of traps that they set for them in possession, what they did with Rodri in particular, Conor Gallagher shadowing him. And I'm sure Pep will have some left field uh, manoeuvres of his own in, to, to try and shake things up a bit. But there, there is a degree of confidence from Chelsea. They, they, they've played City well and they've tended to lift it again for the better teams this season. Tim, I want to talk to you about wounded animals, mm. if that's OK. Um, are City going to be a wounded animal that's, you know, sad and down and literally licking their wounds? Or are they going to be like a, a cat that we were talking about off air <laughs> that's very, you know, aggressive right. and, and defensive and is going to attack because oh, they, want to, they want to get revenge and, and want to make up for that bitterness of losing out? on the Champions League. Uh, crikey, there's a lot There's a lot to unpack there. Mm. Uh, are they going to be sad, you said? Yes, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's quite a quick turnaround. Guardiola's probably cursing the fact that this isn't on Sunday. Um, I mean, the games come so thick and fast. That this literally only happened very late last night and we're already talking about, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's coming up very quickly on Saturday. Um, I think this, this is going to define the run-in as, as to how these teams cope with their European exits. We spoke on last week's show about the possibility of City v Arsenal in the semi-final yeah. of the Champions League and how that would impact the run-in around it. Well, yeah, they're both out of Europe, so how do they come back from adversity this weekend? We've seen with, with Liverpool how the first leg of the Atalanta game had such an impact on Palace game for me last weekend. So, yeah, I think it's a good time to play City um, when you've got Rodri asking for time off and when you've got Haaland and De Bruyne apparently asking yeah. to be substituted last night. I'm not sure if it was as clear-cut as that but Guardiola basically said, yeah, they asked to come he on. He referenced that, didn't he? Yeah. Which I find astonishing in the biggest game of the season that they're feeling a little bit too tired to carry on. Not sure about that, but still, it kind of reflects um, the position that they're in. It's been a very draining title race. Um, Liverpool looked knackered against Palace last weekend. Arsenal looked very tired against Munich last night. They looked like they were running on empty, players like Saka in particular. So, yeah. Um, how you cope with that fatigue and, and adversity is going to be key to what all these clubs do in the next few weeks. Let's talk about Cole Palmer, Liam. Um, how much have you enjoyed watching his his journey so far this season and how surprised have you been um, how much he's exceeded expectations? I mean, because there wasn't necessarily any any expectation of him really this season, was there? Well, the only expectation there was of him from outside Chelsea came in the form of a piece that we did for The Athletic shortly after the, the summer window concluded, where we spoke to a load of agents anonymously. And he was the consensus pick mm. as the worst signing of, I believe, deadline day, but it might have been the entire window. Um, people couldn't understand why Chelsea had paid so much for a guy who was buried in Manchester City squad, who barely played in the Premier League to that point. And they all know exactly why now. You know, he, he's really you know an emerging premier league superstar i don't think that's too strong to say this is a, a large enough sample size and he's been consistent enough that it merits that kind of that 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 kind of billing um and the biggest surprise for me has been that he was good from day one from the moment he started playing in this team he's shown the qualities that you see from him now just making good decisions whenever he gets the ball and taking responsibility, assuming a leadership role in what is a very young squad. And when I say leadership, I don't mean, you know, ordering players about and, and acting like a captain, but being like a technical leader on the pitch, you know, someone who always wants the ball, who wants the, the burden of scoring or creating. And I don't think, we haven't seen enough of those players at Chelsea, actually, in the last few years. And for someone who wants that, but is also good enough to justify it regularly, while being also a natural showman. I mean, you, you look at his first goal against Everton, the nutmeg 
uh, of Branthwaite, the little flick round the corner and, and then the finish. That's one of the best goals of the season mm. by anyone. It, and it sums up Cole Palmer. It's not just the quality, it's the swagger and the general way that he carries himself on the pitch. Are you a big fan of Cole Palmer? In terms of, of him taking responsibility at such a young age and such an inexperienced player. Yeah. It's not like he's been around the lower leagues on loan for the last few years. He's just come in from playing uh, on Man, uh, Man City's academy pitch to, to do this in the Premier League and just looks totally cool with it all. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, he's, what, the form player in the country at the moment, mm. probably, certainly in terms of goal scoring. I think it's 11-6, and six, mm -hmm. which is insane. Um, and yeah, high motivation for him to do it on an extremely big stage on Saturday. Yeah, obviously against his his former side. I mean, is it is it? I hate to use a cliche, but is it written in the stars that he's going to play a, a match winning role, or do you think that well, this is a, a strange one? I suppose because depending on the the real reason why Pep Guardiola sold him or allowed him to be sold, we don't necessarily know if it was linked to you know, FFP and balancing the books and thinking, well, yeah, he's a superstar that, or potential superstar that we we have to sell. We're not going to sell X rather than Y. So yeah, he's the one that, that goes. But it does look like a misjudgment. Presumably Pep Guardiola will be able to have a plan now for him, even though he's going to be in the opposition dressing room, do you think, Liam? I think he'll definitely be the player that Guardiola is most worried about because Chelsea's attacking plan to a certain extent, it's been like this for most of the season, but it's become increasingly so in recent weeks. It's just give the ball to Cole Palmer and, and see what decision he makes because more often than not, he will pick the right option. Um, and particularly in the game at the Etihad, all of Chelsea's best attacks, and there were quite a lot of them for the first 60, 70 minutes, even though they only scored once, came from Palmer, either initiating the move with a, with a line-breaking pass or you know, committing a man, he, he nutmegged Bernardo Silva at one point. You know, he, he just, he has the ability to create time and space for himself, which is what all of the, the really impressive players uh, can do. And so I do think Guardiola will be thinking about him a lot. As for it being a, a, a misjudgment, we've never got the impression, uh, I'm sure our colleague Sam Lee could talk at more length about this, but we've never got the impression from Manchester City that there's a huge amount of regret um, I think they, they felt that Palmer just wasn't going to get the minutes for them that he's getting for Chelsea and, and to get the, the the size of the role that he's getting for Chelsea. You know, it's one thing to be the, the creative hub of a team that is in mid-table fighting for 6th, 7th and another to be integral to a team that won the treble last year and has a a very strong argument to still be considered the, the best team in the world. Um, and I, I think from Palmer's perspective as well, he was looking at it thinking, Kevin De Bruyne is the man at Manchester City today. Phil Foden looks like the man at Manchester City tomorrow. Um, is it ever going to be my day? You know, and I think he's already the man at Chelsea. So in that sense, it's really paid off for him immediately. And I, in terms of the money City banked, I mean, they did did some of their own business that they wanted to do, signing Jeremy Doku. There's there's an argument that it it's worked out best for everyone. But of course, if if Palmer goes on to beat Manchester City in this game and play well against them for the next 10 years, then we could look upon it differently. He's the exception rather than the rule as well when you consider the amount of money that, that Chelsea have spent and that, that £1 billion pound figure is bandied about and used as a massive stick to, to beat the Bowley era. Um, and you analysed it recently. It's an article that you should dig out and not you, Liam, obviously you wrote it, but people listening um, <laughs> should dig out and read because you worked out that only four of the recruits of the one billion dollar crew have been on the pitch for more than 75 percent of Chelsea's available first team minutes since arriving. Cole Palmer amongst that group with Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo and Axel de Sassi as well. Um, when you look at the that big headline figure, is there any part of you that thinks this has gone to any sort of plan so far? Or is this £1 billion figure always going to look like a mistake, especially at the beginning when it looked 
a little bit misguided. Well, one thing I've discovered since that piece went live is that from the publicly reported transfer fees, I actually underestimated Chelsea's transfer spend because once their accounts dropped, we we saw that it's actually 1.2 billion uh, over the over these first two years of Bowley Clear Lake ownership that they spent on transfers. Maybe that includes uh, the the rather lofty agent fees that made headlines as well. Um, but yeah, it's there, there, there's no argument that it's worked as a strategy in the short term because a lot of these players have not lived up to transfer fees that honestly, you know, in some cases were, were always setting them up with impossible expectations. Uh, certainly in the case of Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo, Mikhailo Mudrik, it, it's really hard for young players to justify fees like that. Um, but also I think it's it's clearly not worked because of where Chelsea are in the league. They didn't drive this squad overhaul and spend this much money thinking that the rebuild would be this painful, that they would be mired in Premier League mid-table. They thought they could do this and still be competing for Champions League qualification at a minimum. And I think the fact that they haven't been doing that is a reflection on the Premier League being much stronger than they thought it was. But also the players that they've signed either not being as good as they thought they were or not being as good right now and and needing a bit more time. And there are bigger questions about the wisdom of constructing an entire squad essentially of under 23s. Is that the best way to develop them all? Is that the best environment to create? You saw the Real Madrid team that knocked Manchester City out. They, They have young players, but they seem to have got succession planning down to a fine art. Uh, and their and their players, their young players already play like champions. Um, there's no one doing the the Tony Cruz or Luka Modric role really at Chelsea in terms of mentoring, uh, and that that's a bit of an issue. Um, and yeah, so there are big strategic questions, and it there may well be in time a lot more success stories than, than just Cole Palmer, unqualified success stories that we can look at and say, yeah, Chelsea did good business here, but it's not obvious right now. Tim was um, shot me down because I suggested that Maurizio Pochettino had, had done well or wasn't doing as badly as everyone else was making out. Does he need to win the FA Cup and or finish in Europe to keep his job. The evaluation that will take place of him at the end of the season, and we know there will be one because he's he's got one year, one guaranteed year left on his contract with a with a year option. It's never been explained to us in in clear terms in terms of competition targets. The the impression we've always been given is that the way that the co-sporting directors, Lawrence Stewart and Paul Winstanley, Stanley, and of course, by extension, the owners, will look at Pochettino's performance will be a bit more all-encompassing than that. It will be, is the team moving in the right direction performance-wise? Are individual players developing in the way that it was hoped they would develop? And are there relationships building within this team that can provide a foundation for the next great Chelsea team. I think those are more important than did they go out in the semi-final of the FA Cup or get to the final or win it. Obviously, it would be very nice to win it and it can't hurt Pochettino just as winning the Carabao Cup couldn't couldn't hurt him. I mean, losing it in the fashion they did probably hurt him slightly. Uh, and finishing sixth in the Premier League would definitely be better than finishing 11th. But it's going to be more about those those bigger picture things because ultimately I think the the only concrete target that would have really moved the needle for Pochettino is the one that's out of his reach, which is uh, Champions League qualification. Let's get our predictions then. Tim, you uh, got one right last week, by the way. You predicted that Villa were going to win at Arsenal. I think you were just being contrary at the time, just Thanks. just for the just for the record, because everyone was predicting. Well, everyone can go back and listen. And, and no, they can. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You got yeah. one right. Um, your prediction this week for the FA Cup semi-final between Manchester City and Chelsea. 
Well, is it is it relevant? Does it matter what I say? Of course it does. But you're just saying I'm being contrary but if, if I'm saying one thing one way or the other. Well, what's more important? <laughs> what's more important? Getting it right or the thinking behind it? Uh, so I think uh, looking at Chelsea's recent defensive record, mm -hmm. they had that run of conceding minimum two goals in seven games in a row mm -hmm. and they played some rubbish in that run. They played Burnley, Sheffield United... Leeds, Leicester, you know, the Everton game doesn't solve those issues for me. I can't I can't see them not conceding a couple of goals. Mm -hmm. And if Guardiola does a number on Palmer, I don't think they've got the firepower to sort of win 3-2 against City. So okay. I will say, yeah. so you asked for you a bit of reasoning. Yeah, so this, no, I like it. Uh, so I would, I would say City to win 2-1. 2-1, thank you. Liam, your prediction, please. Well, I've already answered this question on Straight Out Cobham, so I have to be consistent with my predictions, I think. Yeah. Or, or I just make a mockery of the whole prediction. Yeah, either, either or, you can do whatever you want. Two completely different things. Um, I actually predicted the same score as Tim, 2-1. Uh, a kind of late heartbreak for Chelsea. The one the one point I'd probably differ on is I'm, I'm not sure Guardiola's the type of coach that does a number on opposition players. He doesn't seem to craft that many individual game plans defensively his his defensive game plan will be stop Cole Palmer and any other Chelsea player getting the ball ever <laughs> yeah that seems to be his general approach but I, I I think there will be some tiredness in City's legs uh, and I think Chelsea will play them close because they have done twice this year uh, but I do think City will ultimately come through right we shall see let's um, talk about the other FA Cup semi-final whilst we're here mm. Wolves is conquerors Coventry City have their big day out at Wembley Stadium oh wouldn't it be nice to, if it was Wolves making it to Wembley again to get into the FA Cup semi-final but they probably would have lost like they did the last time they just were in FYI, the FA Cup Liam, I'm, I'm not saying anything because I'm, um, not, I'm not biting Co he does this Co kind of thing every week Coventry so. up against Manchester United Coventry sit 8th in the championship can they do it again? Have you got a little bit of a a hope, maybe, yeah, that they do it again? The amount of teams that Man United have been ma making look amazing in recent weeks mm -hmm. is 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 considerable. Yep. And yeah, I watched Coventry. Com should have been a comfortable win against Wolves, to be honest. They had 24 shots at Molyneux that day, and um, yeah, in players like El Ellis Sims and Hadji Wright, they've definitely got the firepower to trouble Man United. And Man United have definitely got the defensive weakness to allow them to have chances. I think we can say in almost certainty, given the run that United have been on for months now, that they will concede chances to Coventry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's a great story for, for Coventry to be there. They're going to be backed by 34,000, sold out their allocation. Um, Mark Robbins obviously done a phenomenal job. Even this season, they were struggling weren't they before Christmas yep. in sort of November they were mm -hmm. they were in a relegation battle now they're sort of on the verge of the playoffs but it might be too late for that um, so yeah they'll have at least 30 shots and if Fernando <laughs> lets a couple in then no I honestly think um, they've got a really good opportunity to um, to create one of the what would be on paper one of the biggest FA Cup shots of all time they've got familiarity with the with the sort of the big theatre that mm -hmm. is Wembley, obviously, from, from the playoffs, which will work to their advantage. Um, obviously, they lost on that occasion to Luton in last season's playoff final. But do you think, just in general, though, the familiarity of those Manchester United players will be the deciding factor or not? Um, in terms of... Just big big matches, big pressure um, or I mean, not? You know, there were big games in the Champions League this season and they, they flunked all those. Um They've been better against the better teams recently. You know, a couple of decent performances against Liverpool, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but against teams that they're expected to beat, they've, they've really struggled. You know, going back a few months now, to, they played Newport in January, struggled to get past them. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's massive issues there. We saw last week, Ten Hag, again, failing to sort of get hold of the dressing room and issues with Garnacho and Dallow saying completely the opposite things to what Ten Hag's been saying about conceding shots in his post-match interview and Ahmed Diallo doing things on social media and Garnacho doing things on social media. So it's just an unruly bunch of players who don't seem to play to direction. 
and when you've got that anything can happen in any in any given game I just want one prediction from you on this game please Tim tell me what it is oh it's a real tough one real tough one because obviously you don't like Man United and you want Coventry despise, to win because if, because if they them. then go on they go, so you funny. go oh well but Wolves you know they've been beaten no, by the finalists that. that's that's basically <laughs> it isn't it that's, that's I why. don't care about that okay uh, it would be hilarious Could, I thought sorry, I, I, I thought you made your prediction Tim wasn't it 30 shots <laughs> yeah 30 shots um, can I just say one thing that it's absolutely ludicrous that one of Coventry's best players Casey Palmer doesn't play in this game because he's been booked twice in the FA Cup this season. And Ahmed Diallo, who was sent off in the quarterfinal mm -hmm. for Man United, does play because he's served his red card suspension mm -hmm. in the Premier League. Do Coventry have midfielders who can run with the ball in a straight line through the middle of the pitch? Because that could be a bit of a problem for mm. Casemiro et al. Um, I think... Coventry are going to score twice in this game. And Manchester United are going to <laughs> score. I, I think they're going to win. Yeah. 3 2. 3 2. Cool. It's going to be a good weekend. Right. Let's get back into the Premier League. Right. We have next Arsenal away at Wolves. Arsenal suffered back to back defeats against uh, Aston Villa, their first league loss in 2024. The 1-0 defeat then against Bayern Munich, which knocked them out of the Champions League at the quarterfinal stage. In the Premier League, they are still second, head of Liverpool on goal difference. They both have 71 points. They are two points behind the leaders, Manchester City. Are they running out of steam, do you think? Because they've got a bit of a habit of doing this over the last couple of seasons. It was three out of their final nine games last season, six out of their last 12 in the 2021-22 season that they'd won. Are they on the verge? Is this their bad week? Is this where it all sort of comes unstuck? I don't, I don't know. I feel, I feel like Liverpool have massively imploded. Mm. I feel like Liverpool are. Yeah, they're not alone. Arsenal aren't Li alone. No, no, yeah. but I'm, I'm saying Liverpool have imploded and bottled it. To be honest, you know the, the the two home games they had, Atalanta and Palace. They should be winning those games, not losing both of them. Felt like a bit of a bottle job to me. I don't see that with Arsenal. I see Arsenal, yes, tired. And I think Arteta said the other day, if we win most of the European leagues, we'd be six to eight points clear. You know, this is this it's ridiculous the standards that we have to reach. Um and he's probably had no reliance on too many players, I think. If you look at like so Saka and Odegaard and Rice, they're probably a bit tired. But to be honest, they played Aston Villa at home, who they'd already lost to this season, and you knew Emery was gonna come with a plan, and Villa are the fourth best team in the country. And you know, we said we said last week Arsenal could struggle in this one. And Bayern Munich, who um are managed by a guys who won the Champions League they've got players who won the Champions League they've saved all their energy and good performances for the Champions League uh, in recent weeks so I don't know if you if you look at those two games or three games with the, with the two legs I, I don't Arsenal come up a little bit short and a bit of a lack of experience in Munich on Wednesday night but otherwise it doesn't feel like an implosion to me a Saturday night will be the test because if they go and lose at Molyneux then yeah I think you can say the wheels have really come off but it doesn't it doesn't feel like that to me, we've got their form before last week was astonishing. They'd won 10 of 11 in the Premier League with a nil-nil draw at Man City being the 11th. They hadn't been behind in a game all year in the Premier League, which I found amazing. And I've got to, I've got to say, uh, the Arsenal fans sort of, I know we've, I know we've got a lot, quite a few listening, and there's one in in the in the um, in the booth behind yeah. us. Yeah, but. The, the way that they... Two. Sorry, We've two. two. Sorry, two. But, Rachel and Mike, just Rachel. to name check them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the way that, you know, there were seven minutes of stoppage time for that Villa game and half the Emirates emptied and Zinchenko's getting criticised. I think he had a few boos when he was subbed off. After not li not being behind all year, I felt they were sort of waving the white flag very early on. What's your social media? <laughs> do you know what I mean, though? Yeah, well, that's... Yes, I do. I do know what you mean. I couldn't believe I know what how you mean, quickly it emptied. But I think it was more of a reflection on, hang on a minute, are things coming unstuck? And the, the anger 
the 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 fear that they'd sort of let this um, probably familiarity this opportunity. From, from a year ago. I yeah, guess. But, exactly. But they're, only, they're only two points behind. City. Exactly. That's the yeah. point. That's the point. And even after everything you've said, you ended it. You were. You would. I was going to potentially clip up that and you know send it on WhatsApp to <laughs> Mikel Arteta. I haven't got his number. Um, because it was a. It was. It was inspirational. Let's concentrate. Let's accentuate the positives here. Arsenal well, are still in a good, good situation. I mean, they could be, they could be Chelsea, Liam. They could be <laughs> Chelsea. They could be in, in, in a complete mess. Um, but they're still in the mix. And I suppose now it is about how they deal with those, those two body blows against Aston Villa, against Bayern Munich, and get back on track. They were Chelsea a few years ago, minus the incredible spending. Um, yeah, they're not they're not in a, a, a terrible place, Arsenal. I I don't agree when Arteta says, you know, that any other league we'd be six to eight points clear. They've lost five games this season in the Premier League already. They've they they've won twenty two of thirty two, which is good, but it's not the standard that we've seen in this league over the last five to seven years. I know what he's getting at because peak Manchester City and peak Liverpool raised the bar for winning the Premier League to heights that we've never seen before in terms of points. But neither of those teams are in the league this year, like the peak versions of them. The maximum number of points City can finish with is 91, which is a, a lot, but it's a good four to five points less at a minimum from the heights that they were regularly scaling under Guardiola. So this is actually an opportunity for Arsenal and for Liverpool because City have slipped a little bit. And I think coming out with things like that, if you're Arteta, risks creating a little bit of a woe is me culture rather than, you know, trying to rally the troops and and saying, look, we've still got a great opportunity here, an opportunity that we might not get every year to win the league with mid to high 80s points. Um, And that's definitely there because we've seen... City have been very, very consistent in the league the last couple of months, but they're not invulnerable, as Real Madrid showed. Um, particularly away from home, I think they can be a little bit more, a little bit more vulnerable this year. So it's it's there for Arsenal. It's there for Liverpool if they can just get out of their own way. And I, I'd I'd fancy Arsenal to, to do that a bit more than Liverpool, just because I think they're a little bit more of a controlled team. There isn't the huge overwhelming emotional pressure that Liverpool have with Klopp's impending departure and Arsenal prior to the Villa game had the best defence in the league as well and I think that's a great foundation on which to to actually go and win the title. For the Arsenal fans that are getting a little bit nervy, a bit worried, give them a, a scouting report on Wolves at the moment Tim because I was listening to the radio last weekend I heard Gary O'Neill speaking after the game against Nottingham Forest, Mm -hmm. bemoaning the amount of injuries, but at the same time not bemoaning it, saying it's not an excuse, but then saying, oh, we've got so many injuries. So he was sort of doing a semi-whinge wrapped up in, I'm happy, um, I'm proud of the players, etc. We're really stretched. We've only got 12 12 players and and all that malarkey. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit new. Tell us, tell us why Arsenal potentially should be worried or not. Uh, I mean, Wolves are in the worst form of the season. You, know, you mentioned the Coventry Court final that I haven't won since then, and yeah, they've had they've had some injuries. They haven't had the glut of injuries that sort of Chelsea and Newcastle have had. Newcastle got a full team out at the moment. They're still going to beat Spurs easily last week. Don't see Eddie Howe, you know, moaning after that one. Gary O'Neill, so he's never known a situation like it in his managerial or playing career. He really? Said, yeah, he said that on the radio. A few that I've missed. That's weird. <laughs> well, uh, well, they've had injuries to key players. That's been Wolves' yeah. problem. So the yeah. whole front three yeah. has, has been wiped out. And we saw at Forest last week, Mateus Cunha in their back, and what a difference he made. He scored two goals. One of them was remarkable. Uh, completely on his own in the Forest half, still most to score. So yeah, but I guess reasons that Arsenal fans should be concerned would be uh, Wolves got a good record against some of the good teams this season. They beat Man City at home, they beat Spurs home and away. Uh, they also beat Chelsea home and away. 
and they have the capability to do that because they're very well organized they're very well coached uh, they don't mind sitting deep and sort of relinquishing possession uh, they've got a couple of real midfield terriers um, Lamina and Jao Gomez are right up there with almost anyone in the league for sort of tackling numbers this season and then if everyone's fit they've got this electrifying pace on the counter attack uh, Pedro Neto is still out which is a huge blow but through Cunha who's in the form of his career there is someone to be worried about I'm confident no no not at all no n- not not given their, their recent form I don't think you can say they can go out and uh, beat the team with the best defence in the country um, it's probably a good time to play Arsenal but it's also a good time to play Wolves what, what does that mean Adam what does that mean <laughs> well <laughs> yeah well it's whoever keeps their keeps their minds on the prize yeah. eyes eyes on the prize or yeah. maybe minds and I guess whatever. that's an issue for Wolves is that the season's very nearly over. Yeah, I think if they lose this weekend, they season over. They probably won't get into Europe, but they're already they've already dropped down the table to eleventh. They're now seven points off seventh place. So you yeah, know, you it feels like it's you gone. You still had outside sort of dreams of getting back into Europe, didn't you? Coventry games, just the whole season's just evaporated. Yeah, we all love Coventry. Right, score predictions, Liam. Quick one from you, please. I think Arsenal will win this. Um, two nil, two nil. It was two one to to Arsenal in the reverse fixture. Tim, it's going to be three one to Arsenal. Oh. oh, yeah, but you're only doing that because then you're going to go. Ooh, look, yeah, I predicted an Arsenal win. I'm so happy that Wolves won. Can't believe it on next week's show. Yeah, brilliant, <laughs> jolly good. Remember, we are on YouTube, so when you do put your thumb that up, that's for the YouTube. That was just for YouTube. Just, I didn't want anyone to hear that. I don't want the was, listeners to hear that. It's no, just for it thumbs was, up for that YouTube. That was a YouTube exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's focus on some of the uh, relegation battles this weekend. Um, and there are some really, really interesting games uh, that we've got. Sheffield United against Burnley. I mean, Tim, last week you condemned Burnley to relegation. They're too far away, etc., etc. But... If they do get those three points, as they did against Sheffield United in the reverse fixture, that would still only leave them three points from safety, wouldn't it? I've still, I've still got a, just yes, a little Matt, flame if, burning. If they'd won last week, they'd, be, they'd somehow sort of be in it. But you, you don't stay up with that goalkeeper, let's be honest. Oh, yeah. Luton, they have got a chance of getting out of it. Um, 25 points, they're in 18th, so just one point behind Nottingham Forest. And two points behind Everton. Everton and Forest take on each other. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Luton against Brentford. This is a must win, isn't it, Liam, for Luton? Yeah, I think so. And it's an opportunity for them because I think Brentford, I don't know if they feel safe, but they probably should feel safe now. Um, They're seven points clear with five games left. I don't see any way for Brentford to actually get dragged right down into it. So Luton should have the the greater drive and the hunger in this game and the the greater desperation and we've seen from them I think throughout the season they just don't stop coming you know they they don't have an amazing individual talent level but they are pretty well coached they've got fantastic collective spirit and uh, even when games look to be getting away from them they don't stop trying to get back and I think as long as you do that you've, you've got a chance we've seen particularly before the change of coach you know Sheffield United throw the towel in a lot I think Burnley have been guilty of that at times this season as well I, I can't remember many occasions when Luton have done it and as long as you do that you've got a chance but they, ha- they have to put it all together into a proper performance against Brentford with as, as few mistakes as possible Going into the game between Everton and, and Nottingham Forest. Mm-hmm. I mean, Liam used the phrase they're throwing in the towel. It was very odd to see a Sean Dyche side throw in the towel, which they... I mean, maybe it's unfair, but I mean, it, it was chaotic at times against Chelsea. What's your feeling on, on, on that game in particular, Everton against Nottingham Forest? Because, you know, if, if Forest win, Luton win, that could be Everton back in the relegation zone, couldn't it? Yeah, if I was an Everton fan, I'd be worried that Luton and Forest's run-ins are both pretty good. You know, Luton have got Brentford, Wolves, Everton, West Ham, Fulham. That's a good run. Uh, Forest have got Everton. Uh, they do have Man City at home, but then they've got Sheffield United, Chelsea and Burnley. 
Whereas Everton have got Arsenal, Liverpool in there running. And Everton just aren't scoring goals mm. at the moment. So the last three goals they've scored in the four games, they had Neto, the Bournemouth keeper, dropping the ball for Beto to score from the yard. They had a penalty at Newcastle. And then they had Calvert-Lewin charging down Burnley, poor Burnley keeper's clearance. So they're, they're sort of like not goals that you can really train for. And then they're going to concede six the other night, which, as you say, is completely unlike even them this season and, and a Sean Dice team in general. So, yeah, whereas Forest have only lost one in five, uh, Forest have started scoring goals, and they look a better bet to stay up at the moment. So I, it's looking like it's going to really tighten up even more so right until the last game of the season, I think. Do you think it's going to... I don't see go- anyone pulling clear, to be honest. Forest, you don't? Forest, if anyone, but... Okay, all right. So even if Brent... Okay, fair enough. We want a bit of jeopardy, though, don't we, towards the end of the season. It's, it looks as if it's obviously going to go to... Potentially going to go to the wire at the top. We want the same Ooh. at the bottom, don't we? Okay, Liam, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, a pleasure. Good to talk to you guys. And to Tim. Great to be back in the studio with you, me old mucker. Cheers, buddy. Excellent. Right, that's all for today. I hope you have a great weekend uh, in the FA Cup, in the Premier League in the Football League, in La Liga, in the Bundesliga, in Serie A. Sure, keep going, why not? Anyway, Eredivisie, you know, wherever. But not Um, Scotland, apparently. But not Scotland. (laughs) (laughs) Enjoy it wherever you are. Okay, thank you very much. Io's going to be back on Monday. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching on YouTube. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. that Real Madrid did what they had to do against City. He said there was only one way to come out of here alive and that was to take our chances. We took one early and then by defending well, there's no other way against City. Made a manure. Thoughts on everything you heard after the post-match from both sides here? <sighs> to be honest, I think they described it very well. I think most people that watched the game would believe that, you know, City were the better side as such, but their inability to take their chances just meant Real Madrid stayed within the game. I think the element of the Real Madrid defending, you weren't just seeing it from their back line. It was the midfield, like Camavingas, you're seeing Cruz, the Modric's, Modric's as well. I think Valverde especially, they're making a big difference for Real Madrid and they gave them a chance. And when it's Real Madrid in the Champions League, a chance is all they need. Even though it goes down to the lottery of penalties as such, you know, they still had a sort of threat and danger within the game, but they worked very, very hard to almost try and maintain their record as being kings of Europe. And I think the way that City feel yesterday after that game is the way that probably dozens of teams have felt across many, many years. But again, this is their sort of European pedigree. And I think for City, there is huge disappointment for now. You know, they can't retain their title, but as far as facts go, they know that the way that Europe is sort of feeling now, you know, Real Madrid arrive at the Etihad as underdogs, but, you know, they play in that manner because that's what they need to do. Stevie, Real Madrid did what they needed to do. That was the only way. You know, Real Madrid always seem to do what they need to do to win. You know, particularly in this competition. I mean, in recent years, you, you wonder how. I mean, the last time they beat City, you, you wonder, how did they do it? I mean, how did they beat Liverpool in the final? You wonder, how did they do it? How did they win this game? But you know what? They know how to win. And it's not always about the pretty side of the game. You know, I, I certainly didn't think we'd be talking about heroic defending, d- defending as a unit, pulling out people like Modric and Rudiger. Well, Rudiger probably is the wrong example, but every single one of them put every single thing they had on the line in order to win this game. And, and it just shows you that, you know, it's not always about the pretty side of the game. Yes, we all love to see good passing, good movement, great football for 90 minutes, but sometimes you just got to work hard. And that's what won them this game. Sheer hard work and good decisions, taking your chance, and they march on. And once again, Gab, Carlo and Chilotti, cool as a cucumber. Yeah, I mean, he's cool afterwards. I think behind cool, behind closed doors, I don't know quite how cool he is, but you know, all this stuff, Bernardo Silva, I only saw one team out there. 
Um, I wonder how many teams in the world you take away their two first choice center backs and their first choice goalkeeper and their best defensive midfielder. Just just pluck them out of the team, right? And then we'll see who we see out there, right? Gee, well, won't that be a, a jolly Stefan Ortega uh, out there? Um, wh wh whoever you want uh, at the back, except for the good ones. Uh, no Rodri. Won't that be fun? Let's see how much fun that is. I mean, I, I, I don't understand this this level of like, you know, they're making it seem as if, you know, they went out there and did something illegal and trying to defend and, um, you know, especially after going ahead early, uh, trying to hang in, they're trying to play with their, with their strengths, still having that chance laid on through, through Rudiger. I, I don't, I mean, I really don't follow why it's some kind of criminal thing and only one team played football. God, why are you so angry? <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, because he just bugs I mean, me. I mean, let's be honest. They want it. They want it because all of the things. I mean, I, I mean, I did, we watched the same game. They got battered, and we can, we can, we can yeah. talk about. Oh, if he, if he didn't play, or he didn't play, or he didn't play, or he didn't no, no. play. We can, I, we can talk about that. I, Let, how about we talk about I, what happened? They got battered, and in, in, in football terms, they got battered. But from a defensive point of view, every single one of them gave their heart and soul, right. and that's why they won the game. Well, what makes you so well, angry about yeah, that? No, no. I, what, what makes me angry is if you don't recognize that you're playing a team that has so many pieces missing, that's away from home, against a team that won to 11 and probably a better side, and then you say, well, only one team was out there playing. I mean, I, the, that, it's that quote, oh, right? So Rodri, uh, you're angry Only one team Rodri. tried to, that's tried to play. Right. We'll be angry yeah, at Rodri. I'm angry, angry at yours. <laughs> Listen, I'm angry I, I, at you guys. Just you, I, Rodri. Right. I, I, I don't think this game played out any any other way than, than, I, than I was expecting. And, and I'm a little bit amazed at the surprise um, that, that is a, a expressed as, as a result. Listen, Real Madrid, given what happened last season, yeah. you, you knew Real Madrid were going to come and be far more defensive. No. Let, let's keep in mind who they're playing against, Manchester City. We, we know who they are in terms, in terms of, of, of how they keep the ball, how they possess it, as, as all Pep Guardiola teams have done. Um, in, in the first leg in, uh, at the Bernabeu, where in, in a game that I thought Real Madrid absolutely had to win if they were to have any hope of going through, Real had 38% possession. And we're, we're, we're trying to hurt... We're trying to hurt... Uh, Man City on the counter-attack. 3-3, three, three, that played out. We, we all know how, how that played out. Now, coming, in, coming into this one, I'm not sure why anybody expected anything different than Real to be defensive and try to hit, try to hit Manchester City on the counter-attack. And in the end, let, let's be honest, the Bernardo Silva, the Kevin De Bruyne chance over the crossbar, but Luna didn't have a whole lot to do otherwise. Yeah, but he did in the penalty shootout. So no. let's get Pep Guardiola's thoughts mm. on those penalties. Did you think Bernardo was affected by the ball not coming back to him quickly? I don't know. Bernardo asked for the first, I want to take it, I want to take it. He's a reliable player and decided to, to shoot in that way. But absolutely, Bernardo was again, what a game he played. So no, it happened, the ball will go out and yeah, it's what it is. We, we tempted to keep uh, Kevin on. Or knowing that there was a possibility of penalties. Erling, Erling and Kevin asked me to to go out, could not continue like like Manu. So the game we were playing, they were amazing. I did a big fan to make a lot of substitutions, but Kevin, Erling and Manu asked me to go out because we could not continue. I would be taking a penalty against the side that he was in. A little bit of the trickery there, Shaka. And, 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 and well, well played for by both goalkeepers, Kepa and, and, and Lunen. Now, first of all, um, well, certainly in, in the 2019 uh, Cup Final, it kind of looked like Bernardo Silva was going to go to his left, Kepa's right, and Kepa moved a little bit early, and, and he goes down the middle. Now, I, and, and this is something that people outside of the game kind of question a lot, why do more players just go down the middle? Because it's, you, you, you make things easy if, for, for the goalkeeper if that's your plan, if, if that's your choice. Now, the good penalty takers I know who score down the middle more times than not, 
That's not their that's not their plan A. They are going left or right, and if you go early in an effort to get to that penalty, they just change it and put it put it straight down the middle. Now, to me, and, and while again in 2019 it, it seemed different with Bernardo Silva, this time um, it, it, it was clear that that was his intention to let the goalkeeper move, and Lunin was just equal to it. And now I, it it just looks it it looks like a far more awful penalty than if he goes one way or the other and Lunan makes a save. Ask the goalkeeper to make a save. Don't stand there over a penalty in a Champions League quarter final and dolly it up for the keeper. I, I, I think that's kind of um, shirking a major responsibility. That's harsh, Shirker. What did he do? He dollied it up for the goalkeeper, didn't he? That's what he did. So if the goalkeeper dives one way, then we say he's a genius. We say he's cool as a cucumber. The goalkeeper's decided well, to stand well, well, there. How stupid would the goal... Let's switch this the other way. How stupid would the goalkeeper have looked if he had stood the way he did and the ball had gone in the corner? Two, maybe our regular penalty takers. So a lot of goalkeepers employ the thinking, I'm going to stay in the middle and I'm going to wait to save that bad penalty. Out of five, you're going to get two or three bad penalties. That's the thinking, because a lot of those penalty takers aren't used to taking penalty, penalty kicks under a lot of pressure. So now, if you go down the middle, then you're just feeding into to that thinking. Now, I, I get you, your point is more times than all goalkeepers move, <laughs> but if that's the goalkeeper's thinking that I'm going to stay here and wait for the bad, bad penalty, and you offer that as a bad penalty, then that's on you. No, that's harsh. Yeah. Listen, you can... I, I absolutely praise the goalie for doing his homework, figuring it out, whether it's Kepa, whether it's the goalie coach, whether it's Lunan himself, but you can't go smashing... Him for taking the for doing that pe that penalty for taking that penalty you can't so you can't stand party. there you can't stand and say oh well, how can you how dare you stand with, stand over the ball and then do that no you can't say that so you say well done you say well it's done penalty, to that it's you a say penalty unlucky shirt. you say unlucky yes. to that yes Ooh, okay yes right. it is unlucky all right it is unlucky the good right. news is we do have on the panel a penalty expert and Nader Manua uh, Nader I'd like to I get your thoughts on the yeah. situation <laughs> <laughs> also Nader I want to just talk a little yeah. bit about the psychology because there has been a lot of talk we heard it from Pep there as well about how long it did take for Bernardo Silva to get the ball to actually take the penalty yeah, all these things can play into it, but I think I err uh, with Stevie on this one. And the fact is, like, I don't expect a goalkeeper to stand up in the middle. I think it, it just looked ridiculous because, like, as I said, the goalie wouldn't be there. And if, if Bernardo would have rolled it to the left or the right, you know, you'd be wondering, well, why is Lunin standing there? It would have been so critical of his decision making to just stand there. But it is weird because it's Shaka, the former goalkeeper, talking about a current one. So, yeah, maybe he should be the specialist. But I think in terms of, like, gamesmanship and all that stuff, I think that will play into it, but when you have somebody stepping up that wants to take a penalty, that believes that they can score, then the amount of time that it could take to receive the ball and so on, like, they'll, they've played in big moments, they've played for the national teams, they've played in Champions League finals. I don't think the extra time would have phased them as such, and I think for, his, for him he's disappointed. But a missed penalty or a penalty saved by a goalkeeper, in my opinion, they all kind of just feel the same, because the person stepping up has done the best that they can. But in this particular moment, the uh, goalkeepers won the battle. <laughs> I did say I'd revisit the point where Pep Guardiola talks about Erling Haaland and Kevin De Bruyne wanting to not continue in this game. But Stevie, you're already shaking your head about this. Well, I wish he had told us. With the pr if, if, and even if it's not true, if, I, if I'm Guardiola, I'm going to say the two of them were feeling something. Mm. Just to get rid of everything. Because... I have never in the history of history heard of the star player in a quarter, quarter final of a Champions League wanting to come off. And he's your centre forward. He's your goal scorer. He's the guy you want to get the ball to. And he doesn't want to play. Never heard of it in my life. And if, and if he's not injured, what is going on in this guy's head? It's got to be that he's tired that he's asked. Oh, 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 I'm tired. Listen, I get it. Kevin De Bruyne is a different ball game. But Haaland, because he's tired. Be quiet. If I went up to someone, my old coach and said I'm tired, they would have punched me straight in the face. What if you're feeling a little something? Well, that's what I'm saying. If Guardiola had any sense, he would have come out and said... He's feeling something, and then that takes everyone away. Because I'm telling you, in the history of the game, I've never, well, I've never heard or seen a star player in such a big game want to come off. Gab? 
No, I, I like I. He's giving you for, for, from a coach's perspective and a player's perspective. I'll give you one from a media perspective. Pep can get away with doing it because he's Pep and he's achieved all that he's achieved uh, at this club. But from a comms perspective, from a snuffing out controversy uh, perspective, this is almost like the worst possible thing uh, you could say. If, if, if Eric Ten Hag uh, took off Bruno Fernandes and, and Rasmus Hoyland uh, and said, oh, well, they, they asked me to come off, and doesn't then say, um, I could tell they were tired or uh, they were carrying an injury or whatever else, uh, and then United go on to lose, uh, people go and tear him a new one. And then I think that's a difference here. It, maybe he was just being honest, maybe, uh, who knows, but uh, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing. It's, it's a bizarre thing to say, like I said, Pep's okay because nobody's gonna doubt him and rightly so because he's kind of earned that trust. Anybody else, it's a very, very dicey thing to say when you start saying, well, the player wanted to come off in the Champions League, late in the Champions League quarterfinal, and you don't mention that the player was injured or tired or felt something or whatever. Naden, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, to be honest, for the way that the story has come out and the quotes and stuff like that, you're almost picturing, like, say, Kanji, Harlan, De Bruyne coming over to the sideline saying, excuse me, uh, Gaffer, uh, could I please come out? I'm a little bit tired. You know, and I don't think that's what it's going to be. I think it's going to be something different within there. Maybe there were physios asking them, how are you feeling? How's this knock? How's this? How's that? And they said they're trying, but maybe the decision was made by the manager to just go for fresh legs because in that moment, you know, they didn't need to push. They couldn't afford to let up at all. But I don't think it's as simple as say that quote is. And I think from a comms perspective, I'm with Gab, like, it sounds a bit crazy on those players, but those players themselves are ones who are obsessed with the game of football. For, so for them to be coming off, you know, I think it has to be something a bit more significant. And I really doubt that these guys who love football the way that they do are coming to the side and saying, please, can I survive? I've had enough of this absolute worldie of a game with Real Madrid in the Champions League quarter, uh, quarter final. All right. Here's the thing, though. The, the only, as of right now, and, and Nathan's right, maybe the story unfolds and something else comes out um, from it. But as of right now, all we have is this quote, they asked me to come out. And, and which just rubs the wrong way against everything I believe a professional footballer normally stands for. Yep. Now, here's the other thing. And while maybe he, he goes to them and asks, maybe this is how it, it, it happened, and they say they, they have a knock and, or, or whatnot, let's keep in mind how many people are on the bench here. How much staff is on the bench? You have staff who are paid to monitor players. And from the time they start slowing down, from the time they start sh showing any kind of exhaustion, ordinarily before a player himself would admit, I am just gassed. There are staff members who, uh, who, who are paid to, to, to know that, to identify that. So there isn't that drop in performance. So some, somewhere, something has gone woefully wrong. Um, as, as I say, either it's a dereliction of duty by, by that staff or as, as of right now, it's kind of that dereliction of a, of a professional code by, by, by two players who, who, let's be honest, have been there and done it. I have not kind of shared any kind of responsibility at this kind of level. So it, it's, it makes it all the more be music. Well, Manchester City have got to dust themselves off because there is a lot more ahead when it comes to this season. So, by Leverkusen, the new Bundesliga champions now focusing their attentions on remaining unbeaten and also the other two competitions. They are still in the Pokal and also the Europa League as well. The Xavi Alonso effect, it stands at 44 games now, not a single loss in any competition all season. You can see just how standout it has been in terms of the goals scored as well. 38 wins too. Where are you putting them when it comes to favourites for this tournament then, Gab? I mean, I think I, I, I find it really hard to look past Bayer Leverkusen. I, they were woeful uh, in, in the first half tonight. Um, I mean, I, like, seriously, halftime couldn't come uh, soon enough. Uh, he made some changes, uh, sent, on, sent on Victor Boniface, sent on Jeremy Fringpong. And, you know, and then they held possession. And obviously, they, they just had a job to do uh, on this evening because of the first leg. Uh, but certainly, they're right up there. And also, 
Uh, maybe maybe a little love, a bit, tiny bit of love for Roma and Daniele De Rossi, who, who's just been extended. He's going he's gonna to keep his job next year. Um, I think obviously knocking out Milan in the way they did uh, is going to give them a tremendous confidence boost. Brilliant stuff from Leverkusen. Just, Shaq, we were even looking at it knowing that past that 85th you know minute, come. something's going to come from them. Yeah, l listen, I, I, I think this speaks a whole lot more than just a draw against West Ham, who sitting, what, eighth in, in, in the Premier League table. This is about their first game after winning the Bundesliga title. So maybe they were a little bit hung over in that And, and <laughs> I, I, I mean, look, looking at this one, as much as you've got, you've got a two-goal buffer from, from the first leg, I just thought if ever Leverkusen are going to lose their unbeaten tag, it's going to be today because of that Bundesliga win and, and, and what it meant to, to the team emotionally and how, how, how do you come down off of that, travelling away to West Ham, who were desperately poor in, in, in the first leg, it, it, it has to be said. Um, but still, um, we, we know who Leverkusen are. We've spoken about it uh, oftentimes um, jokingly in that, never mind, we, we switch on in the 80th minute. And, and that's exactly what happened. And, and as much as, as Leverkusen have continued to show who they are, and to Gav's point, maybe weren't that great in, in the first half, I think the fact that they improved in the manner that they did, the fact that, again, they get to within minutes of the final whistle and never looked overly panicked, they always seem to have this confidence in themselves, I just, I just think speaks absolute volumes to, to everything about Leverkusen this season. In a season that we've, we've kind of struggled to, to add to the plaudits. Um, but this just, again, uh, goes even further for me. Yeah, I know we keep saying it, but 44 unbeaten in every competition, that's pretty special. No, it is, but can I be a party pooper? Yep. This is, this, they're now in, in dangerous waters as far as their, their undefeated streak because with five games to go in the Bundesliga, how, how do they continue to keep the concentration and, 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 and the sharpness and, and how is training the same as it's always been and how do they put the same commitment into it? all of these things between now and the end of the season? You're, you're a right party Come on, pooper. there's a Europa League what a party semi -final pooper you are. and a cup yeah, final in five, Germany. But, they got, but they got, they've, got, they've got five league games that don't mean anything. Yeah, but it's so close. It's only five. You could look at it that way then and say it's only five yes. and we remain on the not I, I, football, football players' brains don't work that way. Football, play, football players don't... Uh, when do you ever talk to a football player and he goes, yeah, we want to be undefeated? We don't, we yeah, don't think I, about that. We've won the league, we've got two cup finals and so all of a sudden the league takes second place and when things start taking second place, you don't train the same. You're not as sharp, you don't put in the same effort, you're not as switched on, which you saw in the first... You know, you can say, oh, obviously, they've been celebrating, but that's a symptom of, of what they've done so far. So, so how do you explain I'm just a saying, goal? How do you explain I would a not be shocked. then? I would not be shocked if they dropped a level. Right. And the problem they'll have is the final of the Europa League isn't till the end of the season, and they might not quite be yeah, as right, good yeah. as they've been. I, 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 it's a word of warning, I, I, I'm telling I, you. I understand exactly what Steve, what, what Steve I'm, is I'm saying. I'm absolutely I, I, telling you. I absolutely you. understand it. And, and if Leverkusen were to, to win um, the remaining two trophies, and but l lose a game at some, some point along the line, that, that wouldn't matter to them. That, that's, that's, you know, that's not what, what we're... What players are... are is their focus. But... Um, I, I just think, as we've kind of just seen this season and this story unfold, it, it, it just... And, and again, given who the club are, Leverkusen, who we know their nickname and we know they've never won a Bundesliga title before, we aren't talking about a Real Madrid or a Barcelona doing this. We're talking about a team who's never lifted significant silverware with, with a, 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 a head coach who... Um, kind of epitomised everything that great footballers are about. And I, I just feel the, the story and the romance of it is great for us. It's, 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 great, for, for, it's, it's, great, it's great for neutrals. I for could argue the opposite they, way around, for, for, players, for players, you know, as long as, as, long as you win the, the, the title, that's, that's, that's the cake. Undefeated is icing. Why is Stevie such a negative Nelly Gab? I mean, in general or just today? <laughs> you mean in life? <laughs> 
<laughs> Been there. Happen, happen well, to I, us. I, Been I'll there. Just live in my, my analysis. <laughs> I will limit my analysis to this one subject. And, you know, I, I and incidentally, I don't remember when, when you were winning league titles with Liverpool, I don't remember you winning the title and then losing every single game the rest of the day, uh, the, Gab, the rest of the season. Can I stop? Gab, but, can I stop you there? Why do you think we lost? Yeah. Why do you think we lost the FA Cup final? In 1988. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying... We lost the 1988 Cup final then, against oh, Wimbledon of, of all teams because because we had won the league yeah, three weeks before the game. And, and, the, and, the, and by the end of the three weeks, we had, we had lost our legs, we had lost our sharpness. We didn't have it in us to, to break them down but, because of that. That's why I'm talking the way I'm talking yeah. about Leverkusen. Because I've, I've been in the position no, but, that but, Leverkusen but, are in. And we lost it. But Stevie, it's... It's two more games, and then they have a Europa League semi-final coming up, right, against Roma. Um, that's not a bad situation to be in if you want to try and get more, uh, more stimulus, more m motivation. I think what we've seen and what we saw a little bit against West Ham, he mixed it up a little bit. Some of the players that haven't played so much, um, you know, what, what people often forget is... You know, this is a team where center forward, you have Sheik, you have Boniface, you've got Borja Iglesias, and in midfield, uh, there, there's, sure, there's Shaka, but there's also uh, Andrich, there, there's Palacios um, <clears throat> at the back as well. They've got four or five options. So I think what you're going to see is some level of rotation, some players who might be more motivated. And in terms of beating the record, it's a couple of Bundesliga games, then you've got the semifinals, one Bundesliga game in between. If you can navigate that without losing, then you've set your record. Yeah, yeah Stevie. So maybe you'll be a bit more positive. Listen, I'm, I, I, I hope they do, and, and if they continue to play the way they're playing, yeah. But I'm just telling you, I've been in, the, I've been in that position before, and we lost, we lost it for the reasons that I said. They have to be very cautious that that, that they don't take their eye off the off the prize. Was it in your mind though? Did you really want to do? No. You didn't because no, they, they've made the a thing. big point we... that he's. They've all said that they want that unbeaten run as well. Oh, it's easy to talk. No, but they, they really, easy. they say that they want it without even well, anybody asking them. we wanted to win them. the FA Cup. Of course. And we told everybody we wanted right. to win the FA Cup. <laughs> and and we, it's subconscious. You know, we didn't, we didn't, not until afterwards, and you sit and, and, you're, and you're sitting down the beach after the season's over, and you start thinking about it, and you go, why, why, how could we lose? How come we didn't have the legs? How come we didn't have the sharpness? And then eventually you figure it out, Subconsciously, you're not you're not doing what you're normally doing. You're not you're not you're not putting that extra yard in here and the extra yard there, and you're not as sharp. And you're not. There's so many little things that take away what got you to where you were. I'm just a word of caution. I'm not saying that's what they're going to do, but I've seen it before, and they need to be careful. I think he's just annoyed that oh, Shabby's not going to the Negative Nelly, yes. Yeah, negative oh, Nelly. Goodness, <laughs> You'd like to see if Bayer Leverkusen are going to lose this weekend Listen, and make sure to catch the Bundesliga somebody coverage. Somebody might eat some chips. <laughs> They'll be taking on Borussia <laughs> Dortmund. I'll tell you what, though, Borussia Dortmund would love to bring that unbeaten run to an end. They also need to get top four football. who march on in this game. Nader Manua is with us. We'll be hearing from Nader in just a moment. But Stevie, let me start with you and let me talk about that Mo Salah chance. As Shaka said, turning point in this game, would it have made a difference had he put that away? If Mo Salah puts that in the back of the net, I think Liverpool will go on at least to, to get into extra time uh, and, and if not win the game. I think it's that important. It's, it's horrible and, and I think... I said it the last couple of weeks, Liverpool going forward, whether it's Mo Salah, Nunes, Dia, anybody else, are off form. I mean, it's, it's five games since Liverpool scored a goal from open play. They've had a set piece and they've had penalty kicks. They haven't scored a goal in open play since Sheffield United. I mean, you cannot win games of football when your front line is in that sort of form. And, and that summed up the sort of form that Mo Salah has been in since he came back from injury. Just, just off the pace, uh, touch is gone. And when you're off the pace and your touch is gone, your confidence is gone. Because that chance he had today was about as simple as it gets. It could not have sat up any nicer for him. 
Goalkeepers in no man's land. It just takes a bit of accuracy and a decent connection. And my goodness, I think, I think it comes off his shin. So, yeah, for me, from that point on, I wasn't particularly confident of Liverpool winning this game. Do you think the same as Stevie, that it might have been a different story than Shaka? Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, in all honesty, just watching the game with, with a, a certain former Liverpool player who we know, Kay, um, <laughs> who was stomping around the room to start with, and then after that chance, it was no more stomping. That, that told it, it, its own story. Yeah. But, but without question, that goal goes in at, at that point. Um, what, 33, 39 minutes on, on, on the clock um, and all of a sudden Atalanta are, are stuck in between do we defend what is now a one goal lead or do we kind of go on and play our natural game we've got our own fans here and, and they'll, they'll be uh, nervy as well as, as, as they watch us unfold because we know Liverpool at their best Mo Salah in halfway decent form can score three, four, five goals on you if, if you aren't overly careful. Um, that doesn't go in, and you, you sense not just Mo Salah's form, but, um, but Liverpool's kind of reliance on that form. Uh, it, it starts to win, and you start to believe that, yeah, the Lady Luck is, is on our side a, a, a little bit, and that changes everything about the momentum um, of, of the game. Can I just add why, if that had gone in? Because the rest of the game, is going to be calm for Liverpool because all they have to do is score one goal. It completely changes how they go about it. The longer this game got on, went on, you saw how desperate they got, how they're trying to force it. When you try and force things, you lose your accuracy, you, you lose your timing. And by the end of this game, it was just frantic. Had Mo Salah put that ball in the net, Liverpool could have calmed down and played the football and let it happen. That's the difference of him missing that chance. There is, of course, Gab, the argument to be made that they're just giving themselves too much to do. And in Bergamo, after that 3-0 deficit. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, obviously, uh, overturning uh, <laughs> a three-goal uh, gap is always going to be a tall order. But it, it was interesting what Stevie was saying there about, um, you know, getting frantic. I, it's something that, you know, with some of Liverpool's uh, disappointing results in the league something Klopp also uh emphasized as well that you know they're they're, they're snatching at chances and uh and, and they're not turning chances into goal and you know and, and I think this is maybe a carryover from from what we'd seen in uh, in the Premier League yeah let's get to that then Nadim because obviously we were just saying and as Stevie was saying those goals not coming from open play obviously this was a win on the night but it didn't really count for much you look at the recent run of form Obviously, that loss to Crystal Palace, the loss to Atalanta, and the draw against Manchester United. Do you think this is more than just... A, do you think this is like a turning point? We obviously saw that most of our chance being a turning point in this game. Is this a turning point in their season? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think Klopp himself was trying to take the positives from the fact that they did win the game today, even though the luck went out on the tie. But I think as you've seen through those four games, you can picture some of the big chances they've had within that. And those big chances really matter. I think Stevie's described their situation very, very well. Looking at a forward line that just isn't clicking at this moment in time. And those chances that where they, maybe you missed early in the season, maybe someone else will step up, maybe a Jota, a goal from defence or something. But instead, there's a reliance on them to do it, but they're not doing it right now. So I think for Klopp himself, he's going to look at his side and try and find a way to get the most out of them in this final six games of the season. Who knows, maybe it could lead to a Premier League title. But if they continue like this for maybe a game or two games more, you know, even that dream itself will be gone. And I think to talk about that chance that Salah had with the, uh, with the volley, I think to sh tell a tale about confidence, if you were to just freeze frame it before Salah shoots, and then also now go back to Cole Palmer's half volley from further out on his weaker foot on Monday night, you'd be thinking, well, of course Salah scores and Cole Palmer misses because of the difficulty of those chances, but confidence can make such a big difference. And instead we see Salah miss the target by almost 10 yards. But Cole Palmer make it seem like he's right foot and it's the easiest thing in the world. You know, these little moments matter, little bits of belief matter. I think from a Liverpool perspective, you know, they need to find something from that front line because at the moment it really is misfiring. A confidence is going to be essential, Stevie, if they are to win a Premier League title right now. What are the chances after what we've been seeing of late? Well, right now, the only thing they can look at is making sure that they win against Fulham away. Uh, and considering, you know, we, we, you just put up there the recent results. 
can you really, can you really with any confidence, I certainly I can't, turn around and say that the next three games, Fulham away, Everton away and West Ham away, are, are absolutely, they're going to take nine points. I cannot, absolutely cannot. And that means that, again, I can't sit here and tell you that Liverpool can win the Premier League because right now, the way they're playing, uh, the form of the front players, if they continue to play like this, they can't win the Premier League. Let's talk about Atalanta though, Gab. Obviously, this is a great achievement for Gasparini's men going through to the semi-finals of this competition. Yeah, it's tremendous. I mean, um, uh, some people are saying it's their, their greatest ever uh, achievement. Of course, they, they, they've been here before, um, many, many moons ago. And of course, they came really, really close uh, a couple years ago uh, when they nearly knocked out uh, uh, Paris Saint-Germain. So uh, I, I think it shows that on the day, um, or on the night, I should say, uh, Gasparini can put a game plan together that, that can jam up an opponent. Obviously, we saw that more uh, in, in the first leg. And, you know, that's why so many people rate him so highly as, as, as a coach. So let's not forget, I think Atalanta, what, eighth in, in Serie A right now? Um, so it's not something that works for him week in, week out. It certainly hasn't this week, this season. But to me, it's all the more credit for, for getting it to come together against a side like Liverpool. Thursday, the 18th of April, listener. Exciting times as we are joined in the Totally Football Show studio by Charlie Eckershire. Hi, Charlie. Hello. Nice to see you. Adrian Clark is back as well. Hello, everybody. Good morning to you, Adrian. And Duncan Alexander. Hello. Duncan has just dropped some knowledge on us. All. We were discussing the fact that we're now within 100 days to the Olympics. Mm. Talk turned to archery soon enough when Duncan said this. Well, I was trying to get us back on football and uh, yeah, and it reminded me that Edward III um, banned football because people weren't doing their archery practice and obviously back then it was a, a method of killing people effectively. So, archery? Um, yeah. Okay. A, a warfare-based uh, concern for mm. It wasn't King. just a leisure kind of like no, it was the youngsters out do, doing their archery. Yeah. They're more so, practical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, what period are we talking about here, Edward III? That would have been 1340. What kind of football was practiced then? Yeah, they didn't have VAR. I'm not... Was, <laughs> we had pressing them to put it running around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. when you say football... Well, football... It's probably accepted to have begun well, somewhat later. Could then. you pick the ball up? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> Would they I even have a ball? The point, is, the point is that I think there's an innate human joy in doing stuff with a ball with your feet, which right. we know that well predates the 19th century. So. I mean, around that time, you'd have hundreds of people, wouldn't you? Whole towns playing yeah, these games and Possibly, and but then there would have also been smaller games as well. So I think, you know, we've got to respect the fact that football didn't start in 1888. <laughs> and probably, you know, Messi's good, but there's probably a medieval player who was actually the greatest player that's ever lived, but we just mm. don't have enough information. We just don't. Maybe in a parallel universe, there's a totally archery show yeah. going on right now where they're talking about, you know, the threat, that the existential it's threat a to the sport. for jousting. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, here we are stuck in this one, where we're going to be talking about, crikey, only the highest scoring set of Champions League quarterfinals ever. And the fact there's not going to be any English teams at Wembley in the Champions League final. Woo! All right. I'm excited too. The uh, second legs play Tuesday and Wednesday. Let's check the scores. Tuesday, there were come from behind victories for PSG, who overturned a 3 2 deficit from the first leg, beating Barcelona 4 1 on the night, 6 4 on aggregate. And Dortmund, who were 2 1 down from their first leg away in Madrid, they saw off Atletico 4 2 and lost. 5-4 on aggregate. Thrilling stuff. Dortmund will face PSG next in a group of death reunion in the semis. Mm. Wednesday, Arsenal got beat 1-0 at Bayern. They are out. Bavarians will be facing Real Madrid in the semi-finals after they beat Man City on penalties. A game that Pep was insisting afterwards they controlled for more or less 120 minutes. The bit when Real scored, of course, not so much. So what happened? Well, <laughs> I mean, they did. They did have the better chances. They could. They could well have won this game. Um, 
didn't take them and then goes to a shootout and it's a lottery as we know. <laughs> I mean, it was an extraordinarily bad penalty from Silva. I genuinely laughed seeing it. It was mm. so funny. So the first penalty had been taken unsuccessfully yeah. by... Oh, no, sorry, the first, yeah, so the first penalty had been taken uh, by uh, Julian Alvarez mm. successfully. Then Modric steps up. Yeah misses and is so frustrated that he absolutely hoofs the ball into the stands. Weirdly, for penalty shootouts, they only seem to have one yes, ball. And yeah. it took about well, a minute for him to get the ball back. Okay. They well, I wonder if that played into Bernardo it, Silva's decision. Although, interestingly, or not, Lunin doesn't make any move to die the other way. So he kind of knows what Silva's about to do. Over to you, Duncan. So there's a few elements to it. The, yeah. It went on so long that they were about to go and look for another ball. They got to the point where they're like, right, we better get another ball. But at that moment, clearly someone in the crowd was said to the person with the ball, I think you better throw the ball back. Because it was City fans, wasn't it? Yeah. They yeah, won yeah. the toss, they were in front of their own fans. Yeah. So it was... Um, they effectively and sported. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a couple of other things with the penalty. In the, Everyone knows now that if you take like a deep breath and take yeah. your time, that's really important. Bernardo puts the ball down, turns around and just runs straight to do it. So that was not, you know, and you wonder whether the delay, you know, built up in him. And then it was funny though, because when he takes it, it felt like a kind of kids game where they take a really bad penalty and it's like, Don, have another go. Yeah, you almost yeah, half expected yeah. the keeper to roll it back out. Like, exactly. do, do, do it properly. Don't, don't look don't at do. the tractor at the face. Go on, <laughs> yeah. have one more. Yeah. But um, it turns out that um, Bernardo doesn't take, I don't think he's taken a penalty in a, in a normal game, like during the game before, but he has um, in a shootout and he went down the middle then and Kepa was on the bench and apparently told Lunin that oh, really? that he was probably likely to go down. So it was a gamble from Lunin because like, you know, if you stand still and he just rolls into the corner, you look a bit silly. But yeah, it was... Um, so he had it on his water bottle, effectively. His it's mental just water bottle. Yeah. 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 Um, amazing. City have long had a problem with penalties, so much so that last season there was a lot of talk about whether Edison should be stepping, stepping up and taking spot kicks. And lo and behold... Duncan. I mean, he took the fifth one. Um, which he scored with a plum, mm, and it was just lovely. I mean, just a really good penalty, yeah. and pro proves the point that he should have been on pens because, mm. you know, no goalkeeper in Premier League history has got more than one goal, and it's an absolute dream of mine to see a keeper with yeah. double figures. Has any goalkeeper taken a pen in open play before? Like, have they been called up in in the Premier League to, Not in to, the Prem to, to go and do it? No, yeah, no. I just wonder whether Edison probably back in the 1300s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing it all the time. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But like uh, yeah, Hans Jörg Burt obviously scored three penalties yeah. in the Champions League, yeah. all of, all against Juventus, weirdly. Um, so they don't like him. Yeah. But then, wow. so with with the hospitality, with the kind of city fans making life easier than Real Madrid or being hospitable hosts. I mean, no, there was that thing of holding on to the ball. Someone tell me if there's a reason for this. But they were playing Hey Jude before the penalty shootout. Mm. I don't know if that. You know, firstly, that's kind of quite that's a band very much synonymous with their big rivals Liverpool but also for Jude Bellingham it felt almost like a kind hey, of Jude is a Man City theme they always play it before they always the game do they okay yeah, yeah. right Maybe. it just seemed odd for because that's like the the song of your like this player who's you really want to be putting off rather than kind of giving him the platform because there's a Jude there on the uh, yeah it just felt I don't know but obviously yeah. they do it all the time it just seemed weird mm. well Jude Bellingham who had indeed proved uh, way more influential in this leg than he had in the the first one a lovely touch to set up Real Madrid's mm. opening goal. Really good touch, wasn't it? Yeah, just dropped out of the sky. But, you know, he's got that kind of talent, hasn't he? Man, all, all of Manchester City's goals against, they're, they're almost identical, aren't they, in terms of it's always a direct attack, isn't it? And I suppose that's natural because they've got so much of the ball. But even this one, a long ball forward, catches them off, off guard. They, they end up chasing back towards their own goal. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a spectacular touch from, from Bellingham. But there was still a lot of work to do. Um, but I, I think more than that goal, I, I think you just got to commend the defending of, of Real Madrid because it's not something they have to do very often. That They're a team that are normally like Manchester oh, yeah. City. So... I've seen it's, League it's, Cup ties that look exactly the same as that match. Yeah, just exactly. A, a team in a sort of dark away kit just defending for a long yeah. time. And yeah, oh, but it's Real Madrid. When it's but... something that you're not used to doing and right. you can pull it off like they did, I yeah. think it makes it doubly impressive in a way. Obviously, you need the goalkeeper to play well. Lunin had a, had a, had a bit of a blinder, didn't he? But well, they got battered in this game last season. At the yeah, end. yeah. 4 0. Yeah, and couldn't get out of their own half. And on this occasion, you feel Carlo Ancelotti went, yeah, maybe we won't try that again. Mm -hmm. But Lunin, I think, made eight saves in the course of the 120 minutes, so, which is quite a few, but yeah. City didn't have that. It wasn't that total. When you look at the numbers, they had 18 corners to Real Madrid's one. They had 33 shots to Real Madrid's eight. Mm. 
But you didn't get the sense, or did you, that there were... sterile pressure a lot of the time. There's a lot, particularly later on, there was a lot of like, you know, I don't want to go full your dad, but there was a lot of moments where you were like, come on, just have a, sh have a shot. And they were like, no, pass Trying to walk back. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, uh, Kevin De Bruyne, after he had yeah. equalised, yes, that, was the, that was the chance. So Doku came on in the second half, and as expected, made uh, Real Madrid look a little bit more shaky at the back in the mm. Grealish's position. He then sets up Kevin De Bruyne, who on his second pop at it, it's very cool and puts it over the kind of onrushing defender and then he has a huge chance with about mm. 10 to go, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's very soon after his equaliser. I mean, you'd absolutely expect him to score that. But I think it's kind of symptomatic of his season, really. He's, he's not quite at his former levels, I think. And I think if you said to the random person on the street who Manchester City's best two players, they'd probably go De Bruyne and Erling Haaland. And, I think neither of them really performed that well. I mean, City made 846 successful passes in that game, and Harlan had five of them. Right. Is, I mean, well, I know well, he's well, I know he's not in the team myself. for his passing, but he's in the team for his goals, and he didn't score. So he, this was, I think, only the second time he's been taken off without the game already. And apparently, you know, he asked being to come in City's off. Favorite. Really? Which again is, you know, if you're the the best striker. But for a medical, re for a, he uh, said he was health. done. He was he didn't. Couldn't do extra time. Right. Damn. Yeah. I mean, it was striking. Yeah. You know, the fact that he came off with all of extra time to go in their mm. biggest game of the season. To, to, to sort of win the Ballon d'Or and whatnot, which is obviously part of his career goals, I would imagine. That's with, with all modern players or modern top players. He has got to improve, hasn't he? Like in terms of the all round game. Oh, Having seen oh. Harry Kane a couple of times for Bayern Munich, even though he doesn't touch it very often, when he does touch it, you see so much class yeah, about him. Yeah. I you was know. struck at the end of last season when obviously he scored 36 goals in the Premier League and over 50 overall and everyone was like, whoa, if this is what he's done in the first season, what's he going to do? And it doesn't work like that sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes your first season is your best season and that that's kind of your high watermark. And he is being dealt with a lot more easily this season. Mm. City now uh, will focus on their Premier League hopes and the FA Cup, which is on the way this weekend. They'll be facing Chelsea at Wembley for Real Madrid. They've got the Clasico this weekend, actually. They have a comfortable lead in La Liga and they've got a semi-final now against Bayern Munich, who they face quite a lot in Europe. They have a good record against them of late and they lost seven meetings. They won six and drawn the other one. Bayern Munich, anyway, who are through to the semi by virtue of their 1-0 win against Arsenal. Joshua Kimmich settling the tie in the second half with a thumping header. Only his second goal of the season, did you know? Adrian, mm. Arsenal, is this all sounding, is it feeling a little bit familiar for you? This It does, a little week? bit, a little bit. I think the, the tailing off feels a little bit familiar, but this is the first time Arsenal have had to combine Champions League with Premier League. And mm. I just don't think this team is equipped or, or ready to win both competitions in the same season. Or think. either. Or either, potentially. Mm -hmm. But I think they're good enough to win the Premier League, but whether they will or not, you know, is, is up for debate. It was a tired second half performance, wasn't it? Again, after the Villa game where, where Arsenal really flagged after half time. So I do think the season is beginning to catch up on the players. I think the tie in general just shone a light on, on what Arsenal need. To, to go to the next level. They're, they're at a very high level. They've jumped up the rankings exceptionally quickly. Like, a, mm. I don't know, like a tennis player that's sort of won a lot of, lot of uh, junior events. They've climbed the ladder. They've mm. beaten, taken some scalps along the way. Nice, and yeah. then they've got to the grand... Yeah, exactly. And they've got to the grand slam. Right. And they've started, and they got to the latter stage and they've met, they've met one of the world's top top players. This sounds exciting. Um, yeah, exactly. Next? Well, in the pressure moments, that, oh, yeah. that experience came, uh, told. Korea. And they were just put, put back in their place. That's kind of how I equate the, where Arsenal are at. Okay. Um, they need to upgrade certain positions. They need a bit more experience. Um, and, and and they might get there, but but they're just not quite ready. That, that's how I that's how I see yeah, it at the moment. I, I think from last season, they've undoubtedly gone up a level. Yep. But my feeling, and I think I said this before the City game, was that to kind of compete in the Champions League and Premier League was, and this is obviously totally arbitrary metrics, was that was like going up two levels. And I don't think they're ready to do that. I think had they gone out of the Champions League against Porto, say, mm. I think with a clear run, they'd have had a really decent chance of winning the Premier League. And, and that's not to say it's over now, 
but it is a big step up. And, you right. know, quarter final before the start of the season was probably about par, par. for Arsenal, yeah. I would have said. Definitely. And, you know, they've gone and played by Munich. They've lost by the odd goal. And I think it was a tie that could have gone either way. I don't think you can say, you know, I don't think they've gone and been like, well, Bayern were another level. I don't no, think so. They were good in the first half as well. I think it's very Arsenal much kind were. of, yeah, yeah. result based. People mm. are like, well, they lost so they were bad. But well, actually, no. in the first half, they were in control for most of that half. Tuchel said, he said that really the only quarter of the tie, so the only half yeah. of the two games that we were better than Arsenal in was the last last yeah. quarter. And yeah. I think that's fair comment. And, and, and that's it, obviously, that was the most important and quarter. the difference is Bayern have got that experience, European experience, where they dug in. Yeah. And, you know, where, where Arsenal, when they led at the Emirates, kind of well, that, got that, a bit giddy. That was they? the key bit. I think, you know, Ben White goes through with that really good chance to make it 2 in the first leg. And at that point, my feeling was it, it felt very much like Bayern just couldn't live with Arsenal's physicality. Their counter-pressing was amazing. It's how they got their goal. It's how they got that chance. It felt like they couldn't get out. And had Arsenal either gone 2 nil up or said, OK, we're 1-0 up. Let's see what Bayern have got. Can they come out and attack us? Because re- mm. I think what will frustrate Arsenal is that they were only ahead. It must have been, what, about 10 minutes of this whole tie. And Bayern are so much better suited, clearly, to counter-attacking. They did that brilliantly well. I think had Arsenal had a bit longer where they had something to defend, which they, you know, they've generally defended really well this season, that would have made it a different tie. Uh, and, you know, had they, they could have got that late penalty in the first leg. We don't need to debate whether it was or it wasn't. I think, you know, another day they get that, mm. they would have had a lead to take. But yeah, I think I think on the night, 1-0 was a fair result. Mm. Yeah, and it's the but, European pressure as well, you know, like, you know, we've seen, there's no away goals really anymore, but going away in these big ties is is a factor, you know, going to a stadium like Bayern's. And you saw that even right at the end when Arsenal had a free kick in the edge of the box and, and Saka mm, yeah. took it quickly. I don't know why he did that. And then luckily got a corner from it and then put in a really bad... Corner. David Rea had come up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. again, it could have been, Edison scoring a penalty and Rea scoring a header mm. would have been the best night in football ever. But instead, <laughs> <laughs> it was key, yeah, key moments. Ben White miss was big. The, the the Saka penalty debate. We don't want to go back to it, but it could easily have been given. There were little fine margins that Never didn't go pen. Arsenal away. <laughs> um, there you go. What I've got to say mm-hmm. about yeah. Arsenal in, in terms of what they've got to improve on, in addition to maybe strengthening, right, um, is reacting to setbacks. They haven't been very good at it mm. this season. I don't know if you aware. But they've gone 1-0 down 11 times this season and won once and lost eight of those 11 games. And they've only scored eight goals in the 11 games where they've gone 1-0 down. So they've got to find a gear change. And I was watching that game last night thinking, where's the gear change? Where can we... We need to... You know, we've conceded. We've got to step it up again and put Bayern under pressure. And they just didn't have it. And that's kind of been the story of Arsenal's season when they've is trailed. That, is that a player or is that to do with the tactical? I think it's, I think it's in part, they need a bit more pace or yeah. so, you know, a bit yeah, more pace like, up front. That's what they are lacking. You look at it, they've got Martinelli, they're only really, really quick forward. Mm. They're, they're, they've been a forward light for a long time. I mean, you think summer of 2022, they wanted to get Rafinha in. Mm. Someone, they didn't get him, they didn't get anyone. They wanted to get Mudrick in the following January mm. and whatever your views on him. But he, you know, mm. that shows you what they wanted, which was a lightning quick wide forward, right. you know, alongside, you know, to have someone in the squad alongside Martinelli. They got Trossard in. Trossard's been a great signing. But they have been that player short. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think, also, you know, you could see that. They do lack that explosivity. And it's interesting, Adrian, on the mm. point about not overturning leads because that was a big thing. Uh, a couple of seasons ago for us, but then last season, you think of it, it was all about those kind of crazy frenzied comeback wins. They obviously have changed a lot this season, mm. being a lot more controlled, a lot less frenetic, mm. and maybe, again, simplicity, they, they find the, that balance. They pre- press the frenetic button yeah, exactly. every now and again yeah. and just go a little bit crazy and go a little bit off piste because the, it seems like they've got this controlled City style of play and they can't really deviate from it as much as they used to. And I know City didn't go through, but they were able to bring on Doku, who right. is that yeah. sort of player yeah, who exactly. made that difference. Exactly. Totally, that yeah. was kind of the Modric Mudrick and, equivalent. And Doku was, be. you know, a good player, mm. but not a sort of player that's out of Arsenal's league, that sort of player, you know. So, yeah, it's doable. Yeah. Good for Bayern, though, eh? Not been the best Very of seasons good. for them, but through they go to the semi-finals. Good for... The German coefficiency. Oof, Oof yeah, eh? Because they pretty much is it done? Doubled their lead over the Premier League. Chance the Premier League has done, say now. It, mm. it basically needs Liverpool to come back against Atalanta tonight and West Ham to 
uh, overturn the unbeaten. But both of those things need to happen. Yeah. Is this going to be a thing every year, or is that it yeah. done for three yeah. years now? No, or no, something? Uh, no. Welcome to the world of coefficients. So baby. every year we're <laughs> going to have this place. chat <laughs> about where we're at, we're fourth or fifth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you don't like it, go back to your aunt's <laughs> room. Might do. Uh, the other Which semi- I has scored with three decimal places. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the other semi-final will be between two teams from the former group of death, Borussia mm. Dortmund and PSG. We'll chat about them next. Maybe Newcastle should get an extra coefficient mm. point for just mm. taking part in a group of death. Group of death, yeah. Mm. Although they did finish bottom. Yeah, but they, they made so much noise. Mm. <laughs> and we're not for that penalty decision. Yeah, that well. dodgy penalty decision. Then mm. maybe it would have been Newcastle rather than PSG in the semi-final. Well... PSG it is. Barcelona looked good, actually. Uh, they were 2-0 up with an hour to play. And then there was a pretty seismic red card for Orajo, who clattered into Bradley Barcola. And Bad Danica's- decision? I know. No. Do you feel? Do you I do. Yeah, well, really? what yeah I do. I, I think... He I wasn't think the, the last man. The touch, I think the touch was so heavy from the player. The touch was deliberately aimed, I think, at initiating the contract. You know, like we've had that debate yeah, yeah. a million times. Well, he cuts across. He cuts across him, but he knocks the ball so far out of his feet that there's not a chance he's getting there before. Oh, okay. So you feel you're going to be kicked out of the forwards union. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just thought it was a really, or quite a harsh red card, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. had actually given the ball away. That he'd mm. initiated, if you like, that uh, PSG attack mm. with mm. Uh, yeah. a miss place pass and I think was possibly a little bit over hasty in trying to redeem himself the, the thing is in the defense if you're a defender in that position yeah. these days you literally have to give yourself a, a yard space and not go anywhere near the forward because it doesn't have to be a shove it has to be I just have to touch that person and they will hit the deck mm-hmm. and, and don't you think that if it's partly incumbent on the defender well, if the player if the attacker has taken a heavy touch he needs to recognise I don't need to get too close because he's not going to get the ball anyway so just much don't as, give him any reason to go down much as Jacques Cancelo later in the game yeah. had no need to go flying well, yeah, what we're works. saying though is that, that that player in those situations you can't defend you have to stay away from the player well, that's what you're basically days, saying if you defend they're the rest you're <laughs> in jail <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, whether right or wrong, yeah, it was a big. It was a big. Off call. he went. Xavi was to follow mm. after uh, particularly what an image. a bit of, yeah, man in a Stone Island jumper booting some. I mean, you know, Xavi once completed 182 passes in a Champions League game against Celtic, and now he's just smashing pitch side stuff. I mean, Furniture. what? what a you, UEFA won't be happy with that. Goalkeeping like, damage coach in their also club. saw red yeah, in the game, went. ill-tempered. Uh, PSG <laughs> making it through. Are they any good? Uh, it's quite hard to say because uh, when it was 11, the 11 across the tie, they were very much second best. I mean, they, they did what they needed to do well. They were, you know, they, they managed that situation well. But helped by Barcelona, who I thought were, you know, as soon as the man got sent off, mm. as soon as they went down to 10, I thought oh, PSG would do this. But that was partly because Barca had that feeling of like, I don't know if they'll be able to manage this. Like, it's right. not an unmanageable situation. You can go down to 10 and be like, okay. Well, exactly. Well, Barca just... were like, whoa, yeah. this is outrageous. <laughs> well, because their manager was saying, whoa, this is outrageous. Yeah. You know, if the manager had stayed a bit calmer then they, and regrouped the players, mm. they, they might have had a better chance. But look, Mbappe and Dembele against 10 men is, is a problem, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, my sense is definitely that whoever wins the Bayern Real Madrid semi will be the favourite. We are this close to Real Madrid v Mbappe in the final. Mm, wow. Be Good drenched course. in narrative. Yeah. I mean, there's so That's many narrative options out there. You've also got Bayern against Borussia Dortmund. At Wembley. At Wembley again. At Wembley yeah. again. Or, you know, any other variation you want of those. <laughs> yeah, but it is, hmm? it is Dortmund who will be taking on PSG for the right to make the trip to Neasden. Uh, they were... 4-2 winners on Tuesday against Atletico. Atletico, producer Charlie points out, went to Dortmund with a one-goal lead and ended up conceding four. That's not very on-brand from Diogo Simeone. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, well, they're not they're not Simeone-esque anymore, are they? No. It's just, so you look at their away record, Atletico. No one would have fancied them in that tie. Not many people fancied Dortmund, but this was hailed by many as being a kind of throwback to the, the glory days of Klopp of blood and thunder and pressure and physicality and, and goal scoring. There was that Malaga one they had, didn't they, in that yeah. 2013 run that this mm. is something it's harking back to. I mean, what a season for the Bundesliga. I mean, you know, it could be a Dortmund and Bayern final. They're not right. even the two best teams in the, mm. in the league. Yeah. Well, the, the one that is, 
and they're playing tonight against West Ham in the London Stadium. But strong favourites now for the Europa League after Liverpool's uh, catastrophic first leg. Again, we don't know what's going to happen I, I in can't see Dortmund. I can't see Dortmund getting past, past PSG. They, they could no. have conceded. So many goals in that game. It was, it was, it was one-on-ones for fun, weren't they? It? It, was, it was so open. So they met, of course, in the group of death, aka Group F. It was a 2-0 win for PSG in the opening game in Paris. When they met at the uh, Signal du Park, it was a 1-1 draw, but it was a night that saw Julien Laurent in particularly spectacular form because PSG were just wasting chance after chance, and Bacala in, in particular. So, yeah, they, they very much seemed the better team back then, but... Who knows? In a couple of weeks, we'll have the semi-finals, yeah, and then then we'll 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 get to to know for sure. I enjoyed the full crew goal, just kissing. Yeah. It was a great header, yeah. and when it kisses off the far post, it's always a little bit sexier. Mm. Nice, yeah. just and a big big man, isn't he? Just a unit. Yeah, Sabitzer as well with the the the, the goal that finally made it five four on aggregate. Yeah and absolutely tearing off to the corner flag to do knee slides and stuff. Uh, Rafa was telling us on the Tuesday show, he, he's not a man who celebrates. He got a he got a, um, a brace at the weekend against Gladbach and kind of reacted as if he just stepped into something. But this time, though, that's what it means. Mm. Excellent. Well, those are your Champions League semi-finalists. Poor old Arsenal and City. Sand City will get to go to Wembley anyway, though, this weekend because they've got an FA Cup semi-final there on Saturday. We'll chat about that and the other semi next. Saturday, Sunday, stand by. It's FA Cup semi-finals at Wembley. Saturday, it's Man City against Chelsea, the side who, since our last show, have only gone and had their biggest win of the season. Monday night, 6-0 victory over Everton. Woof. Four goals. For Cole Palmer, mm. Mm, former City player, I believe, and the only uh, one City of which player to score against Arsenal this season. I'm sorry, what? He's the only Manchester City player to score against Arsenal. Of this course, season. at Wembley. Uh, yeah, he's got at Wembley. Mm -hmm. Crikey! His fourth goal was a penalty. Was there anything else newsworthy about that? <laughs> <laughs> on that, on that, if I if I was a manager, I was thinking about this. I've got no skin in the game, but it wound me up. Because I've been in that position, I think I've talked about that before, where people are trying to take a pen off you. I just think it's such a selfish thing that it's a it's a it's a red flag for me as a manager. Mm. I would get rid of Jackson and Madueke almost what? on the basis of that. I'd just get rid of them. Would you get rid of Cole Palmer as well because he essentially gets involved in this. No, because it's his it's his gig. You know, it's he's he's the, is he the official. Penalty? He's the official. Yeah. Well, he's he one of the he best. Is now. He was made the official penalty taker yeah. after the game. Yeah. I just think it was a really, really out of order, and I just think it's a red flag. It's, yeah, I, just, I don't mind it. it shows passion. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I thought Delhi made a good point. It was like you didn't see them like fighting, take the really pressured penalty against United. Apparently, like, Madueke has tried it before, though. Oh, really? Like he's he's a he's a but perennial. One, right? he's a, because, no, like <laughs> obviously, like yeah, I'll have yeah, this when there's like no he, pressure on. You know, Chelsea's. You know, who know? They might have like eighty percent of their wages might be a gold bonus or something. You don't know. Carl Palmer's on, on for the golden boot. Imagine yeah. a bonus for that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been in that situation? I have. I, I think I've spoken about it before. I, I, I had a, a protracted row with with with, with, with a teammate over. I was the captain. I was the who penalty was taker. It was Rocky Baptiste, um, right. uh, and and yeah, he he was really stubborn, and but. I couldn't give in because I was the I was the oh. captain. I couldn't give in to him, and I wasn't going to. What happened? Um, what was the game state? I can't really remember. It was just a you know, you national league game. Did you Bernardo it or did it go in? Oh no, I went in. I only ever missed one penalty in my career. Nice. So yeah, which haunts me. Well, that Who was. was that? Yeah. Oh, it was, it was a, a lowish level mm. towards the end, yeah. But That was yeah. one of the questions about this goal, though <laughs> clearly with the scoreline the way it was, there wasn't that much pressure, but there was pressure in a kind of inter-teammate sense because having made such a point of, mm. with, with the aid of Conor Gallagher, of taking the spot kick, he, he couldn't get it wrong. Cole Palmer, who's two goals before, no, three goals before that? The second one, anyway, was absolutely masterful. The one where he nutmegs that and back the heels goal. then. First oh, that goal. was the first goal, right. And the perfect hat-trick. So yeah. it's only the yeah. 39th perfect hat-trick, only the 30th first half hat-trick. Did you say, was it the earliest a player's ever got a perfect hat-trick in the Premier League? It was after, it was after what, half an hour or something? Yeah, it? it's up there. Um, but yeah, great. The first one was, as you say, just lovely construction. Mm. Second one, a sort of striker's header finish, even though not striker. So last time Chelsea were at Wembley, was that League Cup final defeat against 
Liverpool when Gary Neville was labelling them a blue billion pound bottle jobs. Uh, here we are now with them beating Everton 6-0. Have they moved on then? Can we say? They're in good form. I mean, good weirdly, form. It, well, it depends how you... I think it's eight unbeaten in the league, but four draws and a couple of those draws against... Burnley and Sheffield United mm. so it's that's no maybe a, games in our league right? <laughs> true yeah it's a little deceptive but they they are they're definitely in the best form they've been in this season and and you know they've drawn twice with Chelsea already uh, sorry they've drawn twice with City yeah. already they played well in both those games I did they an did, analysis yeah. piece uh, last week on, on what they need to improve on because I looked at all the goals they've been conceded and the the pattern is quite concerning actually it's a major lack of tracking back Really? From, from, the, from the wide players um, they, there's been some instances of pure laziness um, exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, they're, yeah so they, they, I still don't think they're right I still don't think they're, they're fully committed as a team there's not been a great passion to defend balls coming into their box you know it's been a little bit of lightweight but but this might be the occasion, the, the kind of game that where it focuses focuses the mind. And they've played very well against City on both occasions. I thought they were superb in the first half of the Etihad. What, the what have they done? We, we spoke earlier about people having success with a more direct approach to City. But yeah. what have Chelsea done to stymie them? To stymie them? Well, they played very much on the counter, didn't they, at, at the Etihad? They, they really they, carried a threat. They basically did what a lot of teams, you think, could do more of which like if you can beat that it sounds easy but if you can beat that first press mm. City do leave huge open spaces in behind them mm. Chelsea were able to do that and they do have fast attackers mm. so they just kept beating the press and then putting balls in behind and it was like oceans of space and even into the second half they didn't have the same chances mm. because they did the final pass often wasn't right but they they had yeah. those openings I mean we've heard of the Matthews Cup final it could be I've I reckon it's going to be the Mudrick semi-final go down in history. Do you think? I think so. Well, okay. Oh, you think he's the he's I think, the I think he'll have in the... Big in the open spaces Wide of open spaces, the acres of room. So. The, yeah, the, I think they've got to get a lead here, Chelsea, because a look, you look at the benches and that is... It's incredible that you're talking about blue billion pound bottle jobs or whatever. <laughs> and then you look at Chelsea's bench and you say, well, where's the money gone? Because... The last game, I think that Baddy Ashile was on the bench and Chilwell, and all of the other players were pretty much kids. Um, and we all know what City's bench looks like at the, at the Although moment. Although City will be knackered after Wednesday yeah. night. So. Mm. Yeah. But True City enough. as well, I mean, you mentioned about you know Arsenal being a team that are great when they go ahead, not so much when they go behind. City have had a bit of that, in, even when they're great teams, because obviously they don't go behind very often, mm. but they are a team that... Actually, they, they have been going behind an awful this lot. Season, yeah. This season they have, but often mm. they've. it's been like, it's very rare, and then when it happens, right. they're a bit kind of spooked. But they are obviously such good front runners but you know if, Ch if Chelsea were like in that game the Etihad yeah. they got ahead and City came back to draw but mm. Chelsea carried a threat all, all game Adrian you mentioned that Cole Palmer's in the running for the golden boot mm. he's currently level uh, with uh, Erling Haaland on 20 yeah. goals mm. will Haaland ever score again though? <laughs> I think he will um, will he play in, do you think he'll start in this game? Arnold? Haaland? yeah yeah, yeah, I'd start. I mean, he's still still in Manchester City. You best might start. Do you think Pep will? Yeah. You don't think he will? Saying no. I think the City will name a a, a rotated team. Do first. you? Yeah. Okay. I do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, bear in mind, like even the players that kept, the, the subs that came on for City yesterday were Alvarez, Doku, Kovacic, Stones. Any of them, you'd be perfectly, you know, you'd be yes, very man. happy to start. Let alone Ake, Lewis, Bob, Nunes, who didn't even get off the bench. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I suppose the FA Cup. Could, is the one that they can go by the wayside if you if you city, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I still think they've got no, to be favourites because of the bench. He'll be saving Holland for, yeah. for the league more than he might feel that on current form, and particularly with uh, Holland showing fatigue. Well, he on left Wednesday Rodri night. out when Rodri asked to be left out didn't yeah. he, for for the recent game against Luton. Harland's asked to come off. You know, it's it's an interesting sort of time, isn't it? Joiner did as well, apparently. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. They're, they're, yeah. Like, it is. It, it's interesting now though, because City, we've become so used to the managing semi-finals of the Champions League alongside FA Cup semis and finals, the Premier League run, and now they'll have actually fewer games than they're used to, and they've got this kind of big bulging squad that's set up for all those games. It'll be interesting now. They'll have a few kind of spare midweeks that they're really mm. not used to at this stage of the season. Right All right, well, the other semi-final in the FA Cup comes on Sunday at 3.30 and it pits Coventry against Man United. Sky Blues in their first semi-final 
in the FA Cup since their triumph in the competition in 1987. If they could well prove the story of the season, would you say, commentary in, in English football? Is that is that hyperbolic? What, you if know they all reach about the cup commentary. Final? If they were to, the way that they've been going, yeah. the trajectory they've been on, obviously not just this season, but mm. particularly this time around. Yeah, I, I think they're going to miss out on the playoffs. I, I think that's not going to happen for right. them now. They, 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 they lost 3-0 at, at Birmingham last weekend. It's a bit of a no-show. So I don't think they're going to do the double of FA Cup final and playoffs, personally. Good job because but, they're on consecutive days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so, they, yeah. so that, that, they'll solve that problem. But they are a dangerous team. They're a team that can create chances. They're a team that break really quickly. And I think that that they'll have to defend quite deep because the big difference between the, the Premier League and the Championship is speed. Okay, you, they're, a great, they're really good players in the Championship, but a lot of the time they're just that two kilometres an hour slower than the Premier League counterparts. So they're going to have to defend deep against Garnaccio, against Hoyland, Rashford, etc. But they're very good at breaking quickly and um, they've got a target man in Ellis Sims who's on fire. Had you right. Um, is quite a cumbersome American international that plays up up on the left, but he carries a threat. Um, so, yeah, Coventry almost always score. I know they didn't last week. They, they they have goals in them. Right, and they're the top scorers in 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 the FA Cup actually. Yeah, they, played yeah. more games than most teams did because they're yeah. In the I give them a but... chance. You know, I think they'll create plenty against this United team. I, think, I don't think that's a stretch to say that. Um, yeah, it's. I think for United, it's just, there's a lot that rests on, on Bruno. If, if Bruno Fernandes is, is at it, he'll win the game for them. But if he's not, who else is going to do it for them? That, um, that idea of Coventry having to play back-to-back days mm. reminds me of uh, Roland Nielsen, who in 93, the FA Cup final was played on the Saturday. Yeah. And then there was the replay on the Thursday. This is Arsenal-Sheffield yeah. Wednesday. On the Wednesday, Roland Nielsen played an international for Sweden. So he did back-to-back days. Went and played for Sweden. Next day, came and played the FA Cup. Did he start in the replay? Yeah, he came off at (laughs) (laughs) half-time. Maybe maybe he was overplayed. But he'll he'll probably be doing saying, what's the big deal? Just play play on back-to-back days. Two terrible finals, by the way. They were awful. 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 Didn't even... There was not even an injury to Steve Morrow to enjoy. (laughs) (laughs) Andy Linnigan, though. He's a great lad. You know, for him to pop up with the winner was, was awesome. Coventry haven't played Man United for 17 years when United had Johnny Evans in their back line. Remember that? <laughs> Alongside uh, Gerard Piquet. Uh, that was a uh, League Cup matchup, uh, which they lost 2-0. Uh, this time, you remember how they got past uh, Wolves in the, what was that, quarterfinals? Mm. Two goals deep into stoppage time to turn that one around. Uh, do you feel that momentum particularly given Man United's current travails, is with the Sky Blues? Well, if you can beat Wolves at Molyneux, you can beat, you can beat United. You beat this version of United. It's not... This wouldn't be, for me, the shock of no. the century if they were to, to win. Um, it, they have to play well to do it, but, but they're capable. And they've had that Wembley experience as yeah. a team. Not all of them, but, but last year in the playoff final, they've, half the team, at least have played in front of a full house at Wembley. They know what it's about. So it shouldn't, in theory, phase them, really. I mean, there'd be something ironic about Mark Robbins ushering in a... Or speeding up a sacking mm. at Manchester United. Right. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, there you go. That is the FA Cup semi-final picture. There's also Premier League to enjoy this weekend, so we'll get onto that next. You excited for the Instotally draw very shortly? Mm. Yeah, me too. Before we get Graham on to that. Kelly's the... just come in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, Graham. We've got some. I, got I, some I've Premier done League. some big yeah. draws in my time. I've done, I've done the You've FA Cup fourth qualifying time. round draw yeah, on you? numerous right. occasions. I've done it. Well, numerous. I think I've done it three times exactly. on, live on the Perhaps radio. Perhaps like technique. I, I'm a good ball jiggler, <laughs> <laughs> apparently. But the. Um, yeah, I've done that. I've done the FA Trophy draw. Um, right. yeah. And now the Intertotally. Proud, mm-hmm. proud moments. Is lot of them. those blisters on your hand? <laughs> so I'm just going to move on and say congratulations to <laughs> 2008 FA Cup winners Portsmouth, who this week got promoted back to the Championship after Brilliant. 11 years away. Also, Jane Austen fans to Mansfield Town. They got to League One back in the third tier for the first time in 21 years. Nigel Clough's Mansfield Town, of course. Yeah, he's good. He's, I love Nigel Clough. He's a really good manager. Yeah, yeah these teams play good football, and 
Yeah, they stuck with him. He's, yeah, he's now managed more games than the old man. Has he now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow, I believe. that's amazing. Yeah. 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 He's um yeah, he's a very likable guy, Cluffy, and and um yeah, Mansford, it's been coming for years. Great story of Portsmouth as well. Um John Massinio, they employed a guy that has just retired from playing. He had no managerial experience and he's proved to be perfect <laughs> you know he's done nothing wrong they've lost four games all season wow. it's a really balanced team the recruitment he nailed um yeah but just john Messina, i think is heading you know heading upwards and so are pompey so nice. yeah really exciting excellent do they still have the man with the bell does he yeah. still feature thanks so. excellent uh, in the Premier League, seven matches this weekend because the FA Cup semi-finals. Saturday at three o'clock, there's big bottom three flavour as Luton face Brentford and Sheffield United take on Burnley. Sunday, a bit more of that kind of back-end battle as Everton and Nottingham Forest face each other. Elsewhere, Sunday at three o'clock, you've got Palace, West Ham and Aston Villa, Bournemouth. Those games not televised while with uh, Man City busy with the cup, Arsenal and Liverpool have a chance to move back past them. In the title race, Arsenal play Saturday evening at 7.30, and usually enough, they're away at Molyneux against Wolves. Liverpool are the late game on Sunday at 4.30. They're at Craven Cottage against Fulham. Liverpool, as we mentioned this evening, as we record, are away in Bergamo, trying to turn around that 3-0 deficit from their first leg against Atalanta. Don't know what's going to happen there. But uh, what do you fancy? What do you think about their chances against this Fulham team, who are, you know, your box of chocolates? It's a, it's a huge weekend in the title race, isn't it? Mm. Because City aren't playing. Liverpool and Arsenal have to win, and, they, and they've both got really tricky games, in, in my opinion. Um, Fulham, I watched, uh, I worked on the game at, at Anfield. Fulham was so unlucky not to win that game. I don't know if you recall it. They were they were leading and Liverpool mounted one of these amazing comebacks. But Fulham caused them all sorts of problems. So if Fulham turn up, it's, it's a really, really tricky game because they've got, you know, they smashed Spurs recently. Right. They've, they've, they've beaten quite a few beat decent Arsenal. teams. Yeah, they beat Arsenal, beat also them well. lost at home to Burnley. Yeah, but exactly. But, just, yeah. yeah, exactly. But, but they're capable of making it hard. And, and I think, I think on the other one at Molyneux, I think it's a hard game for Arsenal, not least because I would put down one of Wolves' great strengths as athleticism and running power. Mm. Um, you know, Cunha, and you've got the midfield guys, Lamina, who's with powers in, Joao Gomez. They can run all day, Wolves. And Both Arsenal. Football team and in real life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Arsenal, as we said earlier on, are knackered. Yeah, okay, so they've think, got to get the job done in the first half, really. Yeah, th yeah, this game like... always felt like a really tricky one coming straight after Bayern. I think it's the first time they've gone, they've had an away Premier League game after an away Champions League game right. this season as well. So that's something they haven't experienced. It's a, it's a big test. Arsenal awesome. uh, travelling, really... their season unravelling. And that's the, the danger, although the stats very much are in their favour, at least recent history. Wolves haven't won any of their last five in all competitions. The Gunners have won all of their last five meetings with Wolves. Mm. As for Liverpool, as you say, the reverse fixture with Fulham, 87 minutes played, they were 3-2 down at Anfield and then those late goals. Do you see late goals? Do you see any goals in, in Liverpool at the moment? They, like Arsenal, haven't scored in their last two ahead of the uh, trip to Bergamo. Don't I always see Liverpool. I always see goals with Liverpool. Do you? Because yeah. we haven't seen any in the last. I know. They've been creating loads, haven't they? So yeah. you think they haven't been taking their chances. Exactly. Yeah. But I think that will. But turn is around. that a good thing or a well, bad you'd rather, thing? You'd, chances is generally seen as a bad. Mm. But you'd rather have the lots of chances, wouldn't you? It's not like they've been kind of completely shut out. Right. Um, That's fair. That's I think fair. That will turn around. But it is. A, it is a hard. I mean, Craven Cottage has been a hard place to go, despite mm. it seeming like a lovely, cuddly little ground. They haven't won any of their last three visits there, Liverpool. There you go. Well, okay. it was there on the opening day of last season, wasn't it? They drew yes, two all, and it was all. the first yeah. sort of yeah. initial sign that Liverpool's mm. season was not going to go yeah. to plan. So there you go. All right. Well, let's move on to the action at the bottom end of the table. Here's how the relegation picture stands. Brentford lie in 15th place and they look kind of safe, seven points clear. And Burnley and Sheffield United lie in 19th and 20th place and they both look pretty much gone. Burnley six points and Sheffield United 10 points from safety. But in between those two kind of bookends, you've got three teams who are battling not to be the side that goes down with probably Burnley and Sheffield United. Those three sides are Everton, Nottingham Forest and Luton. There's only two points separating the three. 
although Everton do have a game in hand. Two of those three play each other this weekend in the shape of Everton and Nottingham Forest. I mean, that seems huge. Ten point, ten pointer. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever they decide. <laughs> Everton, who a fortnight ago got their first victory in, what, 15, 14 matches, have now suffered the heaviest defeat of Sean Dyche's career. Uh, that's 6-0. Not sure where that leaves them. Also, the fact that Jared Brantwaite left the field injured on Monday. Forrest, maybe not the greatest of form either. What would you think? I think they're in better, better form than Everton, personally. I think uh, Chris Wood is in particularly lethal form. I think Gibbs he's, White. Gibbs White is coming back. He, he looks sharp. Wood, by the way, is the most lethal striker in the Premier League. Out of all the players that have scored 10 goals, he's mm -hmm. got the best conversion rate, which is extraordinary, really. really? He's, he's been Liverpool very effective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I think the, the issue for Forrest, and, and I know that Forrest, uh, Matt Davis Adams, I was speaking to him, friend of the show uh, earlier in the week and he was saying I dread in this game mm. because Forest are truly awful at set pieces mm. and then they've conceded 25 they've scored the fewest number of set pieces as well six so they're just rubbish at their balls and, uh, and one thing Everton are always pretty good at no matter which manager actually but particularly under Sean Dyche is, is causing problems from, from corners I mean Spurs will know this mm. from that 2-2 two -two draw where they really unsettled Vicario so I think, uh, yeah, that, that could end up being the difference. But Forrest are in good enough form to go there and get a result. But mm. since they come up to the Premier League, they've barely done anything away from home, have they? Yeah, they've got three wins mm -hmm. in, in 35 away games. Not yeah. great. What would they give for a, a victory on the road in this game? Could potentially put Everton into the bottom three, depending, of course, on what happens in the game three o'clock Saturday between Luton and Brentford. Brentford, who, as we say, seem pretty much sorted now. Seven points clear of the drop. This is it. They, they need to make the most of their remaining games at Kennels Road, where they've got winnable they fixtures. Everton, don't they? Yeah, yeah that could be a bit big. Big spicy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think 33 is probably safe. Yeah. So if you, were, if you look at it that way, Luton are kind of needing two wins, two draws from five games. So this, this is kind of must-win territory at home to... Home to Brentford. The issue is they've got they've got no defenders fit. You know they're, they're nearly all injured. Um, the, on the plus side, Sambi Laconga might be back available for this game, and I think he will make a difference alongside um, uh, Ross Barkley in midfield. I think they, they had a nice little combo going before he got injured. Just on Sheffield United quickly, um, they're now on 84 goals conceded. Obviously, mm. the, the big story of the Premier League this season is can they be the first team since Swindon to concede 100 goals in a season? That's when it was 42 games. Exactly. So yeah. the most in a 38 game campaign was Derby, who conceded 89. So they only need to ship five more. Conveniently, their last game against Burnley saw them ship five mm. in one go at Turf Moor. And that's who they play this weekend. Uh, of course, back at theirs, Sheffield United Burnley. That's Saturday, 3 o'clock as well. Could be spicy. Uh, also, this weekend, Sunday at 3 o'clock, you've got Aston Villa Bournemouth which is especially key now that the coefficient has gone the way it's gone yeah. because it's top four now for Champions League. Aston Villa currently in fourth. They are three points ahead of Spurs, who do not play this weekend. Spurs, though, already have a game in hand on them, so it's really delicately poised. Villa are playing Bournemouth. Of course, Thursday, tonight as we record, they are in France mm. uh, in the... Conference League quarterfinals, they're the one Premier League side that looks good to go through. <laughs> Help us, Obi-Wan <laughs> slash Unai Emery, you are our only hope. Yeah, um, God, that is my mistake. And Unai Emery, the kind of master of European competition, he's the only thing that could break the curse this season. Just, I w it wouldn't surprise me at all if Villa didn't win this game against Bournemouth. It right. feels very in keeping with sort of how they've been kind of the second half of this season anyway, where it has been. And, and Emery a little bit as well, just when you think you've got the measure of him or his team. Mm. Some, you know, like last week, I don't think anyone expected them to win that game at Arsenal. They went and were absolutely brilliant. Um, but yeah, off the back of a European quarter-final as well, I think this this could be tricky for them. Yeah, Gareth Southgate will be there, will he? Surely. Watkins, so. Solanke. Yeah. You know, Watkins, this Solanke. Is a, you can see the two, mm. two of them sort of in the flesh at the same time. Two right. quality players. Um, yeah, the thing about Villa that really impressed me at Emirates, apart from the fact that without their normal midfield, mm. They yeah. were superb with Tielemans and, and McGinn. Was the speed of their of their centre halves? I mean, 
Diego Carlos was rapid. He's, he, uh, he, yeah. he was he's almost Van der Ven yeah. level speed, and I think that that he he's well equipped to maybe contain Solanke, who's been great this okay. season. Looking forward to seeing what happens in that game. Also Sunday at three o'clock is Crystal Palace against West Ham. West Ham, similarly, will be facing Thursday night football. They host Leverkusen, the freshly crowned Bundesliga champions this Thursday night at the London Stadium. It's Leverkusen's 44th match of the season. They haven't lost any of the first 43. They're 2-0 up from the first leg. Mm. Anyway, should see it. Should see it the most really annoying happen. result in that game would be West Ham winning one 0 because it would end mm. the unbeaten run. But Leverkusen right. would go through, and everyone, a bit like everyone saying Rodri lost his unbeaten run last night, which he didn't. Yeah, what, they drew. yeah, that, okay, mm. yeah. Well, I won, as soon as I wondered that, mm. yeah. uh, Crystal Palace West Ham Sunday at three o'clock is actually usually a really entertaining match. Delayed by fifteen minutes last year due What's to. An issue with the Selhurst Park's ticket scanning software. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I'll when it did it get underway. Worth the way. <laughs> <laughs> when it did get underway, yeah, it was worth it. It was, away. yeah. Yeah, 4-3 mm. for Crystal Palace. It was 3-2 West Ham the year before that, and 3-2 West Ham the year before that. So, wow. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Because Hodgson was the manager of Palace. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and was that when he'd first come back and they were scoring goals galore? Yeah, he went, he went sort of off-piece, didn't he, tactically? Crazy. Yeah. yeah, and obviously, yeah, so Moyes and Hodgson producing those sort of thrillers was, was very... Football. Out of keeping. <laughs> <laughs> now, crazy. All right, well, we'll be back to review uh, what happens in the Premier League and FA Cup semi-finals uh, with a show that's going to be up slightly later than... Than usual Monday, kind of early lunchtime. Apologies for the delay, but uh, hopefully we will be similarly worth the wait. Mm. Uh, but we're not done today because next up, oh boy, it's the Inter Totally 2024 draw. Tension building, feeling all a tingle as we prepare for a brand new Inter Totally Cup 2024. The exciting news is that while other major tournaments are expanding, possibly a little bit too much, we've focused him, gone all killer, no filler. This year's <laughs> in no way hastily cobbled together tournament because we forgot and didn't realise it was already April is kind of like a quiz super league, I would say, because we've got together, you know, former champs, the eight best best Champion quizzers. Of champions. Yeah. Just fast forwarded to the quarter final stage. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We've ditched the group stage, which never that interesting uh, and uh, so we've got the names of the eight best players statistically in intertotally history in a bowl which uh, Adrian and you and Duncan are going to be drawing from the eight contenders are Coxie of course Story producer Charlie Benji another Charlie Eccleshire Tommy Williams uh, uh, Julian and, and Sasha uh, Duncan you're stepping back Mm. This time around, director of football Moving slash right. quiz setting. You're going to be doing some quiz setting. That's yeah. very, very exciting. All right, and you're going to be helping Adrian with the draw. I'm going to draw the home teams, or home players. Okay, Duncan's going to be the uh, the visitors. Home and away, never more important than in, of course, in Stoney <laughs> Cup. So, it's no uh, velvet back. I'll be honest. It's uh, sort right. of uh, just a, a bowl. Bowl. You're yeah, very oddly. It's all Lancaster Gate. Huh? Yeah. Here we go then. Here okay. <clears throat> <laughs> number two number two Daniel Story 2022 winner will play number three <gasps> is producer Charlie winner the following year in 2023 number one is Michael Cox winner in 2020 and 21 home draw for Coxie yeah. will play Number five is Charlie Eccleshare, finalist in 2022. Number eight, Sasha Gurinov, who really likes the Intertotally Cup. <laughs> Picked up two there, but I didn't see the numbers. We'll play number six. Tom Williams, finalist in 2023. Finally, number four. Benji Lanyado, finalist in 2021. And just to prove that everything's above board, we'll play number seven. Julian Laurence, perennial semi-finalist and creator of the face-saving third-place playoff 
Wow. All right, well, first things first. Charlie, how do you feel about that draw? Michael Cox? Not ideal. Um, but I guess if you want to be the best, you've got to beat the best. Wow. No easy games, etc., and so on. I think he was my first round opponent last year. As well. Was he? How did that go? Uh, well for him, less well for me. Mm. All right. Producer Charlie, in that all previous winners matchup with Daniel Story, that's huge. I think Julian Laurent's against Benji Laniado. Can you call that one, Adrian? I'm not sure. No, no I've, I've been defeated by Benji in, in the past. Yeah, yeah, he's a strong player. Strong. And Tom Williams against Sasha That's Grinnell. the only non televised. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Benji v ben. Julian. I can't think that Julian would be involved in anything that wasn't <laughs> televised. Yeah. But, I know, mean, what a face for TV, you know. Mm. Wow. All right, some sizzling. Duncan Alexander questions heading the way of those contenders. And I believe Nick Miller will also be doing his traditional question setting as well. So it's going to be extra special. And producer Charlie all starts off next Thursday with, I'm not sure which matchup, depending on availability. Anyway, look out for that, listener. Terrific. What an exciting time of year. Well, it's, it's a time of year I've dreaded in the past when really? I've been involved in it. Just, just you know, for my sort of lack of quiz knowledge what's, being what's exposed. What's more nerve-wracking, it's a totally fixture or yeah. playing for Arsenal? Oh, def definitely the quiz. Yeah, yeah totally, definitely yeah. the quiz. Yeah. I just meant broadly speaking, from a you know, from a listener or viewer's oh, point of view, this, this is, is the time when this is, this this is, is the business the end, happens. isn't it? You yeah. feel you feel like you've arrived yeah. at the climax of the season when Inter mm. totally starts and finishes. So yeah, it's a, yeah. what a time to be alive. Okay, well that FA Cup semi-finals, Champions League, all that stuff. It's all so exciting. We've reached very much the climax of this show so uh, we'll just park that there and say many many thanks to adrian to charlie you're back with us on monday i think is that right early early monday i believe so Woo, duncan alexander you're heading off on a trip i am yeah I'm going to watch palermo oh yeah mm. oh nice mm. at the favorita mm. very nice excellent uh, good looking forward to hearing about that in the future many thanks as well to Liam and producer Charlie in the booth and above all you listener do join us again once the weekend's done for now from all of us here it's goodbye the Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about we've got views we've got stats we've got analysis we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below. So Arsenal and Manchester City both out of the Champions League, which means the winner of Paris Saint-Germain and Dortmund will face either Real Madrid or Bayern Munich in the final at Wembley on the 1st of June. I just wonder, both of you, would you have predicted those semi-finals when the draw was initially made, Pete? No, no, I don't think so. Man City, I think, is the big shot, really, for me not getting through. I think Arsenal... I think I think I was surprised by how good Bayern Munich were in that first leg against Arsenal, and I think that maybe changed how I saw that tie going, because I think then going back to Bayern Munich, then I thought they might have the edge, which they obviously did in that game. But we've spoken about the Man City-Real Madrid game, how that could have gone Man City's way so easily. But for them not to be there, great opportunity for these four teams remaining. Great opportunity, I think, for Paris Saint-Germain as well, because I look at them, you know, they've got a star man in Mbappe, who's, of course, leaving this summer. Fair, fairy tale? Is it a fairy tale if you leave your, your hometown <laughs> club to go to Real Madrid? <laughs> I don't fairy know. tale, goodbye. <laughs> See, I, also, um, I, I also, I expected Atletico Madrid to be here. So yeah, I thought City sure. would be here, and I thought Atleti would be here, yeah. honestly. And so I thought PSG would... would would probably end up meeting Atletico and I thought they'd have a very stubborn brick to break. Mm. Instead, it's going to be Dortmund who will be chaos and fun and that probably will play into PSG's hands. So, yeah, this semi-final outlook is very different to what I expected. Yeah, it's yeah. Good, Those ties on the other side of the draw were chaos is a great word yeah, to use, yeah, yeah. Sam. So, Michael, what do these results do for England's chances of getting that fifth Champions League place this season. Oh, it's not looking good. A massive blow last night for English sides hoping to secure that fifth Champions League qualification spot further behind Germany in the rankings with the hopes firmly on Liverpool who are 3-0 down, West Ham 2-0 down and Aston Villa winning their ties tonight. Have a look at the Opta predictor. The pressure really is on. Oh my goodness. 
6.2%. Oh, dearie, dearie me. It's not looking good, is it? It's not looking good for that fifth place, is it? Spurs fans prefer the Europa League anyway, don't you? I know, I know. <laughs> I'm glad you're here because I hear coefficient. It's like the super computer. I need Opta and Michael Bridge to explain it. Um, if you're going to pick a winner for the whole thing, or maybe if you could line them up in order of who you think is most likely, Sam, who would you go with? Well, it's very difficult to look past Real Madrid's uh, gravitas in this competition. And now that they've knocked out what I think we've basically agreed here mm. without speaking about it would be the favourites yep. for the Champions League, yep. knocking out City. You have to look at Real Madrid there. That is the strong side of the bracket. So I think I'll put Bayern Munich in second. Wouldn't have had them there before they played Arsenal. But what I saw over two legs against them, very smart. And it's just a little reminder that Thomas Tuchel can come up with that knockout game plan and really spoil your day. PSG for me would then be in third and Dortmund in fourth. But I still feel like I put PSG in, in third and I feel harsh about it because I think it's opening up for them, genuinely. And I think they'll yeah. be in the final. So how can they be third? But look, I think the winner of the Champions League will probably come from that one side. Oh, yeah, I, I disagree. I think yeah, you can flip PSG and Bayern Munich. And I think... If PSG do get to the final in that one match on that big stage at Wembley, I think they have the assets to beat any of those sides which get through, which I suspect will be Real Madrid. Top manager, Luis Enrique, has won this before. He knows what to do there. Mbappe, star quality. You've got players like Dembele. You've got other fantastic young players. And you've got the experience of players like Marquinhos, a decent goalkeeper as well. I think there's a lot adding up for PSG. And yeah, they're moving up. I'd say Dortmund will need advantage from that first leg at home in front of the yellow wall to go to Paris and, and get through that side. But I think PSG will get the job done, which will be amazing considering they came through that group with Newcastle, all the controversy around Straight that handball through, yeah. against Livramento as well. They just got through, but they built momentum in this competition and maybe just finding form at the right time. Yeah, I watched their first leg PSG and I, against Barcelona and I thought, Mbappe, he's thrown it in, he's not bothered. <laughs> and then he did what he did in the second yeah. leg. You yeah. just can't write them off. So it's really intriguing. Bayern Munich then will take on Manchester City in the next round as they advance 3-2 on aggregate against Arsenal. Uh, you all right? Sorry. You okay? Yeah. Why did you point a face? Did you say Bayern Munich take on Man City? Yes. When? That'll be the next round. No, I'm Man City now. Oh, God, yeah, sorry, Real Madrid. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I, uh, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, <laughs> cut that out, cut that out. <laughs> cut that out in the edit. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, we're live. Yeah. Right. And by by the way, he said, yeah, Man City. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I told you, said that's right. <laughs> right. We, were, right. we only talked about it for half an hour, that's all. Here we go. <laughs> well, I wasn't listening. Uh, uh, Robert, 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 shut up. Robert, what are you, you putting me off? Uh, shut up. Uh, right, here we go. Oh, my uh, Jürgen, Blumenet, Bayern, eh? Yeah, a bit similar to what we just talked about with Real Madrid. When you face Bayern Munich, you face, you're face not facing the team that just lost the Bundesliga title to Bayer Leverkusen, that they lost in, uh, in the German Cup against uh, you know, a third division team. You play Bayern Munich in the quarterfinals of the Champions League is a completely different story. You, you play a club, a club that always believes that they can win the Champions League no matter what. You know, no matter what uh, the Bundesliga season brings you or the German Cup brings you. And this is huge. And this is how, you know, that game evolved. You know, Arsenal, which is certainly a, a fantastic team and plays a fantastic season and has so much talent and has so much uh, to give. Um, the first half, they were, you know, I, I thought, you know, OK, they, they're waiting, they're waiting. Maybe we have to go into extra time in this game. So they were very shy, both teams, actually. And then it's uh, probably at halftime, uh, Thomas Tuchel told the team, listen, you know, go out there now and get this uh, get this win. So we go into the semi-final. And that's typical Bayern Munich. So they came out of uh, halftime, out of the, the, the break, and and they, yeah, they, 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 they rose a little bit the tempo of the game. And, and uh, there was a double chance with Goretzka and uh, Guerrero. Um, uh, and, and then uh, it was sooner or later it was clear they're going to score a goal. And I'm personally very, very thrilled uh, for Joshua Kimmich that he scored that, that goal, that decisive goal, taking him into the semifinals because he had a, a tough year behind him uh, in the final eight, final four. It's, it's a different team. It's a different, it's because it's a different club and uh, they have that confidence. Uh, they know how to do it uh, no matter what happened uh, last week, maybe in the Bundesliga. Silly. Some sense that criticism came indirectly from his manager, didn't it? By his terminology, mm. yes. Uh, you know, the number, as Jorgen said, the number six, possession and chase Paulinho, 
both both uh, Kimmich and uh, Goretzka, I, I think, have been out of favour. Certainly, Goretzka out of form for long, big chunks of the season. But but right back is his natural position. Uh, a bit like Philip Lamb uh, back in the day, guys that can just pretty much play whatever you, you put them. Mm. That's how talented uh, these guys are. But he has been having uh, a bad time uh, in terms of you know his manager making it clear he doesn't fancy him uh, in the middle of the park. I, I'm, can I give you some sort of sentimental take on the Bayern side of it? I think a lot of people have been trying to rubbish Harry Kane's move to the Bundesliga and say, well, you know, you know Harry Kane's at Tottenham, he wins sod all, he goes to Bayern, they win everything, they're going to win nothing. You know, he's a quality striker. And we know Bayern have been a really good side and having the struggles this year, but here Harry Kane is, obviously, Leverkusen have done it in, uh, by some margin in the, in the Bundesliga. But here he is, I think, validating his move to a club of this, this size, who are always fighting on these fronts and they've had a bad one domestically. But now, who's to argue, looking at Man City being knocked out and Arsenal are knocked out by, by Bayern, that it's pretty much up in the air. So I think, you know, for the likes of Harry Kane, particularly to these sort of online trolls, he could stick two fingers up at them and say, <laughs> you know what, don't, don't be too quick about talking about me winning nothing. Uh, so I think for him, that's a big, big result as well. I mean, just for one player, but for the club, it's huge. But I think for Harry Kane validating his move there in the semi-final of the Champions League. That was Craig Burley's sentimental yep. at Corner mm -hmm. Legion. Yep. Well, yeah. it was kind of sentimental and then he well, drifted. The only thing is, is I, the only thing is, I really don't see how anybody's going to beat Man City. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, they go free where they lose. Um, that was the two best performances we've seen from Bayern Munich this season, wasn't it? Home and away against Arsenal? Ah. I think so. And the difference with Bayern Munich in these two performances, as compared to what we have seen most of the season in Bundesliga, and this is, this is simple. This is, I, I don't want to overanalyze this. Heart, right. they fight, can't. They can't. energy, intensity, running, challenging the ball, winning duels, winning second balls, a little bit of organization defensively, and, and just overall a, a certain attitude about the team that isn't always there and hasn't always been there in Bundesliga play, certainly wasn't in the Pokal, and, but you see it, and that's when, you, if you're a Bayern Munich fan, you, you have to get frustrated. You're happy that you go through, but you also have to be frustrated like, also you have it in you. You have this sort of performance in you. You have this sort of attitude. You have this sort of personality and this sort of talent. You just choose to display it every so often, not all the time. That's diff difficult to take because this is a departure. In fact, these two performances are, are outliers compared to the rest of the season. That's why they attract so much attention because you cannot go, well, where did this come from? Because it hasn't been there. Now, to the point of Joshua Kimmich, isn't it amazing how it works in our game that the most important goal of the season for Bayern Munich is scored by the player Joshua Kimmich, who has been directly or indirectly mostly criticized by his manager. So Thomas Tuchel, greatest achievement with Bayern Munich, potentially has depended upon the performance and the goal by Joshua Kimmich, the player that he doesn't want on the field. That in itself just tells you everything that there is to know about how to manage or, or how to handle a team and how things sometimes just happen to work out. Today, it just happened to work out for Bayern Munich and Thomas Tuchel. They go through. And deservedly so, because over the two yeah. legs, they were better than Arsenal. If you don't watch the Bundesliga, or I mean, it's a bit like the Liga, the commentary on that uh, the Liga game, it's crystal clear. They don't watch Real Madrid right. every week. And if you don't watch the Bundesliga and you just think Bayern Munich, maybe not even, maybe just have a little glance at the table, you think, yeah, it's Bayern Munich, isn't it? But if you really, if you watch them all year, but particularly the last two games going in, Dortmund at home and Heidenheim away, second half. Yeah. First half, not too bad. Second half, a total collapse against the side, I think it was the, it's the first ever year in the Bundesliga, Correct. promoted last year, right, who made three subs at halftime, <laughs> Little Heidenheim, and Bayern collapsed. And so you had to, and I know Jürgen picked Bayern, and that's fair enough, but you had to sit here rationally and go, right, and this was before the Arsenal defeat to Villa at the weekend, you yep. had to sit and go, right, how, 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 how do you find a way for Bayern Munich to, to win this game over two legs? And it was hard to find an argument, and I suppose one sense is, like Dortmund, there's a change of tune in this competition, there's a change of energy, and the other side of it is, and certainly we can talk about it in this game, 
is that Arsenal's performances in, in this competition have been nowhere near the standard of their performances in the Premier League. And maybe it's just because they've met their match in this competition. I don't know. But it was hard to put an argument up as to how Bayern would knock Arsenal out over 180 minutes. Uh, Jürgen, it's interesting from what Ali was saying about Thomas Tuchel's role in all of this. Because surely as a coach, you should be getting your players to believe, to show heart, even though it's against Heidenheim. Yet clearly he hasn't, and yet they step on the pitch today and put in these sort of performances. So has he got anything to do with it, or is it just the players wanting it? No, he certainly has uh, a lot to do with it. You know, he's still guiding the, the entire environment on the inside of the of the team, and he's a very experienced and a very very good coach. And he proved that he won the Champions League as well already. Um, but uh, the phenomenon of Bayern Munich in the Bundesliga has also to do with the fact, first of all, Bayern Leverkusen played its uh, season of the of all times, you know, which nobody expected. In uh, the perfection, Bayern Leverkusen did it and deserved it. Now, the other thing is. Bayern Munich won the German Bundesliga the, the last 11 seasons. No, it's 11 years in a, in a row Bayern Munich won it. So the, the hunger, the hunger in you as a player is not the same. And then you see a team coming up and not losing any game until today. Bayern losing, Leverkusen hasn't lost any game in the Bundesliga season. So, so you give it to them and say, okay, you know what? It's, it's maybe meant to be that way. But at the same time, um, the, the club still has this desire, this hunger, and and also this expectation to do well in whatever is left over. So it left over is the Champions League, uh, and so so they refocus. You know, they kind of get themselves together and say, you know, again, what you know, we'll show the world now who we are. You know, and we make it maybe not in the most fashionable way, maybe not in the most spectacular way with winning three, four nil, but we're gonna get through there. You know, and this was a was a tough fight with Arsenal in both in both legs, uh, but they got the job done. And now, now anything is possible. Now you're in the semi-finals, and uh, yeah, now you go eye to eye, and and uh, you kind of play it out. But uh, I think Thomas Tuchel, the experience that he's getting right now with that team, with the club, uh, is is priceless. You know, he will he will take that with him, even if he moves on and takes over another big club, maybe in Europe. Uh, but uh, the experience that he made is, is uh, fantastic. Do you know when I'm wrong, I'm quite happy to admit it. Oh, OK. Here and I go. always find this interesting on these sort of nice Champions League... Well, our man said he hadn't... Shut up, shut up, right, yeah, man said he hadn't the same effect, yes or no? In Champions League games like this, like, I, people... It, people it, <laughs> I, I know. Can <laughs> we just have a conversation? <laughs> like, <laughs> Robbo, what surprises me <laughs> is that people talk about experience within this competition. Mm. And I think, come on, you know, you look at the players that Arsenal have within that squad, within that starting eleven. They should have had garnered enough experience just playing the game professionally to be able to step up to this level. Yet we saw against Porto, and goodness me, we've seen against Bayern, that once again that lack of experience seemed to show. Uh, I always think about this Arsenal side. They're a very good team and they've got a bit of experience. They've got some younger players as well that are coming through and doing brilliantly. And wet, But I find they're too emotional at times. When things are going their way, they think they can beat anybody and they play at high tempo and they do everything. They fight for each other. They, I would think, over-celebrate victories and over-celebrate when they get a draw against Man City away from home and, and Pep Guardiola has to tell them to keep quiet. You haven't won anything yet. And that what, that's what happens when they start losing games or not playing well in games. They go the other way. And it, they did it before Christmas when they, when they didn't win for three games. And they've done it in this little important period here. Losing to Aston Villa, not playing quite well enough in the first game to stop mine coming back into it and not playing well enough tonight. And that's something that Arteta and Arsenal have got to look at and say, it can't all be based on emotion. You're a good team. You've got some good players. Make it more... Have a clearer head when things aren't quite going your way rather than basing it all on emotion and, and whipping up the crowd and all that sort of stuff. That's where Arsenal, I think, are still lacking at the moment. And I still think that comes down to the manager a bit. This is the starting eleven you would have wanted. Craig, Kai Havertz back in that false nine. Jorginho well, coming in. I wasn't in. desperate for Kai Havertz to be in the false nine. I was desperate for him not to be in the midfield. Uh, well, Jorginho then came into the midfield to see Rice go up. Yeah. But, but that, it was nothing from Arsenal today. It was so flat. Yeah. Uh, I think team selection, you couldn't, you couldn't really question too much. I mean, left back has been a, an area that has fluctuated between a couple of players. It was Tommy Asu uh, tonight. But, you know, they had the extra midfielder in there, as you said. Havertz was back in a position where he feels more comfortable and he's actually played pretty well recently. Uh, 
Some big players that, that are coming on are off form, like Gabriel Jesus, he's not doing no. anything. But even though he's on the pitch, what's Saka done? Saka had a quiet one. Look, Arsenal were poor. Arsenal, Arsenal can still win the Premier League. It might happen, it might not. If they win the Premier League, it'll be a great season. But this could also be another season where, like last year, uh, certainly they didn't win the FA. No, they didn't. They could be empty-handed. Uh, does that mean there's a lack of progression at, at club? No, I don't think it does because they've played some great stuff. Mm. But get, but I think it's just proven, certainly at the moment, that getting over the line is difficult because there's some big skittles you have to skittle out of the way. City have found that out again tonight. It's not the first time City have found that out, but they've found it out again tonight. That skittling Real Madrid out of the equation was OK last year, but it was a tough nut to crack this year. And I think Arsenal at the moment are, are finding that now. Do they find their feet again and and kick on for the remainder of the Premier League yeah. and hope City drop something. That that could happen. But if we're isolating it to the Champions League, the two games against Porto and the two games uh, against Bayern Munich, they've been found wanting at this level. And what's disappointing is that following the Aston Villa result in the press conference, Mikel Arteta is sort of punching the table and putting his hand on the table and said, this is the moment, this is when we're... It, it's all fine and well when we're winning, but now when things get tough, this is when we need to see who we really are. And this was the next game. Mm. This was the next performance. And this what is what Arsenal produced. That is damning evidence. It's damning evidence for the managers, damning evidence for the players that they were very flat. And it's a team, alluding to what Robo was saying, it's a team that really depends on their emotion and their energy and the intensity and pressing higher up the field. When they take a step back, when they become passive, they become a lesser team because they don't quite have that intensity and energy and that sort of enthusiasm to play the game. If, if indeed it is because of structure, if indeed it is because the manager is telling you to stay, take a step back, it's a mistake. But regardless, Arsenal, in taking a step back, they did the same thing in the second half against Aston Villa. They did it today from the very beginning of the game against Bayern Munich. It's not in their makeup as a group to be successful doing that. So. If indeed you're best, when you take a step forward, then do that and whatever, you live with the results at that point. But don't take a step back and take a different personality in a game that truly matters, in the game that defines your season in Champions League. Don't, don't be what you haven't been up until this point, try to be a different team. You're best when you're taking the pressure higher of the field, they didn't do it, they took a step back, they got passive, they're out. Normally when you lose to Bayern Munich, if that's what happens, it's not too difficult to sell it. Mm -hmm. you know, well, look, look, as Jürgen said, this team has dominated for 11 years. All these world-class players. Uh, that's slightly easier to sell, although it's a difficult pill to swallow as a player. It's an easier sell as a manager. We say, right, OK, we're just not quite ready. We come up against a side that are flying. They're the best team in Germany. We're out. We need to learn from that. That's not the case at the moment. Mm. You know, yes, they upped their game, but they've got problems. They've had problems all over the field. They were missing some key players. They had suspensions. And they had two centre halves in and Delecht and, and Eric Dyer. Yeah. Derek Dyer, who was what, fifth choice, give or take at Tottenham. Two centre halves that the manager didn't fancy. And the only reason they're playing is because of Pomecano and Kim, he just doesn't fancy them either. <laughs> so he has, it's, it's the lesser of two evils. And that's, I think, a bit of a difficult sell for Mikel Arteta when you see this sort of patched up Bayern Munich side that have been walloped in the Bundesliga, giving you, I wouldn't quite say a lesson. But being the better side over over two games comfortably, uh, and it's by far, by far the strongest Bayern Munich side. That I think for Mikel Arteta is going to be a hard one to get to sleep with tonight. Uh, Jurgen, were you surprised how flat Arsenal were in this second leg? Well, you also are only as good as your opponent is, and, and Bayern Munich definitely stepped it up compared to their performances, obviously, in the Bundesliga. Um, and it shows now, Arteta, it shows now where his team is at, you know, in mm. its development uh, overall. You know, it's a talented team, and obviously they're still fighting for the title in the, in the Premier League. Uh, but those are the moments where you, well, this real face is coming out, you know, a quarterfinal or a semifinal of a Champions League. Then you know exactly where you stand with your guys. And so it will be very interesting now to see how they finish off the Premier League season. It will be obviously a title race with Liverpool and Man City, but this is, this is, these are the moments now where you learn a lot as a manager, because now you see every single player, you know, how they, how they perform obviously in the games, but also how they show off themselves, you know, 
off the field and on the field in the training sessions. So these are very, very crucial times now for Arsenal to kind of understand, you know, in which direction they're going. I mean, overall, it's, a, I think, a successful season because they're still running for the title in the Premier League. They made their last last eight in the Champions League. It's not a, it's not a bad thing, but sure, as a manager and as a club, you always want more. And uh, when you're already in the final eight of a Champions League, then you want to figure out somehow how to get into the final. Do you know when I'm wrong? I'm quite happy to admit it. Oh, okay. Here and I go. always find this interesting on these sort of nice Champions League. Well, Man City, hadn't it? Shut up, shut up, right, yeah, Man City, hadn't the same film, yes or no? In Champions League games like this, like, I, people... people <laughs> I, I know. Can we just have a conversation? Like, uh... Robbo, what surprises me <laughs> is that people talk about experience within this competition. Mm. And I think, come on, you know, you look at the players that Arsenal have within that squad, within that starting eleven. They should have had garnered enough experience just playing the game professionally to be able to step up to this level. Yet we saw against Porto, and goodness me, we've seen against Bayern, that once again that lack of experience seemed to show. Uh, I always think about this Arsenal side. They're a very good team and they've got a bit of experience. They've got some younger players as well that are coming through and doing uh, brilliantly. And wet, But I find they're too emotional at times. When things are going their way, they think they can beat anybody and they play at a high tempo and they do everything. They fight for each other. They, I would think, over-celebrate victories and over-celebrate when they get a draw against Man City away from home and, and Pep Guardiola has to tell them to keep quiet. You haven't won anything yet. And that what, that's what happens when they start losing games or not playing well in games. They go the other way. And it, they did it before Christmas when they, when they didn't win for three games. And they've done it in this little important period here. Losing to Aston Villa, not playing quite well enough in the first game to stop mine coming back into it and not playing well enough tonight. And that's something that Arteta and Arsenal have got to look at and say, it can't all be based on emotion. You're a good team. You've got some good players. Make it more... Have a clearer head when things aren't quite going your way, rather than basing it all on emotion and, and whipping up the crowd and all that sort of stuff. That's where Arsenal, I think, are still lacking at the moment. And I still think that comes down to the manager a bit. This is the starting 11 you'd have wanted Craig Kai Havertz back in that false nine, Jorginho well, coming in. I wasn't in. desperate for Kai Havertz to be in the false nine, I was desperate for him not to be in the midfield. Uh, well, Jorginho then came into the midfield to see Rice go up, yeah. but, but that, it was nothing from Arsenal today, it was so flat. Yeah, uh, I think team selection, you couldn't, you couldn't really question too much, I mean left back's been a, an area that has fluctuated between a couple of players, which Tommy Asso uh, tonight, but you know, they had the extra midfielder in there as you said. Havertz was back in a position where he feels more comfortable and he's actually played pretty well recently. Uh, some big players that, that are coming on are off form, like Gabriel Jesus, he's not doing no. anything. But even though he's on the pitch, what's Saka done? Saka had a quite one. Look, Arsenal were poor. Arsenal, Arsenal can still win the Premier League. It might happen, it might not. If they win the Premier League, it'll be a great season. But this could also be another season where, like last year, uh, certainly they didn't win the effort. No, they didn't. They could be empty-handed. Uh, does that mean there's a lack of progression at, at club? No, I don't think it does because they've played some great stuff. Mm. But get, but I think it's just proven, certainly at the moment, that getting over the line is difficult because there's some big skittles you have to skittle out of the way. City have found that out again tonight. It's not the first time City have found that out, but they've found it out again tonight. That skittling Real Madrid out of the equation was OK last year, but it was a tough nut to crack this year. And I think Arsenal at the moment are, are finding that now. Do they find their feet again and, and kick on for the remainder of the Premier League yeah. and hope City drop something? That, that could happen. But if we're isolating it to the Champions League, the two games against Porto and the two games uh, against Bayern Munich, they've been found wanting at this level. And what's disappointing is that following the Aston Villa result in the press conference, Mikel Arteta is sort of punching the table and putting his hand on the table and said, this is the moment, this is when we're... It, it's all fine and well when we're winning, but now when things get tough, this is when we need to see who we really are. And this was the next game. Mm. This was the next performance. And this is what, is what Arsenal produced. That is damning evidence. It's damning evidence for the managers, damning evidence for the players that 
they were very flat and it's a team, alluding to what Robo was saying, it's a team that really depends on their emotion and their energy and the intensity and pressing higher up the field. When they take a step back, when they become passive, they become a lesser team because they don't quite have that intensity and energy and that sort of enthusiasm to play the game. If, if indeed it is because of structure, if indeed it is because the manager is telling you to stay, take a step back, it's a mistake. But regardless, Arsenal, in taking a step back, they did the same thing in the second half against Aston Villa. They did it today from the very beginning of the game against Bayern Munich. It's not in their makeup as a group to be successful doing that. So if indeed you're best when you take a step forward, then do that and whatever, you live with the results at that point. But don't take a step back and take a different personality in a game that truly matters, in the game that defines your season in Champions League. Don't, don't be what you haven't been up until this point. Try to be a different team. You're best when you're taking the pressure higher of the field. They didn't do it. They took a step back. They got passive. They're out. Normally, when you lose to Bayern Munich, if that's what happens, it's not too difficult to sell it. Mm -hmm. you know, well, look, look, as Jürgen said, this team has dominated for 11 years. All these world-class players. Uh, that's slightly easier to sell, although it's a difficult pill to swallow as a player. It's an easier sell as a manager. I mean, you say, right, okay, we're just not quite ready. We come up against a side that are flying. They're the best team in Germany. We're out. We need to learn from that. That's not the case at the moment. Mm. You know, yes, they upped their game, but they've got problems. They've had problems all over the field. They were missing some key players. They had suspensions. And they had two centre-halves in and Delecht and, and Eric Dyer. Yeah. Eric Dyer, who was, what, fifth choice, give or take at Tottenham. Two centre-halves that the manager didn't fancy. And the only reason they're playing is because of Pomecano and Kim, he just doesn't fancy them either. <laughs> so he has, it's, it's the lesser of two evils. And that's, I think, a bit of a difficult sell for Mikel Arteta when you see this sort of patched-up Bayern Munich side that have been walloped in the Bundesliga, giving you, I wouldn't quite say a lesson, but being the better side over, over two games comfortably, uh, and it's by far, by far, the strongest Bayern Munich side. That, I think, for Mikel Arteta, is going to be a hard one to get to sleep with tonight. Uh, Jürgen, were you surprised how flat Arsenal were in this second leg? Well, you're also only as good as your opponent is, and, and Bayern Munich definitely stepped it up compared to their performances, obviously, in the Bundesliga. Um, and it shows now, Arteta, it shows now where his team is at, you know, in its development uh, overall. You know, it's a talented team, and obviously they're still fighting for the title in the, in the Premier League. Uh, but those are the moments where you, well, this real face is coming out, you know, a quarterfinal or a semi-final of a Champions League, and you know exactly where you stand with your guys. And so it will be very interesting now to see how they finish off the Premier League season. It will be obviously a title race with Liverpool and Man City, but this is, this is, these are the moments now where you learn a lot as a manager, because now you see every single player, you know, how they, how they perform obviously in the games, but also how they show off themselves, you know, off the field and on the field in the training sessions. So these are very, very crucial times now for Arsenal to kind of understand, you know, in which direction they're going. I mean, overall, it's, a, I think, a successful season because they're still running for the title in the Premier League. They made their last last eight in the Champions League. It's not a, it's not a bad thing, but sure, as a manager and as a club, you always want more. And uh, when you're already in the final eight of a Champions League, then you want to figure out somehow how to get into the final. One one on the night, four four on aggregate. They advance four three on penalties. So many things to discuss with this game as we welcome in uh, Stuart Robson and also a very smug Jurgen Klinsmann who've got every prediction right. Yeah, right, super. We, we're looking ahead as to who is going to qualify uh, for the <laughs> semi-finals. People have forgot about that. You don't have to bring it. Back. Oh, it's all right. That's okay. Where do we start? Well, tell me. Where do you want to start? Well, this is one for the, all those people who know nothing else other than to read stats. And, and, you know, they go on social media and they, they're all over the place telling you how he's done this and they've done that and XG and this, because it boils down to, at the end of the day, putting the ball in the back of the net and defending well. And Real Madrid in the end did both and we can look at City and say, well, they didn't do enough. But I mean, in terms of a contest, it wasn't, the first game was a really good contest. Yes. Red 3-3, entertaining, end to end, 
counter-attack most of the time, I suppose, from Real Madrid. This really wasn't much of a contest. It was so one-sided. But we've seen Real Madrid do this so many times, and we wondered, well, last year they were going to do it again. Well, they didn't. They fell flat in the face. In fact, they got a big, they got a big dose of pie in their face last year. They got hammered, but they didn't. They learned their lessons. City did not. Uh, they lost, I'm, I'm thinking, at least one, maybe two bad goals in Madrid. They lost another bad goal early on here, mm -hmm. and ultimately, and we've talked about it all year, all season, they'll get away with it in the Premier League, it looks like. They haven't got away with it in this competition. They've not been as good defensively as last year. Maybe some would say they haven't been as good in the final third as well going forward. But they certainly haven't been as good defensively in this competition or the Premier League, and they've paid the penalty for that. Uh, we saw in those highlights, didn't we, Ali? You look at the amount of ball that Manchester City had, didn't necessarily convert into many clear-cut chances. Was that down to Real Madrid parking the bus or down to a lack of creativity from Manchester well, City? You can give credit to Real Madrid, but they didn't have any other option. They didn't have any other choice. It's not like when they won the ball, now they were going on the counter or they were completing passes. No, Real Madrid was pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And so the only option that they had was hang on and hang on as best as they possibly could. So then the onus and the responsibility is on Manchester City. Now, I have a few questions okay. structurally for Manchester City. And while Manuel Akanji can do a job offensively, I suppose, and he can add himself into the midfield and create a numbers mismatch, I don't know that if I'm Manchester City, a Manchester City fan or a Manchester City player for that matter, I want Manuel Akanji being the one who's a decision maker top of the 18-yard box or inside the 18-yard box. As good a job as he may do, he's not a better option than Foden or Kevin De Bruyne or some of these other sort of more skilled players in the attack. And yet, so many times, maybe it's by design by Real Madrid, but certainly it didn't seem to be the case. Manuel Akanji is the one that is trying to play make top of the 18-yard box. Where are the other guys? The other thing that I would ask, if you have Doku coming on the field, right? And you have proven that it's a 1v1 mismatch against Carvajal. Why are there players of Manchester City actually crowding the left-hand side and making runs in behind Carvajal? No, 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 no. Clear out. Clear out. You have a mismatch. Take advantage of it. And the speed of Doku was always going to create problems. I don't understand why Manchester City just kind of, they dwell on this passing, passing game sideways and back and sideways and back and it comes around the bus and around to the other side. You never use Erling Haaland and the times that you try to use Erling Haaland, he was not strong enough to hold it with his back to goal. In the end, it becomes predictable and easier to defend. Uh, Robbo, is it fair to, analysis, uh, to analyze this game in a, in a critique of Manchester City given the amount of ball that they had against a side like Real Madrid? Absolutely, yes. Real Madrid defended their penalty box really well, but there was times when Manchester City, and you know, they, they got a couple of crosses in in the first half, and the only things that Haaland did right, he won two balls in the air. One that hit the crossbar, and there was another one that he didn't quite get back into the danger area. But apart from that, they, part, they tried to pass their way through. Yes, they got De Bruyne in a couple of times down the right-hand side in that inside right position. Unfortunately, it was also a Kanji that got into the inside left position a couple of times as well. But at times, they have to change their game. Real Madrid was set up to, to stop them passing through them. And Manchester City kept on trying to pass through them, all going wide again and then coming back in again. They then put Bernardo Silva out to the right-hand side. And I don't think he ever went past anybody. He kept on playing it back to Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne played it square to Roger. It went over the other side. At some point, you have to throw the ball into the box, and bend balls in, whip balls in, and just make defenders defend. Manchester City didn't do that enough. You saw the stats, 67% possession and 33 shots. You have to score more than that when you have that sort of possession. How do you approach it, Jürgen, if you're Manchester City and you come up against this bank of four and four? How do you try and break this down? And isn't Pep Guardiola experienced enough to try or certainly explore a plan B? Uh, but as I kind of gave a good example, you know, with Doku coming in, he needs space to get in there, he needs space to, to get behind his men and, uh, and not overcrowd in that area. This is just certainly one. One aspect that you can discuss afterwards, then you obviously you had the, um, the post being hit by, by Haaland, you had the big chance from De Bruyne. You rely on your big big players in a game like that, that they make from very little, that they, they make more. Uh, that was not the case, but I mean, if you look at the stats, uh, like what was said rightfully, you know, you had 70, almost 70% 70 and, and you pass the ball around, around, around. You need to kind of come out with a little bit more, with a little bit more, 
de determined kind of uh, results. I mean, more, uh, 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 yeah, in a certain way, I had the feeling sometimes that there, there was not the urgency that you need to have at the end, especially the last maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Mm. Uh, you got to give it a go. You got to get the crowd behind you. The crowd was certainly they are behind them, but but there's another level of of uh, support. You know, when you make it look desperate, when you make it look really urgent, and you. You, you kind of really try to force, to force a goal. And that was, somehow you had the feeling, okay, then we go into extra time, we go, maybe we get a chance or two in extra time, and we decided then in extra time. And that haunts you, and for sure De Bruyne will sit now in the, in the dressing room and he will not be happy because that was a huge chance that he had, even if I think he had an overall uh, good game. And those are the moments that you regret afterwards, and, and uh, Real Madrid had a clear plan. Carlo Ancelotti, obviously, he knew what happened last year. You know, he said, it's not going to happen a second time. I'm, I'm Italian. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going uh, an open uh, eye to eye um, kind of uh, a contest here. Um, so they played defensively very disciplined, very strong, uh, and, uh, and always were, were waiting for their counter break chances, um, which they then utilized in the, in the first half right away. Um, and then it gets down to a nail biter. It gets down to um, to a penalty shootout that uh, both both coaches prepare their teams um, for the penalty shootout. They have their list, they have their players that uh, are supposed to uh, be the top guys to get you through then, even if it's uh, so late in a game and, uh, uh, and Real Madrid is now is now through it. I think, you know, this, in a certain way they deserved it, even if obviously Man City had a uh, majority of the game. It's unbelievable the amount of times they've been able to do it. Real Madrid obviously not last year, but I think we have to address one of the big talking points is that how many big teams would have taken off arguably the hottest striker on the planet? Yeah, now this is this is at the end of the 90 minutes. And I don't mean the hottest as in form right now. Yep. But I mean, if there was an auction out there tomorrow, it would be Mbappe and it would be Erling Haaland, wouldn't it? Maybe with a couple of other uh, talented players thrown in. But here we have a whether he's having his best game or not his best game. When you bring Doko on, you're looking at pace. And I get it, want to bring Alvarez on. I get that, because he's been excellent. But maybe you could bring him on for a Bernardo Silva and you got another attacking option. Because as the, more t as, as the game wears on and the fatigue kicks in, and the, the constant defending that Real Madrid were having to do, and we saw how tired those guys were, uh, they would have, I, I think, this, uh, as City got more balls into the box, or they should have done. And one of the things that, not that they're ever a team that puts lots of balls into the box, they're not. And that is one sort of criticism I would have at times, uh, particularly if I was a striker, it, it, even in the Premier League, I would like to see more crosses go in. And I think Ellen Haaland would say the same thing. Uh, but it really took that opportunity to do it away. Mm -hmm. You know, with the big yeah. dog award, There was no other option. It had to go in, it go, had to go in hard and low. Now, they got a goal from it, to be fair, but it always had to go in hard and low, across the face. It could never be stood up as an extra time because there's nobody to go and win it. And you have to feel, I think, that as they got more tired and Rudiger was defending and Nacho was just defending and defending and Carvajal couldn't move, had to be taken off, that taking off the talisman of the number nine in the game in the Champions League quarter-final when you need a goal to stop it going to penalties was a huge call. Or was it, was it an indictment on his form in these last two games? Well, it's an indictment on his form and it's also maybe an indictment on his manager. Even though he said something different in press, conference, re press conferences recently, his lack of confidence. Because if he had confidence yeah. that he's talked about, He's been, to the, he's been in the media and he's rubbished any pundit who suggested that Ellen Hallam was having a bad time, right, or a, or a slightly poorer time. But yet here he is in his moment of truth and he's taken him off, right? And that's a big call. Now, if, it, if they win and De Bruyne scores, and, and don't forget, he's taken a, he's, he's taken a penalty as well, mm. Hallam. Absolutely, he's taken a penalty. So that was huge. That was huge from Guardiola and I think on this time, he's got it wrong. And a and, and couple of things about that. You have the focal point in the attack in Erling Haaland. And so as the defenders indeed are getting tired, they still keep an eye. If they're going to keep an eye on one player, mm. it's going to be Erling Haaland. So if you have an additional presence in the box, in the case of Julian Alvarez coming in potentially for Bernardo Silva, now as everybody gets dragged to Erling Haaland, he may not even have to be the guy who scores it. But now Julian Alvarez finds himself in a position in which he gets an opportunity. 
when you keep the focal point in the attack in, it still keeps the attention of the defenders. But now that you don't have that presence there, now you're kind of like, all right, well, we don't have that threat. The other thing I would say about Erling Haaland, Obviously, as a striker, I would want to be out on the field. And, and, and as a fellow striker, and Jurgen would attest to this, the last thing you want to do is being taken off when the game is still mm. on the line. But you also have to perform at a level that rewards or that indeed demands you stay on the field. And there were many times, and I mean many times, where the ball gets played into Erling Haaland and Nacho, who on the list of defenders for Real Madrid, is actually behind Chuameni, who's not even a defender. But we have seen Carlo Ancelotti use Chouameni because he doesn't quite trust Nacho per se to play in a, in a moment like this. He had to because Chouameni was suspended. And it was Nacho that is bodying up Erling Haaland. I'm like, hold on a second. Isn't Erling Haaland supposed to be the strong, big presence guy, the physical guy? Why is he getting thrown around by Nacho? Why is he getting thrown around by other defenders? Hold the ball, you can lay it off to the Bruyne and he can find the next pass. Or lay it off to Rodrigo, now he can find the next pass. If you don't f have that hold up play, then you cannot spin out and go into space. We want our Erling Haaland to get out into space. Well, he's got to do the dirty part first and that's hold the ball up. He doesn't do that, he cuts out his own opportunities. Do you agree, Robbo? Absolutely. I was watching him very, very closely. And four out of the first five times he touched the ball, and as, just as Ali said, the ball was rolled into him up against Nacho. He, t he fell over once. He gave the ball away the second time. Nacho went and nicked it off him twice, and he, did, he laid one ball off out the, out the first five or six times. He, his performance wasn't good enough. And then he loses confidence. And I was looking at his movement when they could have rolled the balls into his feet. I know they don't look at it very often, but there was times when Rodri was looking at it and Haaland was making a run across the pitch. He wasn't sort of saying, I'm going to back into the centre, roll it into me around the box, and now I'm going to get myself turned. Because the top strikers love the ball rolled into them in and around the box so they can get themselves turned and get shots away. At the moment, he has to have a goal made for him. He's not going to create any goals by himself by individual brilliant play. Brilliant play. That's not what he's doing at the moment. He's lost his confidence. He seems to have lost his technical ability with his back to goal. It's a problem, I think, for Man City. But how many, you're not going to get a goal made for you if you're sitting on the bench, are you? <laughs> right. That's a fair point. But, but how, how, many, how many strikers do we know, and I've seen over the years, that have done absolutely nothing in a game but, but toe poke the ball in the back of the net yeah. and take the headlines? Mm -hmm. Oh, We've seen them. I've you could take it all the way back to Klinsmann. I've played them, I've done nothing. <laughs> that German guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm being serious now. We can argue, we can debate, he should have come off, he shouldn't have come off. He's playing well, he's not playing well, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, there are so many front men out there, and I've, I'll give you an example. One I, I, I played with, Ali McCoyst. Right? A lot of times, McCoyst, you, you couldn't see him if he sent a search party out for him. Right? And then all of a sudden, he'd pop up like he did, instinctive, a finisher in the box, and he's taking the headlines the next day. The manager took that out of the equation, and that's what he is. He's not the most subtle of footballers, mm. Erling Haaland, but he's a finisher. But he's going through a bad time, I'll give you that, or a bad time by his standards. But, but he took away the potential for him to have a moment and take the headlines. You don't always need your front men to be the best player on the team. You just need them when you put a good ball in the box to be in the right place at the right time. And I thought it was telling that he took him off. What do you think, Jürgen? Yeah, you can look at it from both both sides. Obviously, you know, you give Alvarez the, the chance to be the difference maker in that moment, which he can any time. I mean, he's a very, very good striker as well. And for Erlen, it, even if it's not his, his best game, Certainly, he can still decide the game. He just needs one one ball. You know, he just needs one opportunity, and he's back. You know, and his confidence is suddenly back. And this is how, how the life of uh, strikers are. The life life of the striker is just to to wait for the next ball and uh, turn things around. And for sure, he will be he will be frustrated. He will be disappointed with the, the outcome of the game, with the, also with his own performance probably. But still, I mean, he hit the he hit the crossbar with his header. If that goes in, you know, we all saw that ball already in. He's is is the match winner then at the end of the day. But those are things that um, a manager and Pep Guardiola has done that so many times and will do it hopefully for many many years to go. Still, you know, they they feel certain things. They they see they see it during the week. They talk to the players. Uh, they know exactly where where the players are, and then uh, based on those 
uh, observations that they have during training sessions, outside of training sessions, you know, when you move around with the team and you travel and all that stuff, then they, they, they make their decisions based on what they've experienced the whole week. And that's why he made that decision to, to bring in Alvarez and uh, um, instead of a, of a midfielder, you know, take, take the, uh, Erling Haaland out. Um, and he also will think about it now and he always will, you know, question, should I have done that or done this? Uh, but the game is over and the game is over and uh, Real Madrid uh, is through and uh, with a very defensive display and uh, with a lot of uh, things that they learned last year with the defeat there. Um, and you got to give them a huge compliment. We talked about the vulnerability of Manchester City's defence going into this tie, certainly compared to last season. How poor, how poor was conceding that Rodrigo goal, Robbo? Uh, it was uh, a, a bad bit of defending because the Kanji, as we said, was stepping into midfield. Are, are we being a little harsh? It's not just unlucky, Manchester City, just one of those days, considering how much of the ball they had, how they dominated a team like Real Madrid who are going to win La Liga. Arsenal at home, same thing. Chelsea at home, Chelsea, mm -hmm. by the way. 1-1, one, one. same thing. Had the ball all day, couldn't score. Well, couldn't score a second. <laughs> Uh, so we've seen it. We've seen it before. And look, they're a great side. They're a great side. You can still argue they are the best side to watch in European football, but they just haven't got it done. They just haven't got it done. And I'm amazed. You know, I think on the other side, on the other side of it is, is Real Madrid. Here is a side that's going to win La Liga, that could well win the Champions League. And you talk about adversity. Benzema, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. gone. Down the spine of the team, you got. Cross at 34, Modric, bit part at 38. Yeah, you got Youngster, you got Bellingham, obviously, he's come in and he's been a revelation, but he's lost a little bit of uh, a step in his performance. And then you have a back four that's had, as Alice said, Nacho in there, Chuameni in there, Camavingo in there. Uh, it's had uh, three or four different left backs. It's had Carvajal playing centre half. Mm -hmm. It's had two goalkeepers that are not the best. They've, they've figured it out that Lunin's the best of the two of them, him and Kepa, and yet here we are. No other manager, in my opinion, no other manager would have been able to get Real Madrid to this position other than Carlo Ancelotti with this calm demeanor, managing the players, not panicking, just using all his experience and fighting the fires that he's had to fight. Not been brilliant, not been, no. not been aesthetically the best on the eye, but just knowing what it's all about, getting results. And to do it, having lost all those players and have the season that they potentially are going to have, it's quite amazing. And that's it. We've, seen, we've seen a lot of Real Madrid yeah. this yeah. season and they haven't been brilliant, they haven't been scintillating. They're going to win La Liga because they're the best team in Spain, but they're up against, for example, a Barcelona side who have struggled early on. Yeah, and to take it even further, Courtois, Alaba, Militao, it's, it's starters, mm -hmm. no doubt starters. Guys that were going to be your starters for the length of the season and that have been outstanding performers for Real Madrid out, and yet you continue to get results. And what you find from Real Madrid, sometimes we ask of this team's identity, personality. Well, this is what Real Madrid has in bunches, personality. And speaking of personalities, I, I cannot let this conversation go on without mentioning Antonio Rudiger. Look, first of all, the, the, the last three penalty kick takers for Real Madrid, Lucas Vazquez, Nacho, and Antonio Rudiger, when they woke up this morning, they would not have thought that they were going to be taking a penalty. They could not have imagined that they would be taking a penalty. But regardless, Lucas Vazquez steps up, go. Nacho, go. And the fifth penalty kick taker in a quarterfinal of Champions League, Antonio Rudiger. Now, the only reason I can imagine that this guy is taking a penalty is because he has the personality and the character to say, yeah, give me the ball. I don't care. Give me the ball. I'll be the guy. I'll take on the pressure. And what he has done this season is that he has taken on the responsibility to be the one reliable center back that they have. One reliable center back that they have had the whole season has been Antonio Rudiger, and he has been outstanding for Carlo Ancelotti, and he was outstanding again tonight. Fewer players. Fewer players in the modern game, and we, look, we're not talking about just talent. Fewer, fewer players wear their heart on the sleeve mm. more than Tony Rudy. Yeah, of course, and didn't play in the second leg last year. And, and sometimes, and don't forget, under I think it was under Lampard at Chelsea, he was out, out of the equation, wasn't he? He was persona non grata. But that in the modern day, if everybody want to talk about the, the, the dazzling stuff that goes on in the game and all the skill levels we see, to see somebody 
with his experience and his know-how, and a German international, he's played all over the place, uh, he's now playing for arguably the biggest club in the world, but to have that passion and that drive and wear your heart on his sleeve, as I said, is something I think a lot of people watching and playing the game could, could take something out of, rather than, you know, just looking for bits of scale and bit, and the amount of passion that he, ha that he has and heart to step up, play the way that he has, has been amazing to watch. And, and what's incredible and, and still maybe surprises people, Jürgen, is that Real Madrid are Real Madrid because of the success they've had in this Champions League competition and European Cup, obviously before that. And really, it shouldn't matter if a team won it five times in the 60s or won it back to back. under the, All these different facts shouldn't really affect what goes on today, but it clearly does. Obviously, it's a big part of confidence. You know, when you look back into your club's history and you see that, you know, whatever, you know, team was going far in the Champions League and one, I, don't mean, I don't know how many domestic titles, this kind of builds this, this belief, this, this confidence then to go always forward, you know, and Real Madrid is that phenomenon, similar to a bit Bayern Munich, as, as we talked about that many times. We obviously talk about that game with Arsenal as well later on. But um, when you step on the field um, as a player and you face Real Madrid, you're not looking at how Real Madrid played last week, maybe in Villarreal or, or on another team or in Petit Sevilla or, or wherever. Um, you, you, look, you look at what this club is all about. You, know, you, you understand that these, these players that are on the other side of the field now warming up, they've done it all. And that gives you so much... Uh, I mean, it, it intimidates you. It uh, tells you. It tells you so much more. And then when they step up in decisive moments of the Champions League, when it hits down to the to the final eight, then all these things matter. They matter a lot. You know, if you have now, if Tony Gross is now one year older or younger, it doesn't really matter. It's Tony Gross. You know? And so it's Antonio Rüdiger, who since years is yeah here and there he has a bad game and has a bad moment and has a bad experience, but overall. He's consistently playing for one of the best teams in the world. And that forms you, that gives you that confidence, and that gives you also the, the moment to understand, oh, I gotta step it up now, I'm not the perfect penalty taker maybe, but give me the ball, I walk up there and I give it a shot, and he hit it in. He, <laughs> he hit a little bit the inside of the post as well. So that's how, <laughs> how close it was at the end of the day. But that's the beauty of the story then. And, uh, he walks now out and uh, obviously totally happy and now in the semi-finals and, uh, and there comes the next game, the next game to prove yeah. it all. And then uh, we go into a summer where they have to prove it all. All these big names that we see now in the quarterfinals, they have to show up then in the European Championship or in the Copa America uh, and prove it again, week in, week out. Uh, next up for Real Madrid, it's a little matter of, oh, a classic. Oh, okay. uh, they take on Barcelona on Sunday. Meanwhile, Manchester City's hopes of a, du a double treble are dead, but they could still do the double-double, yes, uh, as they take on Chelsea. Well, there won't be a double-double because they did a treble last year. Yeah, but they could still do the domestic double-double. Well, I'm, double, I'm double. not taking one off. Uh, <laughs> uh, that'll be our first game on what is a great weekend of soccer on ESPN Plus, the City take on Chelsea. Thank you, Jürgen. Why? Thank him. Why am I thanking you? I'm not talking Bayern Munich. Oh, that's it? <laughs> no, 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 I was done. No, 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 I'm not having that. Good evening and welcome to the sports bar. With me, Jamie Hardy, I'm over there. It's Jason Gundy. Has anyone seen Arsenal? Darren Bent! Perry Groves! Gunnosaurus! Can you hear me, Gunnosaurus? Your most young one! Hell of a beating! Thierry Henry! Ray Parler! Laura Woods! George Graham! Idris Elba! Ian Wright! Arsene Wenger statue! Can you hear me, statue? Can you hear me, statue? Your most young one! Hell of a beating! The prime energy drink! Clock end! Mikel Arteta's hair dye! The Arsenal cat! Cameraman, the Arsenal <laughs> cameraman, Finsbury Park, Highbury Stadium, Saka's limp, Saka's dive. Can you hear me? You always took one hell of a meeting. Whoa, 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 Candy, don't go anywhere. We've got to roll it back because there's another on one coming your way. 1053 medium wave on DAB, online, and on your smart speaker. The Sports Bar on Talk Sport. Good evening and welcome 
to the sports bar with me, Jamie O'Hara, and him over there, Big Jason Gundy. Has anyone seen Man City? The double treble. Can you hear me double treble? You're always the one hell of a beating. The empty ad. 115 charges. The moon just the mascot. Stuart Pierce, the Andale Shopping Centre. Vincent Company statue. Oasis. Can you hear me, Oasis? You always the one hell of a beating. Sarah Collins, Piccadilly Station. The Media City. The big ass stops at the Etihad. Jill Shot, Scott's Coffee Shop. Jackie Knuckles. Pep, can you hear me? You always the one hell of a beating. <laughs> No introduction needed tonight. It's a huge night. It's your show. Get involved. We are taking your calls right until the end. No free. 717-22-33-44. Wow. All right, mate. from 10 yards out and powering ahead <laughs> for in past David Ryan. And that is that and Arsenal are out. <laughs> what a terrible, terrible week for the Gunners. Out of the Champions yeah. League at the quarter-final stage. <laughs> It is Antonio Rudiger, left out the second leg controversially last year in the semi-final to win the game and a place in the semis for Real Madrid. He steps up, right-footed, and slots it home, and Real Madrid win the quarter-final and knock out Manchester City on penalties. It's a defeat that brings down the curtain on the attempts of an historic double treble for Pep Guardiola. Jason, 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 Wowzers. Jason. Wow, well, what, a well. what a night. Oh, unbelievable. I cannot Unbe- believe it's happened. What? So glad, so glad Arsenal are out, mate. Honestly, I had enough <laughs> of them. They're just pretending to be in the Champions League, oh. honestly. There's no point being in it. No point being in it they're going to win it. Kai Havertz, stick with Chelsea, mate. He knows that lift with Chelsea. Honestly, they were poor. Jorginho. They were you know poor they were? tonight, They mate. were. They weren't at it. Weren't good enough. No, they weren't. A disappointing reaction after they, they conceded the goal. They had moments in the game, but not enough of them. Yeah. I do not remember um, them having to do too much real hard work defensively. And one goal was enough to win it. And I have to say, I thought Arsenal were pretty lame uh, overall. Yeah, yeah, they really were. The Sports Bar with Jamie O'Hara and Jason Cundy. Monday to Thursday nights from 10 on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. Talk Sport. Now, how the first leg has changed the narrative around this tie. Bayern Munich taking on Arsenal. Arsenal were the favourites going into the start of that first leg in London. However, a 2-2 draw has turned things slightly on its head. You take a look at the predictions. Concerning for Craig, he and Stevie are the only ones that believe indeed that Arsenal will get through. Everyone else has changed their minds to Bayern, with the exception of Jürgen, who I think I said Bayern, who said Bayern uh, at the start. Uh, Jürgen, how did Bayern not muck this up? Because they do have their momentum, don't they, after the first leg? They kind of have the momentum. Obviously, Arsenal play, plays a brilliant season as well and has uh, every quality out there to, yeah, to harm you, to make it really, really difficult for you. But I think, you know, in this specific moment in time right now, uh, that is Bayern finding itself, you know, with losing the German Bundesliga first time since 11 years to Bayer Leverkusen last weekend, um, they're angry. You know, they're angry and they are hungry now for the Champions League. They're, they made a fool out of themselves uh, in the German Cup, losing against the third division team. So they are, they are now ready. They are ready for, for this clash with Arsenal. They are not as underestimating Arsenal at all. They have a lot of respect for Arsenal going, coming to, to Munich. But it will be a packed house, 70,000. It will be a fantastic atmosphere there. And, uh, and I think they are, yeah, they, they're just uh, at this moment in time so motivated, so, yeah. So full of energy that they, they have to prove a point. They have to prove a point to their millions of fans in Germany and all over the world uh, that they have a very, very good team and that they don't want to waste the entire season.
You've won Arsenal. You see, you've changed your mind, I think, after what we saw in the first leg. What do you mean? I think I, when I asked you who was going to go through, I think you said it was like 51-49 Bayern. Yeah, I did go Bayern, yeah. Yes. yeah. The narrative sort of swung a little bit, but then the weekend it swung again. Right. Neuer's injured. Davis is suspended. Injuries to Coleman. Yeah. Possibly. Nabry's out. Nabry, Sani. All out or possibly out. What Tuchel said, didn't he? He said Neuer and Sani will both play tomorrow. So that addresses those, but in that kind of context, so, how long will they be able to play for? Right. So that, that, just swung, that just swung me slightly back to Arsenal, even right. though they had a terrible result against at the Bill. weekend and did not play well against uh, Bayern at home. Uh, that, that's for sure. Can Bayern do it again? Have they been great at home? No. Think what Dortmund did to them at, at the Allianz recently, only two or three weeks ago. It was embarrassing. Uh, but Arsenal will need to play a lot better. And it was the injuries to key players that's kind of swung it back around again for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not super confident in Arsenal, particularly after the weekend. But that those injuries to those pacey players, and a couple of them might play, as you said, has just depending on what Mikel Arteta does with his team selection, and I didn't particularly like his team selection against Villa at the weekend, I've just just gone for Arsenal. He, he's not going to play the same 11, <laughs> is he? Well, certainly the same positions that we saw those players play against Villa. Again, I'm not a fan of Havertz in the middle of the park. I think he's been much better uh, through the middle in big games. You can play him in the middle of the park for Arsenal when you're, you're playing Burnley and Sheffield United and, 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 and West Ham and this, but... In the big games, Rice and Odegaard have played better with a party or a Jorginho particularly in there. And Havertz has looked a better player when he's been up front, right? Where he's been using his physicality, he's been making runs, he's been linking up the play. He's not a great goal scorer, but he's up there doing things that are more natural to him. Well, they don't have an out and out striker. You know the one thing that we know for certain Bayern Munich does have? You mentioned the guys that are that are absent. We we know for certain that they have a goal scorer in Harry Kane. Yeah. We know that. We know that much. We don't know what version of Bayern Munich is going to show up. And I have zero conviction in my pick of Bayern Munich because let me tell you, I've seen you talk about inconsistent. We mentioned Borussia Dortmund being inconsistent. Bayern Munich have been just as bad in terms of the inconsistency. But to Jurgen's point, they have nothing else. This is it. This is it. So there's got to be a level of desperation for Bayern Munich in terms of, of how they approach this game and how they approach Champions League. Otherwise, it is a failure of all sorts of failure in terms of what their season has been. Uh, Luis, this is going to be fine. I'm going to get my punter pyrotechnics out again. <laughs> this is going to be a brilliant game as well, isn't it? It's going to be, again, an open game. I think the two fantastic teams, and uh, we are trying to break down who is going to be the winner or trying to find the, the, the let's go but anything can happen because both of the teams are going to be again open up and and try to hurt the the other one the only thing is that the guys are, are mentioning that for arsenal they are fighting the two big competitions the, the stress the the, the pressure uh, is, is quite big on the players uh, they, they had the defeat at the weekend trying to, to, to change your mind and, and get ready for this game, but also for the game that we can because you cannot leave uh, Premier League. There is a lot of stuff. And last year, it hurt a lot uh, Arsenal in the last part of the season. And I think right now, it's exactly the same. The, the players, they got a little bit more experience from last year, but not enough to play these kind of moments. And for Bayern Munich, they've been there so many times. They know how, to, how this is done. And this is the last chance. This is the last opportunity for them to make a good season. And I think that that, Playing at home is going to make a, a massive move for the players. Uh, Luis, thank you very much. Atleti Barcelona going out. Things can get worse. It's going to be an extra time a little bit later. Yay! Uh, Jürgen, <laughs> uh, we say, Jürgen, are you working tomorrow with us as well? Yeah, because I want to celebrate that win of Bayern Munich tomorrow with oh, you guys. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do, do you want to hear yeah. the most Super. alongside? Two days in a row. Yeah. Harry Calm Kane scoring down. against Arsenal. <laughs> do you know the most important thing, Harry though? Kane against Arsenal. <laughs> Do you know the most important thing for Arsenal uh, now? Uh, what, Craig Burley? They have to win the Champions League to get into the Club World Cup in 2025. I mean, if that doesn't drive you to victory, I don't know what will. Uh, uh, Such importance. Uh, uh, Somebody uh, hates this competition. You know the intricacies of it quite yes, well. Yes, it's yes. quite impressive. You're in it to win it. If they don't get in it, Salzburg are going to get in it. Let that sink in. I'm in it, Craig. <laughs>
Atletico Madrid as Dortmund win by four games to two as we welcome in Luis Garcia and the one man who had belief that Borussia Dortmund could do it, could turn oh. things around after that first leg defeat. We accused him of bias, of just supporting German teams, but no, Jürgen Klinsmann knows best. Uh, Jürgen, what a night in Dortmund that was. It was a special night in Dortmund. It was unbelievable to watch this game. Um, obviously, it started furious. You know, after three, four minutes, it could have been 1-1 already. Sabitz had a big chance, then, then Morata had the other one. It could have been 1-1 already after five minutes, basically. Then Dortmund really got into a rhythm and scored the first two goals, which I agree with. The goalkeeper didn't look uh, so well in both of those goals. Then uh, Atletico Madrid came back, uh, second half, Korea made a difference, Korea came on and, uh, and they equalized then. Uh, but I really, I had the feeling from the beginning on that the players uh, from Borussia Dortmund, they were ready for that fight. They were committed, they were committed to go through into the next round. You could see the body language, you, feel, you felt the energy, there was great leadership of some of the players like Emre Can, he played in front of uh, Hummels and Schlotterberg, he played a fantastic game. Sabitzer got better and better the longer the game went on. And when you look at the, the third goal, when you look at that goal from Füllkrug, um, just fantastic, the fantastic run that he makes, you know, he loses his defender, he goes in front of him then and uh, scores that header. Um, and then the stadium obviously, you know, gets out of control. 80,000 fans, they, they, they sang, that was loud, it was uh, fantastic atmosphere then they, they made another goal and uh, they go into the next round and this is this is what it is all about champions league in march april is crunch time and you as a manager as a coach you have to hope that your big players really step it up and this happened today with uh with Borussia dortmund Hummels stepped it up even if he had their own goal he was always positive he was always encouraging his teammates uh, Emre Can was the leader there from behind. They believed in it and they knew that it's going to be very, very tough against this feisty Atletico Madrid team. But uh, they made it happen and uh, yeah, I, I think they really deserve to go through into the semis now. I much pre prefer watching this version of Atletico Madrid than the old one a few years ago. <laughs> this game was crazy. Well, Dortmund, Dortmund drink a different juice in this competition to the Bundesliga, don't they? Yeah. They just, they just. I mean, I think they topped their group. Didn't they, they drink zero yeah, juice yeah. in the Bundesliga. They, they, they yeah. dropped, they dropped, of course, with Newcastle, with Milan and PSG. Yeah, they come. I mean, straight away, and that, you thought, right, they, they are superseding their domestic form in this competition. But still, again, if you'd have said semi-final of Champions League. No, I didn't. See, I could not see that. You know, they got Matson on loan from Chelsea. He was on loan at Burnley. Not wanted. Doesn't. Not deemed good enough to play uh, at, at the at Stamford Bridge. You got Sancho. You know, surplus of requirements at Man United. Mm -hmm. Potential attitude problem. Conflict with 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 Ten Hag. Feels more comfortable there. You know, and Phil Craig's goal was Ali Mens. That was an absolute. You know, you talk about a striker's goal. Early ball. You know, ball in the box. Gets across his defender. Terrific, just absolutely terrific. But do you remember we used to say nobody wants to play Atleti? <laughs> Nobody's saying that now because we, I talked about this the other day. They're not keep. I think it, it, the last time they kept a clean sheet was around February time. They're just not keeping this. This dire dull Atleti is just not keeping clean sheets. Even at the weekend against Girona, lost a goal. You know, should have lost two when they, they they should have had a penalty against and won the game. But they're just not solid at the back. And that's a problem. And, and in some sense, they were even lucky to be in this position that they're in. Because if you remember the game in the San Siro against Inter, the only reason the second leg was achievable was because Inter Milan were so wasteful in the final third. Otherwise, you know, Atleti were, would have been out. So the warning signs were there. Uh, and have been for a while, but Dortmund took advantage of it. Inter will be kicking themselves because Inter, that game should have been 3 or 4 0 easily in the San Siro. It wasn't, and they allowed Atleti back in. But I did say this for Dortmund uh, the way that the ties worked out was much, benefic much more beneficial for them. The fact that they go back to Dortmund in the second leg rather than having to go to the Metropolitana. That worked out really well for them, but they took advantage of it. Uh, Jurgen, just explain 
how you can have a team that's 23 points of Bayer Leverkusen at the top of the table in the Bundesliga that can go through a group, as Craig mentioned, that included Milan, PSG and Newcastle, can now be Atletico Madrid and can now be in the semi-finals of the Champions League. How can their form be so different within these two competitions? Yeah, it's, it's really hugely difficult, hugely difficult to keep the same form in all competitions, in a normal championship, in your cup competition, the domestic one, and obviously in the European leagues. And uh, um, this makes a huge, huge, a big team, obviously, at the end of the day. And, and uh, um, Dortmund struggled with that. The whole season is struggled with that to have uh, consistency in the Bundesliga, in the German Cup. And uh, but for whatever reason, they stayed. They stayed on a good track in the Champions League, and they, they kicked out big, big names. Um, and uh, they're capable to make miracles happen, especially at their home stadium, because it's, it's just rocking. When you when you play in that stadium, you play literally with a man more, because they, these people, they push you. When uh, uh, Korea scored the equalizer, it was quiet for about a minute, a minute and a half, and then suddenly you, you heard 80,000 people screaming for Dortmund, pushing them forward, giving them belief. And they started to run, they started to fight, and they started to believe in it again, and they turned it around. And this is, uh, yeah, it is inconsistent what happens th throughout the, the season with Borussia Dortmund. But on the other, other, on the other side, it's, it's gorgeous to see. It's really fun to watch that this is possible, that it's doable to be in the semifinal of the Champions League, even if you had a bad domestic season. What's funny, Ali, as well, is that every time they cut to Edin Terzic on the touchline, they're like, oh, he's still in the job. Yeah. Because he's like, you feel like he's been sacked four or five times already this season. <laughs> and, and he had been hanging on. And the reason he had been hanging on is because of the success in Champions League. Because the struggles for Borussia Dortmund and Bundesliga, you just mentioned in the numbers, they have been inconsistent is a nice way to put it. There's been times in which Borussia Dortmund have just been awful in Bundesliga and the defending of Nico Schlotterbeck and Mats Hummels has been awful. And when I say awful, I mean awful. And then you watch them in Champions League and you go, wait, 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 that, is that, that's the same team from the weekend? And, and it isn't. And the level of energy with which they play today is different than what we see from then in the weekends in Bundesliga. It, it is. It, it, that's just factual. It's not even opinion. You just watch them play, and they're two different versions of Borussia Dortmund. And I'll go back to the second half of the first leg and how much of a reaction there was from Borussia Dortmund away from home. They were 2-0 down. Yeah, and, and, and it felt like it was all <laughs> Atletico Madrid. But in that second half of the first leg, you saw a much better version of, of Borussia Dortmund. And I'll use a word that, that Jurgen loves. Much more proactive. Uh, attacking Atletico Madrid. Getting after Atletico Madrid. And to the point that Craig was making earlier, when you attack Atletico Madrid, you are going to score goals because this team is not nearly as well structured as they once were, not nearly as organized, and to use uh, Jurgen's uh, description, not nearly as feisty as they once were. Part of that is the fact that I just don't think they have enough intensity or energy through the midfield. The legs are not there. Watching Koke trying to defend is painful. Watching Rodrigo de Paul trying to defend while you admire the way that he throws his body around is painful once you have guys that have speed and that can run off the shoulder of Koke, that can run off the shoulder of Rodrigo de Paul. And you see Savitzer getting into the box and nobody trailing his runs. And where are the trailing midfielders? Where are the defensive midfielders for Atletico Madrid? They're not there. And then you're saying, okay, well, you know what? We have defenders that can take care of those runners. Well, no, because Witzel is not a center back. He happens to be playing in that position now because he can't get around in the midfield any longer. And so he just he's much better when he can just read the game and step into pressure. But when you run by him, he can't stay with you. And that's been happening time and time and time and time again for Atletico Madrid. Borussia Dortmund have exposed that over the course of two legs. If anything's going to send Simeone back into his defensive strategy, it's this season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's going to say, you can imagine him sitting down with the Atleti board and going, listen, everybody wanted this open football, I've given it to you and we're, you know, it's, it's not really, yeah. it's given us nothing. And I just feel that, you know, since they've got away from that, they, if you watch the Liga, they've been really exciting, I say exciting, they've been really good to watch at times. Yes. Very attacking, yep. very open, but it's, it's as poor defensively as I've seen them in a long time. Being open, Simeone's team's being open does not suit his style.
What a week you've had, eh, Luis? <laughs> Liverpool rubbish, Barcelona out, Atleti now joining that club. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure tonight to talk about Barcelona departure and now Atletico in Madrid. But uh, listen, guys, you're talking about an Atletico Madrid that is not the one that we used to watch because before they were so solid at the back, they were well organized, they never kind of give away any, any chances during the games, and now they are vulnerable. But to be honest, when I saw today once again Aspiricueta playing as a left wing back, I thought, yes, they're going to sit on the back. And when you play against a team that is so dynamic and with that energy on the wide flanks that they can play with Adeyemi and Sancho and beat this in the second half, speed players, players arrive in the second line, you're going to struggle. You cannot defend for 90 minutes against a team that has got that uh, fantastic uh, dynamism. You cannot defend during 90 minutes with the players who are moving all around the places, floating and, and changing position and arriving in different directions. That is, is not possible. When the, the first 45 minutes stopped and then Atletico de Madrid was already losing 2-0, what happened? Riquelme, Correa and Barrios. The three players who are dynamic, energy and can run. And what happened with Atletico de Madrid? Totally different. They start attacking, they start creating. Why Atletico Madrid, when they are in a moment of that they have to defend, instead of defending, going forward, instead of defending, attacking the opponent and making them problems, they decided to sit at the back and wait to see what happened. Because this is not the first time it happens. We've seen this last year and the year before and the year before. That's something that I don't understand. Why arriving to this uh, point where Atletico Madrid, we are talking that they are good going forward, but they decided to sit at the back and wait to see those transition, quick transitions. I prefer an Atletico Madrid that go forward, goes open, and see what happens. And, and, and if you're going to sit back, if indeed that's the approach that you're going to take, that's because you have the players to do so. Right. Because you got Godin playing center back, right? You have that personality. You, you, you have a team that is willing to do exactly that job. Look, we're going to break things up. We're going to break up the rhythm. We're going to defend, and we're comfortable. We live for this moment. That's not the personality of this version of Atletico Madrid, and it hasn't been for a while. This is not just today. It hasn't been for a while. Craig just made the point that defensively they've struggled throughout the course of the season. Th that goes back to even last year and the year before then. This is a team that has been stuck in between in this transition of are we really defending or are we attacking or are we open? And they're neither here nor there. And when you're in between, you get exposed. They got exposed today. as they are through to the semi-finals of the Champions League. Barcelona are out. Uh, for more on this, from a Barcelona perspective, let's welcome in Luis Garcia. Uh, but we've got to start with a man who is outside Montjuic, because goodness knows how long this shot is going to last. Jules, for the first time in a long time in the Champions League, PSG have something to smile about. That's right, Dan. Never, ever before they turn around the tie after losing the first leg. And winning in the second leg, they did it tonight. It was an incredible night, really. Of course, the red card is the turnaround. There's no doubt about that. I don't think Arojo needs to make that far, really. But, that, but after that, I mean, still the control to find a spare man every time to create those chances, to concede some chances as well. I mean, with this PhD team, it's never really straightforward, even 11 against 10. But I feel in the end, they deserve that. Just a bit of luck this time after all those remontadas, all those demons from 2017 and then 2019 and all the others. It feels like all those demons have been buried tonight. Ah, uh, look, Jules' big smug face in everybody's face. <laughs> Who've laughed at PSG. Uh, you know, uh, have, you he can't, have you noticed he can't get the shot any closer to his face? <laughs> no, I know, <laughs> most definitely. Um, Chavi's not happy. He said the referee ruined the game. That no, red no. card was never a red card. No, no, no. The, ref the referee did not ruin the game. The referee did not ruin the game. Uh, PSG come out, guns blazing, Barca were all over the place early on. Obviously, the goal, which Rafinha has been credited with because it comes off and was against the running play, as Ali mentioned. But no, this, this, this would... Look, there are people that will be saying, well, there's not enough contact. But when you're running at the pace they're running at and you get ahead of the defender, Bren, it's not your job as the forward to get out of the way. There's contact, practically changes the game. That being said, I, I get the feeling PSG were going to be the better side. Whether they would have won or not, I don't know. Uh, I've got to go to you, Luis. Red card. 
Yes, unfortunately it is a red card. Oh. Bad decision from uh, Araujo that I think that I wasn't expecting that change of pace of uh, Barcola, but uh, I have to say that yeah, it's a red card. It's a, it's a fault, the referee decided to call it, and uh, once you call it, you know that uh, you have to uh, send him off. So um, it's a pity because I, I agree with Xavi that this makes a massive change for, the, for this tie, but uh, I don't agree with the referees because I think the referee did a, a good call. In the end, PSG deserving the win? Yeah, and, and, and I must say, before the Barcelona goal, which was an individual play from Lamin Yamal, there hasn't been a whole lot of Barcelona. In fact, there hadn't been anything from Barcelona. Now, they run into a goal, and then beyond that, what you were expecting is, well, Barcelona is just going to continue to defend because they hadn't created, any, created anything offensively. But it has been the story of Barcelona, certainly in the earlier part of the season, that their defensive mistakes are the ones that, in the end, punish them and damage their chances. It damaged and killed their chances in La Liga, and it damaged and killed their chances today in Champions League. And what a chance they had. What a chance they had to go straight to the final because of the opposition and this side of the bracket. You go up one nothing, and you cannot afford to make this mistake if you're Ronald Araujo. But Ronald Araujo has been making this mistake throughout the course of the season. But the game was leaning in that direction anyways because PSG had been significantly better than Barcelona. Why? Why were they significantly better in this game than they were in the first leg, Jules? What changed? Well, I think tactically Luis Enrique this time got it right and he's probably the strongest team that he can put on the field with Barcola and, and Dembele, even Mbappé central. I thought Fabian Ruiz had a really good game. Zaire Emery, we've talked about him a lot, and Vitinha was outstanding, I thought. And defensively, Marquinhos and Lucas Hernandez, Marquinhos especially, was really strong against Lewandowski, which was not the case a week ago. I, I think that's the first thing. The second thing, and again, I think the credit goes to Luis Enrique in the sense that from Straight after the first leg, in the dressing room, we said to the players, don't worry, we will do it over there next week. We will qualify, we will make history because for the first time we will be able to turn the tie around. And I think through the whole week, it kind of transmitted the, the calmness, the confidence, the positivity when, when really you were down after losing that first leg 3-2 at the Paris de Prince. And I think he deserves a lot of credit tactically, but also mentally the way he prepared these players. It seems news of Barcelona and Xavi's resurrection is a little bit... Well, yes, bit obviously the talk about it going into a this... A little was, bit yeah. early. Joanne Laporte saying, look, we're going to have a conversation, see what's going to happen, but I think... Well, that's, but that's just him, isn't it, running his mouth again, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not saying it now. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> no, he's put the old wanted ad back well, we, 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 Actually, Luis and I uh, talked about this at the weekend, that, that, you know, Xavi's made his decision. You know, this is how it would be folly to go back, because, if they, you know... Two months into the season, results maybe are not great again, and you're, you're revisiting uh, the same scenario. So I, I don't think it was ever, as we discussed at the weekend, ever really in doubt that, that Barcelona need to go in a different direction, and he's he, he needs to do his own thing. Maybe away from Barcelona, take a break, and that'll be better for him. But but you know, from PSG, the PSG perspective, you know, if you just said, you know, we're going to talk about Dortmund and their game, but if you just said PSG and Dortmund are in the semi-finals at the start of this season, I don't think there's many of us would have sat here and went, yeah, I can see that happening. Well, certainly not a couple of months in this season. Uh, but from PSG's perspective, you can only do what you do to get there. But the real test is, is going to be ahead for them when they when they meet uh, one of the real big boys, whoever it is, isn't it? Because I mean, this. This Barcelona side has been better recently, but that was from a standard where they were losing shipping goals even at this Montjuic Stadium, left, right and centre, to some of the weaker teams in, in La Liga. And they managed to stifle that a little bit, but not, not in this case here when they come up against uh, a better side. What's interesting, Jules, when we were talking about this tie looking ahead when the draw was made, everything was about Kylian Mbappe. And despite the fact he got two goals today, this... Victory hasn't been about Mbappe, has it? No, not really, although, of course, the penalty, and I think, trust me, in the stadium, you need a lot of composure to score that penalty. And he scored many before, including in the World Cup final, but still, it was a key moment. The, his second goal is at the end, a counter-attack. But what I love the most, maybe, about the last goal is that it's him in the box, tackling the ball ahead of Fermin. I think he was on the Gundogan cross, to then start the counter-attack, and then he's at the beginning there. He was quite calm through the whole week. And the people around him were saying, don't worry, he will, he will be there, he will, he will deliver in a way. And he did, he did deliver with the two goals. Overall, apart from that, I don't think there was still enough from him. Kubasi and, and then Inigo Martinez did okay. I just think he was there just when the team needed him the most.
Uh, Luis, what disappointed you the most from Barcelona today? <clears throat> No, actually, I wasn't disappointed with Barcelona. I mean, the result is not the best one. And, uh, of course, not going to the semifinal is a big and frustrating disappointment. But uh, I think Barcelona did what they have to do. I mean, uh, Barcelona was not dominated. It was Paris Saint-Germain, the one who was dominated, but was creating chances, was waiting to try to get uh, Paris Saint-Germain out, uh, out of guard, uh, using the wide areas with Rafinha making diagonals into the middle, with uh, Lewandowski trying to provide what he provided in the first leg. Lamin Jamal made a fantastic chance, but after 31 minutes with that uh, uh, send off with that red card, everything changed. And then you play. And actually, I'm going to tell you something. I, I liked it more uh, Barcelona in the second half. They were playing with uh, 10 men. They, they were trying. They were more proactive. They were pressing a little bit higher on the field to try because they was needed that goal to, to get the equalizer. I liked it, that Barcelona mode, that the, the, the one that I, I saw in the first 45. But uh, in the end, I think it, it was a pity that we couldn't see a 11 v 11 situation the whole game. I think it was very close. I totally agree with the guy that Paris Saint-Germain was a little bit more confident on the way that they were playing. And Barcelona was waiting to, to, to be open up and, and see if uh, on a contest that they could uh, hurt uh, Paris Saint-Germain. But in the end, I think the Barcelona did uh, a, a good game after all. Can I just tell you that the red card, while it's obvious that, okay, you're playing a man down and it's Ronald Araujo that you're missing out on and you have to make a substitution. Was it right to be well, Lamin Yamal? Well, and that and that's, that's what I was about to say, that you're also losing Lamin Yamal, who, in my estimation, is their best player in the attack, their most dangerous player. And if you're going to go on the counter, I prefer having Lamin Yamal on the ball than Rafinha. I prefer ha having Robert Lewandowski. I prefer having Lamin Yamal instead of Robert Lewandowski on the counter. Now, obviously Lewandowski is not coming out because he may somehow run into a goal and it's something that you needed to have on the field. But when it comes down to it, who's your most dangerous player in a counter-attack opportunity? I still think it's Lamin Yamal. Now, it becomes an easy choice for a manager to say, well, I'm going to take the teenager out. Right. In this moment, in this stage, playing a man down, of course we're going to need the work rate of Rafinha. But how are you going to create an opportunity if indeed you need to do so? How are you going to create a chance? Who gives you the best chance to do that on the counterattack in a moment of transition? You look at Barcelona's personnel, Lamin Yamal is that guy. He's been that guy for you the whole season. So to take him off, now you're essentially renouncing to any possibility of getting out on the counter or getting out in transition. And eventually, when you needed to score a goal, you didn't have an option to go in those moment of transitions. You didn't have an option to go on the counter. You didn't have an outlet. You didn't have a player that can actually beat somebody in a 1v1 situation as he did for the goal. Look, it, it, it seems like it's revisionist history here, but I, I was saying as it was happening, I don't know that I'd take Lamin Yamal because he is my best attacking player. I think if it'd been an if, Levin, if Lewandowski <laughs> had been unavailable and had been, you know, one of the younger players playing through the middle, I think they would have been probably the scapegoat right. for the red card. But it's Lewandowski, and I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying you've got to think, as the manager is thinking, he might get me a goal. He was pretty good in the first leg. You know, he's hold up play and he's passing and all that sort of stuff. But then you're taking off a guy, you've got two wide players, one who was banging the goals in both games in Rafinha, mm -hmm. and the other one who just roasted the fullback for your opening goal for Rafinha's goal in this game. And also when you go down to 10 men, what happens when you get in the second half? You get tired, okay, and then you can make substitutes. Of course you can, but the youngsters, particularly in the wider areas, can work harder. They can work longer than they can work harder. And in hindsight, stopping the fullbacks getting forward with the two wider players and letting the centre halves have it might have been a better option for him. But again, we're talking about he's going to have to take Lewandowski off and not one of the younger players. And for any manager, that's a big decision. To try to play from the wide areas into diagonals, beating players on, on, on speed. But with Luis Enrique, he has found a different position for Dembele. If you see, he's more often into the box. In the first leg, he was uh, right there into the box to get the, the, the first goal. And in this occasion, exactly the same. And he's even been played as a second striker. That's a totally different Ousmane Dembele that we had, the one that, that we had in Barcelona. So Luis Enrique kind of gave it another opportunity in a different position, closer to the box, closer to where he is more uh, dangerous on because he, he can go to one side or the other side with the right or, or with the uh, with the right or with the left and because his ability to arrive in in those kind of positions so I think that I was impressed because of that not because of his game because again he wasn't the best game today but 
Uh, another goal and another goal against Barcelona. So yeah, not the best night for Barcelona and but he should, the history with Dembele. But he shouldn't even be scoring that goal. You watch that clip. Who's sleeping at the back post again? Cancelo, right? He's not Cancelo. even. Yeah, he's not even looking. You got you got Dembele behind you, and he's facing the ball. Defending scenarios like back posts and wide players and positioning, they're two of the worst. And I'm not bringing Alexander Arnold in for any reason because Liverpool are not playing. But they're two guys that are super talented going forward, but they're a headache at the back. And I think I talked about it in the first leg. PSG missed a trick by not targeting him. He made two mis at least two mistakes tonight. The challenge for the penalty was ridiculous. He was never going to uh, win the ball. Uh, Dembele was going away from goal. Didn't have to make it. And then it's a very, very small thing at the back post. But if he's in the right position and his head's on swivel, he probably knocks it out for a corner. He's none of those things, and they get a goal. And part of defending in this sort of moments is anticipating the potential mistake that could happen at the near post. If you're a defender and you have defensive instincts, what do you do? Say, look, I got to put myself in a position in which if that ball goes through the near post and now goes onto the far post, I can clear it. What you see from him is the slow joke initially, the lack of awareness, lack of anticipation or, or instinct to read the situation and say, you know what, if I take not one, just, just a couple of steps, just a couple of steps and put myself in a position in which I, now I can attack the ball instead of having to react once a cross has gone by. That lack of anticipation allows them better to go and score. And let me just give a shout out to Bradley Barcola as well. A, a, a guy who, look, coming into the season, he would not have been I don't think would have been in the plans of Luis Enrique. You, you think of Colomuani, you think of Mbappe, Ousmane Dembele, how are those three gonna play together? This guy came at halftime and changed the game in the first leg. Today, from the start, every time he touched the ball, he's going at defenders. And what do you want from a, from a wide player if you are a manager, if you're Luis Enrique? Yeah, you want that level of aggression, 1v1 situation, I'm taking a defenders, I'm creating problems, sometimes making the wrong decision, but at the very least, you see a guy that is gonna create problems in those 1v1 matches, and he did that today over and over again. Uh, how tired is your arm, Jules? You all right? <laughs> oh, oh! <laughs> that tire, that tire, oh, he go. I think he just, I, I, fair enough. Look, you're standing outside Barcelona, no, like no, I'm, no, 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 you bang on. No, that's <laughs> dereliction of duty. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, coming from no, you, I'm sorry. Get him back. Uh, Should he be concerned? About what? What he's just talked about. So oh, that's four. I switch off with you. <laughs> Honestly, it's the same. Oh. I just go like that. Just... Oh, all right, Pep. Pep. <laughs> uh, yeah, because the season's unravelling. Uh, the, what am I going to say? His form since he came back, which we sort of salaz that as not club, is what's Kenny attributed to the injury? and the African Cup of Nations and they're coming back injured from that and blah, blah, blah. And it's just going to take time to get back up. But he hasn't looked him old, his old self. He, he just hasn't. And it's either something sublime from Salah, yep. yes. sublimely good, just you go, wow, where'd that come from? Or you just go, oh my God, how has he scored so many goals? Yep. It's a great goals for Liverpool. There's no, there just seems to be no middle ground with this guy at the moment. He's either really on form or he's off form, and unfortunately, he's not the only one at Liverpool at this moment in time, but he's one of the key ones, yeah. and it couldn't have happened at a worse time of the season for his manager. Uh, that's the thing, is that the timing of this? Yeah, I, I mean, themselves in, in Arsenal now have got themselves in a little bit of a pickle, haven't they? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and that puts the pressure on, the fact that there's no leeway now. You know, they were top of the league, now, now they're not, and so were Arsenal, and all of a sudden, this is a good old city are up there again, so... That piles the pressure on, and you know, I think some of the flaws of this Liverpool squad this season are starting to come through. And, and I, again, that's unfortunate for for uh, Jurgen Klopp. But I, if I was going one way or the other, I'm in the camp that they'll at least this weekend pick themselves up and go again. I, I just don't think they're going to have enough to go all the way with City. What do you think is more likely than to get things together, finish like a train, or? Oh. <laughs> well, what's the second option? Oh, that's, that, that. I, 
I, I think they get themselves up. Right. And, and I do think, in the case of Mohamed Salah, what's frustrating with him in particular is that he'll go 85 minutes where he looks like less than an average player, where the ball is just bouncing out his feet, where, where he's just having turnover after turnover after turnover. And you, I believe that Stevie has learned how to kind of ignore that, knowing and expecting that at, in the end he's going to get to the game winner. Well, what's happening is that you're getting those 85 minutes in which he's having turnover after turnover after turnover, but that game winning goal is not coming. And so then all the frustration, all the built-in frustration and built-up frustration just shows up and you understand that this is a team that if it's not Mohamed Salah and you're then leaning on Darwin Nunez and with Darwin Nunez it's like, oh, please. Please keep it on target, and it doesn't quite happen. And so then you start looking for options, and seemingly you're running out of options for Liverpool. I think they pick themselves up. I think they finish strong, but certainly they win this weekend. There, I cannot see a, a scenario by which Liverpool are not able to, to win this weekend and, and at the very least put some pressure on Manchester City and let them know that they're not going away. You, you, were, going, you were going along pretty well there mm. until you said... Stevie has learned <laughs> not to shout at the TV. Well, right. we know that. Come on. Uh, That's a strange. I Uh, speaking of El Clasico, let's look ahead, shall we, to Real Madrid against Barcelona. Um, tension in the dressing room, says the front page of Sport. This is, of course, after Gundogan criticised Araujo and the manner in which he got sent off in that big Champions League tie. Araujo hit back and said, look, I live by a code of ethics and I'm not going to say anything about it, but I don't feel this is right. Gundogan responded today to what Araujo had to say. Here he is. You know, that's um, how the most successful teams uh, develop, you know, and um, improve by communicating, you know, by uh, looking into each other's eyes, you know, and um, speaking um, for the benefit, you know, of every single person. But also at the end of the day, the ultimate target is for the benefit of the club, you know, because we are all here to make the, the club better, to bring the club in the best possible situation, you know, um, and to be successful. And I think uh, from day one that I'm here, um, everyone is aligned with that. Of course, uh, there are sometimes situations you know, where, have to, where, where you have to clear things. But uh, the intention from every single person in this club is very genuine towards, um, towards the success of this um, amazing club. And uh, that is just uh, to reach our potentials you know, and um, to try to, to, to win as much as possible. Uh, Ian, back with us. What's interesting, Craig, that he had that, that this interview was almost an opportunity to say, look, I, I shouldn't have come out and said it. I should have kept it within the dressing room. He hasn't. He's doubled down on it and said, look, I want to get this team better, and by doing this, this will help. No, I, and I completely disagree. Uh, by harnessing good team spirit is if you're going to have a disagreement or a bit of a scrap or be frustrated, you do it in the dressing room. You don't harness any team spirit in any sport by coming out when teammates make a mistake, and that's what it was, it was a mistake. It wasn't the worst decision in the world. He put himself in a difficult position, Ronald Arujo, with a bad pass. He then had a very, very quick player bearing down and go, what do you do? You don't want to have five seconds to go, oh, I'll phone a friend, you got to, you got to make a decision. He tried to lean on him. He then tried to lean on him, hoping to put him off, and, you know, gives away a, a it could have been a penalty, and, and uh, he would have saved himself a sending off. Uh, but the referee decided it was a smidge outside the box and, uh, and he goes. So it's not the most egregious, poor decision I've ever seen. If he punched somebody or two-footed somebody or did something utterly stupid, then that's different. But he didn't, and for Ilkay Gundogan to come out and say, oh, this is just, the mo this is just stupid, it's cost us, is basically what he said, mm -hmm. it's cost us, I, I think is completely the wrong avenue to go around because the best teams keep it tight-knit. When everybody makes mistakes, and everybody does, people miss chances, people give balls away in the middle of the park, goalkeepers don't come for crosses, and defenders make bad decisions. And when that happens, you keep it in here. That's how you foster. Do you hear Real Madrid doing that at the moment? They foster the spirit at Real Madrid with the injuries and the players they've lost, and they've got it together, and they're in the Champions League semi, they're going to win La Liga, probably, and they've done that not by airing all their dirty linen in public, and that's what he's done. This is a veteran. This is a guy who's won everything domestically. Surely he knows better. 
He does, but I think in El Caigundo, and we have seen this from him before, because following first El Clásico this season, he was very adamant in how disappointed he was with the reaction, reaction or lack thereof inside the locker room, that he wanted to see disappointed players, and in fact what he saw, guys that didn't seem to be as affected by the result, the outcome, or the performance as they should have been. He said it back then. I imagine that he was asked specifically about the red card, and... He went with, honesty is the best policy. I'm going to tell you exactly what I believe and disregarding those codes and ethical values mm -hmm. that Ronald Araujo is referring to. My problem with this, and you just mentioned he's a veteran, right? This is a locker room that, because of the way it is made up, you have the young guys and you have the much older guys, veteran guys. If indeed you're going to go after one of the young guys, and Ronald Araujo would be kind of the leader, one of the leaders of the young guys, then you also have to go after one of the veterans. And in this game, specifically, there is a very good example of that. When Vitinha is about to shoot the ball on target, ends up being a goal, Robert Lewandowski is the one player that can step out and actually close down the space, and he slow jogs it. He slow jogs into position to where maybe you can make an argument that he's making a challenge, but he really isn't. So if indeed you're going to make a, a, a statement in which you hang out Ron Araujo out there for everybody to criticize, you also have to then be sort of uh, an equal critical player and say, uh, what about Robert Lewandowski? Mm. And that's where you have a problem. Because you can't pick and choose who is it that you're going to criticize within the team. And that's why you don't begin this process. And, and if, you're, if you're Ilkay Gundogan, what are you gaining here? In, in being as, I suppose we like it because we have something to talk about. Yeah. But as a team, what do you gain? That didn't resolve an issue on the day. And it hasn't, been, it hasn't resolved an issue during the season. The last thing I'll say about this. I think he's bringing this up because he's been seeing mistakes from Araujo, from Jules Koundé, and really all of the back line of Barcelona throughout the course of the season. And he's saying, I've had enough. I've had enough. I've been asked about it. I'm going to tell you what I think about it. And he didn't think enough in terms of what this, the impact could be in the locker room. Uh, we just, one, he, uh, well, just one second. He, uh, the, the, the problem is, is that he's frustrated. And I don't agree with the fact that that's the right way to do it because that frustration is not going to help airing that in public. But I don't think he... Re Never mind frustration. I, I, I get the feeling he doesn't respect him, and it, but it, right. he made the move. It was his choice. He wanted to go to yeah. Barcelona. Maybe he's getting a bit of sun on his back that he wasn't getting in Manchester, but he's certainly not getting the performances, and he's not playing... What's the sun got to do with anything? Well, when the football's not great, at least you're getting a bit of nice weather. <laughs> Manchester, great football. Crap rain, weather. rain, rain all the time. Fish and chips, rain. <laughs> Dull and dreary. Barcelona, a bit frustrating. Nice beach, lovely sun in your back. However, and we were talking about this earlier when we did a live class, the build up to the classical show, was did you ever hear him call out one of his Manchester City teammates in public? Mm. And I, maybe, I, I, you know, somebody can prove me wrong and bring Saham up. But if that was, you know, we talked about it, Vincent Company, a big, strong centre half and a leader. Unless Vincent Company, and I don't remember this, ever went through his Man City career without making any mistakes, he never ever called him up, did he? Mm. Never went to the press and said, well, Vincent Company's cost us this big game, Vincent Company's done this, or whoever it may be. He never did, because he respected his teammates. And here I think he doesn't respect them, in my opinion, and he's also given them a lack of respect by saying uh, this. Just before, uh, just before I go to Ian, what should Xavi do, if anything? Not a lot he can do. What do you mean? To, to address this. Do, do you Chavi's drop him? Xavi's not giving us stuff. Xavi's gone. He's, a, he's on the beach. He's on the beach. He's not already. He's not on his back. One leg on the beach and he thought he'd one leg back at Barca. <laughs> two. That's some long legs. They've got to be tight. There's got to be a siege mentality. And I think, you know, he's not going to win too many popularity cons. There's where the other players, one or two have gone on Instagram and said, without naming him, look, we win and lose as a team. And that's right. Oh, Ian's all over Instagram. Oh, Loves the gram. What if, there call, is. what if we call out bad internet? Is that not been a team player? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's... Don't give a how and criticise the internet. <laughs> um, what sort of game are we expecting on Sunday? Oh, hopefully a good one. I mean, I, I we talk about big games. I firmly believe this is the biggest club game on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one that travels the world globally. It's the biggest for me. I mean, people may argue about you know South America and different places, but. 
and there are some big games, but th th this is this is the one. It just it just feels like it's not quite hasn't quite had the anticipation this year because of Barcelona's season. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, until recently, well, it was a few weeks now, but Girona we had down as the nearest challengers, and they've taken a bit of a falter, and Barcelona have stepped up. So I, I'm I'm expecting I, I'm expecting an open game because what are Barcelona going to do? A draw is no good to them. Defeat certainly no good to them. So they've got to, in some sense, go to the Bernabeu and at least take it to this Real Madrid side. If you're going to go down in this this season, and it looks like they are, go down fighting. And maybe we'll see that from them this weekend. Uh, let's take a look then at the predictions. How does everyone think this is going to go? Um, we heard Luis Garcia actually uh, earlier on today on our classical special say that he thought oh. it was going to be... <laughs> thought it was going to be <laughs> wait, a Barcelona wait, wait. win. Craig, I thought, I thought Barcelona was <laughs> going to bring the right attitude they and are. mindset and all uh, of that. Uh, but, uh, you're going for Real Madrid victory as well? Well, yes, because uh, there's been some conversation as to what the mentality and, and the physicality of the midweek would do against Real Madrid. And I would say, well, I can make that same argument about Barcelona. And if you have both teams that are struggling physically and mentally because of what happened in the midweek, I imagine that it's best to go with a team that is, hey, yep. that is carrying positive momentum into this match. And they have a unique opportunity, Real Madrid does, in delivering what I will consider to be the death blow for Barcelona, given no chance. No chance whatsoever. It'd be a great story. Maybe you're back in the title race. No, you're not. And we're going to do it here at home. That's a powerful position to be. I think Real Madrid will thrive in that powerful position, and they beat Barcelona 2-1. to one. Don't fret. Yes, sir? You've still got one more shot, at least, before this game kicks off. Yes. To get Luis Garcia to change his mind. Never in a no. million years. Never in a million years. I think you've got a chance. No, nope. not a chance. Not a chance at all. You reckon? Uh, you reckon a draw, Ian? Yeah, I think so. Barcelona are unbeaten in 10 games in La Liga and they've not conceded, I think, in the last six games. It's kind of like Xavi's last stand, isn't it? It's Barcelona's fight really to save the season it's dead if they lose this the big plus for Real Madrid if they win this game they go 11 points clear they can rotate their squad around the semi-final with Bayern Munich so that's perfect for them but I think Barcelona you know I remember a couple of seasons ago when Real were on their way to the title and Barcelona came there and won 4-0 I think Aubameyang was kind of in a starring role that mm. day and so it you know seems longer ago doesn't it but um, yeah I don't know it's just a you never know. As I always say predictions are, are there to make fools of us. But, yeah, I could see Barcelona getting the draw. Uh, for a lot more on El Clasico, we recorded a Clasico special, along with Gemma Soleil, Luis Garcia joins us as well, along with uh, Craig and Ali. An hour long. Yeah, full hour. Full hour. <laughs> you can check it out <laughs> now. Ronis, Ian Dark uh, joins us. Ian, what's been made in England of Hurling Ireland being asked to be taken off? Well, it is a surprise, isn't it? I mean, he didn't feature that much in the game. He does look a bit fatigued, but you'd think Manchester City are used to this kind of thing at the end of a season, but it seems to be, from what Pep is saying, affecting him a little more, maybe, than the others. I mean, I think this is an interesting semi-final because Chelsea this season have drawn 4-4 in that thriller at Stamford Bridge and 1-1 at the Etihad. And they've run into a bit of form as well. And, you know, with the whole Cole Palmer um, scenario here with him going back in prime form and now joint top scorer of the Premier League and City fans wishing maybe he hadn't gone. It's beautifully set up for a game, but, you know, how well have City recovered mentally from what happened against Real Madrid in the penalty shootout. Ian, your internet is flawless today. I'm sure there'll be no problems as uh, we continue. Well, the... <laughs> keep the, keep, at least well... keeping the, uh, the uh, conversation of the fatigued. <laughs> yeah, so they, obviously this internet is fatigued. Is that where you're going? Well, certainly not fresh. <laughs> no, it's not. Speaking of fresh, how are you? Uh, That's some niggles, oh, 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 niggles. Oh, 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 oh. I've already done an hour today already. Yeah, 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 we've already done one on show. On edge. This is a fright. <laughs> You're born on edge, Burley. I'm not on edge. Uh, <clears throat> apart from the fact we were late starting. But that's just, just a small thing. Just, I'm not mentioning it. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, he didn't have to offer up 
the the has to come off. Right. He didn't have to. He could have. He could have just. And I suppose in some sense that is kind of maybe he was looking for a bit of an out. I don't know why he would say it because he could have said after the game, which he did straight away, Guardiola in the press conference, he could have said, look, both of them have got niggles, they had niggles, so yep. he decided to take them off. He offered it up, but they, they asked to come off, almost like, you know, I would prefer to have kept them on, which, you know, we don't know what the bottom, what the, the end line is here with them, how how struggling they were, and could they have continued? I don't know, I just found find the whole thing a little bit strange. He did have an illness the week before, De Bruyne. And he's yes, yeah, he didn't start the first thing. I, I don't know how much he's in it. What we do know is they're out and he never had those two at the end, but I think they will have recovered. They've had these bumps before. They've been knocked out of Champions League before by poorer teams in Real Madrid. Right. Before they won it last year. They were favourites and favourites and favourites and I think it was Leon that knocked him out and all these teams have knocked him out, so they, they'll recover from that. Uh, I don't expect much difference in a, in a dominant City performance. Uh, do you agree, Ali? Yeah, and I think... I'm not sure that Manchester City looks at it from this sort of perspective, but it is important for them to learn from the failings of Liverpool, that they carry a poor performance in Europa League onto a poor performance in the league. Mm -hmm. The, the worst thing that you want to do if you're Manchester City is carry negative momentum into now what it's remaining your remaining cup competition in FA Cup. And it's a semi-final FA Cup. It's a big deal. It's a big moment. And by the way, mind you, they're not guaranteed to win the league. And so you start looking as to what are the possibilities of Manchester City in terms of winning something this season. Well, you're two games away from winning FA Cup. So I want to focus on this, on Chelsea. And it, I imagine, and I'm, I'm with Craig in this, and I imagine that if you're Manchester City, you're able to focus more easily on this match because of your failures in midweek. And right. it forces you to now put all your attention into this match against Chelsea. I would be more concerned about Manchester City if indeed they had advanced in Champions League and they were sort of overlooking Chelsea. I don't think that happens now because you lost. And what is the other option for Manchester City now against Chelsea? You have to refocus, get it right, get yourself mentally and physically ready to play. And if you are anywhere near your best, you should be better than Chelsea. That was a great face, wasn't it? What face? Guardiola. Yeah, it was very you. I could yeah, I mean, you I'll, and I'll, anyone else is talking. I, I have to be honest. No, no, that's how I could have come on this year. When we opened up the start yeah, of the show today. Yeah, I like that. Open mouth. He had his mouth open to me a bit as well. <laughs> and somebody was talking, which is which I'll put, I'll, I'll say that's you. Yeah. And he's just looking. Yeah. This is this is finding this is seemingly this is my week. Utterly bored. Right. With somebody talking. Okay. Right. But I'm not quite sure where we're going. In yeah, which, which direction? No, but I love his face. Did you know he just hates press conferences? Yes, clearly. Yeah. Like, I know. It, I know it can be very. Mundane. Yes. Yeah, I was having a little grin when Ali was talking because I just got this vision in my head right. with Ian's internet. Right. That we come, <laughs> we come, we come back, and uh, and we, we go back to Ian, and in the background, I don't know why I'm thinking this, but Don Hutchinson is trying to fix his internet. Oh really? Uh, Don and Stevie to get them both <laughs> around there. To, to what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Let's just get this vision. Uh, in my head. Ian, what have you made of, of Harlan's dip in form? Well, you know, the guy's hit, what is it, 90 goals or something he got here from the start of last season. As long as they're a service. And see, that's the other thing. See, we focus on, on Erling Haaland, rightfully so, because when you go through a quarterfinals of Champions League and he is nowhere to be found, and he was nowhere to be found, mm -hmm. that's the truth. Whether that's the job of Antonio Rudiger or Nacho or whoever else or whatever Real Madrid did defensively, they're wearing many signs of life from Erling Haaland. So that's going to bring a whole lot of attention. But this is a guy whose skill set does not include, I'm going to turn, I'm going to get the ball, I'm going to dribble three guys and I'm going to create a chance myself. I need service. And you don't see Manchester City often providing service. A early cross, whip the ball across, put it in and allow your big guy to go and get it. That's not part of their makeup as a team. And it's something that they could utilize to broaden their spectrum and their variety of attack. They want to pass through teams. Eventually, if you have a guy that can be dominant, that can be dominant in the air, that can be dominant attacking a ball inside the 18-yard box, put it in there. Just, so, just for a change of pace and just to give him 
a little bit of life, a little bit of, hey, hey, here you go. It's a little something, a little nugget to keep you entertained, to keep you excited to be out here so that you can continue to make your run. You don't do that as a striker, you lose interest. And in the case of Erling Haaland, he's just not often used in the place that he's most dangerous, and that's inside the 18-yard box. It's not like we finished the game and we went, well, wow, look, look at the chances he missed. Yeah. The, best two, the best chances fell to fill in this game. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to have Phil Foden and Kevin De Bruyne. Yeah. Kevin De Bruyne got himself a goal, but missed an even easier chance, really. <laughs> Midfielder coming onto it, side foot, no, no real pressure, just got to keep it down. Blew his chance. And you know, every, we've always talked about this, you know, Haaland and the form. And I've always said the biggest problem for them is they lost four goals over two games to Real Madrid. And the old will outscore the opponents. It doesn't really fly mm. in a lot of times when you're playing against these elite clubs. So uh, they can look at the mistakes they made defensively rather than any chances. I mean, Erling Ellen Haaland didn't really miss in the two games any sitters because he had the header that hit the bar, but he was... He was really shepherded well in Bernabeu, and as Ali said, they never got a lot of service to him in this game. The chances fell to other people, and, and they fluffed their lines. That's it, surely now. Yeah. Hope See, so. there was a, he walked out of a press conference. Right. Uh, I think it might have been the night of the game, uh, and somebody was banned because of shouting a question about it. I think oh. it might have been Neil Barnett. Oh, really? Him. Yeah. Somebody was banned anyway. Uh, so they're all a bit touchy about it. I think it was embarrassing, though, wasn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, it just wanted it's somebody. Unnecessary. It just wanted somebody. To, I mean, Cole Palmer obviously has been been uh, sensational, and you know, I think was it did he got a hat trick or he got four? I can't remember uh, how many he scored in the game. Yeah, he got the four. Got the four. Uh, you know, for Madueke and Nico Jackson to be to be doing that, they just wanted. A, honestly, they just wanted a heavy slap. They needed somebody to take them to the side and bang their heads together. It's embarrassing. It's all me, 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 isn't it? Yeah. Me, me, me. I want. It's, it's, this is about me rather than. You know, just letting this 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 young lad who, by the way, is carrying the lot of them pretty much. So it was embarrassing, and I think it tells you how it's a little. You know, it, there's no there needs a there needs to be a bit more leadership in there. Yes. Both from him, Pochettino, yeah, and some of the players, uh, and that's the bottom line. Somebody, you know, normally somebody on the field there. I mean, John Terry, captain for years, or Frank Lamp. Yeah. There have been others. There have been many. Even if Thiago Silva, you know, in his heyday, would have been like, hey, come on. Just absolutely stupid. And, and that guy happened to be Conor Gallagher. Yeah. Actually stepped in. And, and you assume that, okay, well, that's where the leadership is coming from. But due respect to Conor Gallagher, look, he's got his own issues as well. And I appreciate the fact that he steps in and said, no, give the, the ball. Is yeah. Ball There's not ball. too many people taking much notice of him. Correct. I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way yeah. in the Chelsea team. He knows they're not going to dominate games against these kind of teams. But you're in a conundrum. How do we approach it? And I think the way they approached those two teams, two of the, you know, of the four best teams in England, away from home, when everybody thought, ah, you're going to get a bit of a pummeling today, and they went out and they took the game to them and they harassed them, they put them off the strike. A little bit like Liverpool did to City at Anfield. Mm. We've rarely seen City as flustered as we did that day. They got away with it to an extent. Have Chelsea got enough belief to go to Wembley and, and do something similar and say, you know, this team have had a big game in midweek. They lost, they're upset, the pressure's on a little bit, you know, because they're not, they're out of the Champions League. Uh, we can go and we can really get at them. Or do Chelsea say, I'm not quite sure we can do that again. Set off and probably get beat. So I'm intrigued to see if they've got the stomach to go and try and take some of this game to Manchester City. I have no idea how they'll approach it, but that was certainly had some semblance of success for them at Villa Park and at the Etihad. Uh, let's take a look, shall we, then, at how everyone thinks this game is going to go. We asked their predictions. Uh, everybody believes that Manchester City are going to win. I mean, you're saying, Craig. Oh, that's oh, well, nice. So nice. clearly, uh, that's cute. That's clearly nice. what they did was they didn't take the pressing game. <laughs> and Clearly, everything you said has just been wiped out uh, by that's your prediction. Not, that's uh, normal. Ian, you've got it the tight right. You've got to go to extra time. Yeah, well, I'm remembering as well. Craig's talking about how well Chelsea played at Aston Villa there. Remember how well Chelsea played until extra time in the uh, Carabao Cup final against Liverpool? You know, there were chances at both ends that could have gone either way. They've done well, really, in games against the bigger clubs. I mentioned earlier the 4-4 against Manchester City at Stamford Bridge. And Chelsea, confidence up. 
at the moment, as much as it can be after this kind of weird season that they've had. I think they're going to give a very good account of themselves in this game, and I could see them running City quite close on the day. Uh, of course, we'll get a result on the day, won't we? However, news breaking uh, that next season in previous rounds, of course, you would have a replay. That isn't going to happen anymore. It'll be one-off matches. FA Cup war, the FA Cup decision to scrap FA Cup replays angers EFL clubs. We've talked about abandoning the whole competition, actually, uh, since this announcement. Ian, you, of course, followed the FA Cup, commentated on it for many a decade. What do you make of this decision? Well, it's another land grab by the Premier League, isn't it? It's a disgrace, really. It's a slap in the face in the tradition of, of the FA Cup. There have always been replays. I mean, I think the FA started to disband the FA Cup, you know, in its greatness, really. The year they let Manchester United opt out of the competition to go and play in that kind of make-believe world club club cup thing that was going on somewhere in Central or South America, I can't even remember now. That was a disgrace. Um, and they've done this really without really consulting a lot of the clubs in the, the EFL, the Football League. So I think they've got to look at this again, really, because they're close to having a bit of a revolt on their hands. What do you think, Craig? Well, I mean, there's two, a couple of ways of looking at it. I think the, the, irate, the uh, anger and irony is coming at it from the fact that as Ian said, the, the bulk of this seems to have been done between the FA and the Premier League. Right? It's everything's to suit the Premier League. Now, if you're looking at the replays, how many replays actually happen for these smaller clubs and how much money do they get out of it? I think it would be quite a small sample. Uh, but then, if you're going to do away with the replays, more, more money has then to, to be guaranteed to filter down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, as somebody, I saw somebody pointing out, if some of these clubs need the replays to keep themselves alive, then obviously they've got to look at the way they're running their ship and their business model. I'm a little bit conflicted because of the whole schedule, but what I don't like, the one thing I don't like about it is how these governing bodies, and particularly the Premier League, can sort of wield its financial muscle and, and obvious strength and dictate what's happening at all the other, uh, all the other uh, stages of the pyramid. Uh, and it's already got enough power, more than enough power. And, and so it, it's a difficult one because we, we are seeing clubs playing a lot of games, but why should that affect the lower league clubs in English football when there's not more money being, being filtered down? I think I wouldn't have so much a problem with the no replays if the Premier League were guaranteeing there was even more money filtering down to all these clubs. I would have a less of a problem as it, but we know they're not doing that. They're holding as much of the money as possible. And the argument of playing a whole lot of games loses value and loses its weight when you consider that it isn't all the teams in the Premier League that are playing a whole bunch of games because not all the teams are involved in Champions League, not all the teams are involved in Europa League or Conference League if you want to take it that far down. And so how many of these teams are actually having this, uh, this number of games that make it worthwhile or at the very least push it to the, to the point to where you have to make a decision to disband the replays. Now, I would say that in Copa del Rey, they disbanded the replays. Yeah. And, yeah. and what they did is mandated that all the games would be played at the lower tier opposition or whoever lowest ranked uh, home team or home stadium. And you, you go through 90 minutes and if nothing happens, then you, you're looking at extra time or you're looking at penalties and that's it. Game set match. And it seems to work in Copa del Rey. I don't know that there was as much as much historical pushback as there is they here in the. They won't like that, Ali. Won't like that. I would Ian, like to see that. Ian, Ian's say... thrown his internet. No, I'm <laughs> just I'm just saying what happened in Spain. I've just always, for context. Yeah, I, I like that, and I've, and I like the fact that you know if if you're a, any team, you go away to the, the to the smaller team, whether it's the, the national league or or league two or whatever, you're automatically you you're going down there. Uh, I, I do uh, I do like that idea, but it's. It's just, it's, there's no easy answer to the... To there the never point. is, Craig. There never is. <laughs>
Of course, we'll get a result on the day, won't we? However, news breaking uh, that next season in previous rounds, of course, you would have a replay. That isn't going to happen anymore. It'll be one-off matches. FA Cup war, the FA Cup decision to scrap FA Cup replays angers EFL clubs. We've talked about abandoning the whole competition, actually, uh, since this announcement. Ian, you, of course, followed the FA Cup, commentated on it for many a decade. What do you make of this decision? Well, it's another land grab by the Premier League, isn't it? It's a disgrace, really. It's a slap in the face in the tradition of, of the FA Cup. They've always been replays. I mean, I think the FA started to disband the FA Cup, you know, in its greatness, really. The year they let Manchester United opt out of the competition to go and play in that kind of make-believe world club club cup thing that was going on somewhere in Central or South America, I can't even remember now. That was a disgrace. Um, and they've done this really without really consulting a lot of the clubs in the, the EFL, the Football League. So I think they've got to look at this again, really, because they're close to having a bit of a revolt on their hands. What do you think, Craig? Well, I mean, there's two, a couple of ways of looking at it. I think the, the, irate, the uh, anger and irony is coming at it from the fact that as Ian said, the, the bulk of this seems to have been done between the FA and the Premier League. Right? It's everything's to suit the Premier League. Now, if you're looking at the replays, how many replays actually happen for these smaller clubs and how much money do they get out of it? I think it would be quite a small sample. Uh, but then, if you're going to do away with the replays, more, more money has then to, to be guaranteed to filter down. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, as somebody, I saw somebody pointing out, if some of these clubs need the replays to keep themselves alive, then obviously they've got to look at the way they're running their ship and their business model. I'm a little bit conflicted because of the whole schedule, but what I don't like, the one thing I don't like about it is how these governing bodies, and particularly the Premier League, can sort of wield its financial muscle and, and obvious strength and dictate what's happening at all the other, uh, all the other uh, stages of the pyramid. Uh, and it's already got enough power, more than enough power. And, and so it, it's a difficult one because we, we are seeing clubs playing a lot of games, but why should that affect the lower league clubs in English football when there's not more money being, being filtered down? I think I wouldn't have so much a problem with the no replays if the Premier League were guaranteeing there was even more money filtering down to all these clubs. I would have a less of a problem, is it? But we know they're not doing that. They're holding as much of the money as possible. And the argument of playing a whole lot of games loses value and loses its weight when you consider that it isn't all the teams in the Premier League that are playing a whole bunch of games because not all the teams are involved in Champions League, not all the teams are involved in Europa League or Conference League if you want to take it that far down. And so how many of these teams are actually having this, uh, this number of games that make it worthwhile or at the very least push it to the, to the point to where you have to make a decision to disband the replays. Now, I would say that in Copa del Rey, they disbanded the replays. Yeah. And, yeah. and what they did is mandated that all the games would be played at the lower tier opposition or whoever lowest ranked uh, home team or home stadium. And you, you go through the 90 minutes and if nothing happens, then you, you're looking at extra time or you're looking at penalties and that's it. Games and match. And it seems to work in Copa del Rey. I don't know that there was as much as much historical pushback as there is they here in the. They won't like that, Ali. They won't like that. I would Ian, like to see that. Ian, Ian's said, thrown his internet. No, I'm <laughs> just I'm just saying what happened in Spain. I've just always, for context. Yeah, I, I like that, and I and I like the fact that you know if if you're a, any team, you go away to the, the to the smaller team, whether it's the, the national league or, or league two or whatever, you're automatically you you're going down there. Uh, I, I do uh, I do like that idea, but it's. It's just, it's, there's no easy answer to the... To there the never point. is, Craig. There never is. <laughs>Start by showing you some of our other reporters who've been out talking about this game. Alexis Nunes has been with Andrea Nana and Tom Hamilton speaking to Hadji Ray as we look ahead to Manchester United against Coventry.
Well, the other semi-final, of course, is an all-Premier League showdown. This is Premier League versus a championship team. But we know that um, when you do play lower division teams, they, they come with everything. This is the biggest night for them. I, it's been a while since United have played Coventry. I think you were 11 years old the last time they played them. So sometimes unfamiliar rivals make it difficult. So how do you approach this semi-final with Coventry? Like a, fight, like a, like a big final, not like a final of Champions League, because at the end of the day, it can be a tricky game. Because uh, if you don't give them respect, they can, they can be they can be disrespectful. You know? So we're gonna face them like a Premier League team. You know, if they are there, that means they have a lot of quality. So we're gonna be ready for them. And for us, it's very important to win. And we are going there with the winning mentality. It's no way to lose this game against them. So we are going there very positive and with all of respect. But we must win. What about Man United? Um, obviously, a huge club. Uh, extremely famous, perhaps not having the best season by their own standards. What, what, what do you make of them as, a, as an opposition? You know, it's a semi final, it's one game. It could really go either direction. I think um, you have to take that into an account. And I think uh, yeah, they're obviously a big club with a lot of great players who've internationally club level tested and kind of been in these situations before and know how to play through them. But I think um, we'll spend our opportunities. So hopefully, we can uh, create a few good opportunities and um, hopefully um, make them feel the pressure a little bit. We always use this phrase giant killing, but Saturday, Sunday, sorry, would be a, a huge game for you guys if you if you manage to beat Man United. What makes you guys so confident that you can that you can topple them? It's one game. Anything can happen in one game. It's not like we'll have to play them ten times or whatever. Maybe it's just one game. Anything can happen in one game. Happen in one game. We just heard Andre or Nana there, Rob, saying that they're treating this like a final. They're going to have to because we're on upset watch here. How big an upset would it be if Coventry were to beat them? Yeah, it, it would be massive. I mean, you know, Coventry are a, are a championship side, a, a good championship side, but still a championship side. And United will be heavy favourites to win that game. So if, if they were to, to lose, it, it would be massive. It would be massive in terms of United's season. It would be massive in terms of Eric Ten Hag's future as, as manager. I mean, the one thing that will give Coventry some kind of hope is that they know that they are going to get chances against Man United. I mean, Man United on paper should win this game. And like Hadji Wright just said, that you know, 99 times out of 100. But you never really know what you're going to get with Man United this season. Um, you know, they played Newport County in the FA Cup early in this season, eventually won that game 4-2. But, but Newport had 17 shots and, and they finished, or they're going to finish sort of mid-table in League Two. So that shows you that even against opposition that they should be they do give up a lot of chances they're not great defensively and, and we've seen in the last round you know Coventry went to Wolves Wolves are having a great season in the Premier League went to Wolves and won 3-2 in really dramatic circumstances and, and you can understand why Andre Anana is sitting there saying that he, he's going to treat this like a Champions League final because to be honest if they don't treat it like that there's every chance that they may lose this game if they're not to advance is that the end for Eric Ten Hag Rob? I mean, yeah, possibly. Um, I mean, Ineos have been quite clear with Eric Ten Hag in that they don't want to judge him on one game. Um, you know, the season as a whole hasn't been great. You don't want to get in a position where you're judging him on one game against Coventry when anything could happen. You could have a man sent off in the first two minutes. You could get a, a Coventry could get a dodgy penalty. So Ineos have been have been careful to say that Eric Ten Hag will be judged on a on a wider sample size, but it, it certainly wouldn't look good. Wow. If Man United won the FA Cup, Eric Ten Hag could stand in front of us and say, well, you know, in a way this season has been a success because I finished it with a trophy. So if they weren't to win the FA Cup, they were to go out to Coventry in that way at Wembley on um, on Sunday, coupled with everything that's happened in the Premier League, he would be on very, very thin ice. Janish? Sure. I mean, I hear what you're saying. They don't want to judge him on one game. I mean, this has been an unbelievably terrible season. I mean, this is the worst season that I can remember. I mean, you know, we'll get to Coventry because they're not in great form, but I mean, the last four games, I mean, they haven't won in four games and you can make a case. They could have or should have lost all of those games, right? If you look at Bournemouth, if you look at Liverpool, if you, you know, the one that they lost against Chelsea, right? In one game, I mean, uh, uh, Brentford, I sort of can't remember actually now, but they probably weren't all that good anyway. Uh, so, so this is, uh, I mean, I would, if I were in charge, I'd definitely say, uh, look, I mean, if he loses to that, how can you possibly keep him? And even if he gets to the final and say loses to 
you know, Chelsea, who are very much like them in a way, right? So it's not the great Chelsea team or to the big rivals, Manchester City. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I think short of winning this competition, uh, I don't see how he keeps his job. And even then, I think you should sit down if you're the brain trust of the entire entire operation and say, really, I, I mean, is he going to be able to bounce from that? Is he going to be able to continue and develop players and, and you know, and and get, a, get us higher in the table, at least in the Premier League? next season i mean they're not making the champions league the 13 points away from the fourth spot i mean 13 points so uh i, I don't know i think this this for ten hag is a, a for these players by the way as well because i mean uh they're part of the failure that that, that has been manchester united this season in my opinion so so look i, I mean if you coventry city uh, you you honestly seeing manchester united uh, you give them the respect because you always do. It's still a massive club. It's at Wembley uh, and all of that. But I think you, you, if I was in that dressing room, having, you know, Haji Wright, 15 goals and five assists, having uh, uh, Ellis Sims uh, with 13 goals, and that's what matters. I like goal scorers. If you're going to have a chance as a championship side, you better have at least one player that can score. They have two players that, as you said, uh, Rob, can hurt them as well. So, look, Coventry's lost, what, three out of five since they've beaten uh, Wolves in that great game. So they're not in great form and they probably won't make the playoffs uh, uh, in the championship. But, man, I'd be sitting there for Coventry City and saying to myself, if there's ever a time to get back to Wembley, this is it. Don't be afraid. Hey, don't be afraid. Now, uh, meanwhile, the other semi-final is Manchester United against Chelsea, an all-Premier League affair. Ahead of it, Rob did catch up with Oscar Bob. It's obviously a little bit of a disappointment last night. You've been around the players this morning. What, what's the mood like in the camp ahead of the Chelsea game on Saturday? Uh, obviously, everyone's very disappointed, uh, especially in a game where I feel like we had the chances, we created the chances. Uh, and we're the better team, but unfortunately it didn't go our way. Uh, but I think it gives us a lot of motivation to bounce back on Saturday and get into the final. I would say it's, it's a group that haven't experience with losing. Mm. Is it a group that finds it quite easy to, to put disappointments behind them and, and bounce back when you've got such a big game so quickly afterwards? I think so. I think. Uh, there's a couple, or quite a few players that have been around for a, a long time. Yeah. Um, I was thinking earlier about the Champions League exit. I think it was two years ago yeah. against Real Madrid yeah. away uh, when they scored those two late goals. And uh, even though that happened, that was the same season as uh, uh, you know Gundo scored yeah. late against Villa. Yeah. And in a way, that was what that season was remembered for. So, I think there's still a lot of players that played in those games and still won that Premier League. And uh, uh, yeah, I think the group, if any group can do it, it, it will be this one. There, Rob. What's your feeling on what we're going to see now? A City even more dangerous given the the way that they had to exit Champions League against Real Madrid. And on top of that as well, there's been all that talk of Haaland and Kevin De Bruyne wanting to come off and Pep Guardiola making that public as well. So there just seems to be a lot going on right now there. Yeah, I mean, Oscar makes a good point there in that the, the way they went out to Real Madrid two years ago was so dramatic and then they were able then to go on and, and win the Premier League. You know, put that disappointment behind them and, and go on and finish the job in the Premier League. And I, I, I would expect them this season to go and finish the job in the Premier League. That said, I, I would be worried for them against Chelsea on Saturday, um, you know, they played 120 minutes against Real Madrid. In extra time, they looked absolutely out on their feet. Guardiola regularly calls this week the worst week of the, the season because it's always the, the second leg of the Champions League quarter-final, followed by the FA Cup semi-final at Wembley. City aren't happy at all that they were asked to play on Wednesday against Real Madrid and then have been given the Saturday semi-final. They think that they should have been given the Sunday semi-final and, and had a day's extra rest. You, know, you mentioned there about um, you know, the players who came off against Real Madrid. De Bruyne had to come off, Haaland had to come off, Akanji had to come off. Um, it means probably that, that Pep Guardiola is going to have to rotate his squad a little bit. Chelsea, meanwhile, have played on Monday, um, beaten Everson 6-0, Cole Palmer scored a hat-trick. They've had a whole week to prepare for this. Um, I would really worry for, for City, even though, that, you know, on paper again, you know, 
City should win this game because of their form in the Premier League. Chelsea haven't been great this season. But there's a lot of people at City, players included, who are looking at this game and, and thinking, you know, we could really go out here. Um, they beat Sheffield United in the FA Cup semi-final last season, but the three previous seasons, they lost at this stage. They lost semi-finals to Liverpool, to Arsenal and to Chelsea. And Guardiola puts all that down to fatigue. He said that he's, in all those games, he had to rotate players. The other team were, were able to put a full-strength team out and, and on the day, they just didn't have enough. And Chelsea, again, you know, just like Coventry in the other game, Coventry looking at the Man United game thinking we've got a great chance here. Chelsea looking at the City game on Saturday and thinking if we're ever going to beat City in, a, in an FA Cup semi-final, this is it. You know, we're, we're fresh, we're ready, we're in some kind of form. City have had a disappointment on Wednesday. They all look absolutely shattered. You know, really, Chelsea have got a great chance of, of causing something of an upset here. Just want to touch on the Cole Palmer point there, Rob, with you, because he's top of the Premier League charts right now, level with Haaland on goal scored, 20 at the moment. Would Man City take him back now? Well, yeah, I probably. I mean, he, Pep Guardiola in his news conference today was asked the question, was was it a mistake to let Cole Palmer go? And he kind of shrugged as if to say, well, yeah, obviously now, you know, knowing what we know now that he's scored 20 goals in the Premier League and 23 in all competitions. The point that Guardiola made, though, was for two years, Cole Palmer has been asking to leave. He said that this isn't a situation where in the summer he knocked on the door and said, I need to go. Guardiola was adamant today in his news conference that for two two seasons, Cole Palmer has been saying, I want to go. And that was all down to, to minutes. Um, he wasn't getting the, the minutes at City that he's been getting at Chelsea. The final straw, apparently, for him was in the summer when Riyad Mahrez left to go to to Saudi Arabia, he thought that that was his chance probably to, to maybe get some real game time at City. And then City went out and bought Jeremy Doku anyway, who plays in a very similar position. And when Cole Palmer saw that Jeremy Doku was was coming in, decided, well, that's that's it. I, I need to go. Um, I need to go and find regular first team football. Uh, you know, at the time, City thought they got a great deal for Cole Palmer. He was a young player who hadn't really played very much. You know, 42 and a half million pounds, they thought was a great deal for a player like that. Um, and even though he was very, very highly rated, I'm not sure that anyone really saw Cole Palmer producing the type of form that he has done this season. Everyone knew at City that he was a good player. You know, did people think that he was a 20-goal Premier League forward at 21 years old? Probably not. You know, in hindsight now, it, it does look a little bit of a mistake for, for City. Who have you got, Janish, in this game? Yeah, I mean, mistake, just quickly, you know, I mean, Foden was more patient. Same situation, right? I mean, sometimes you have to wait. If Pep Guardiola was absolutely sure that he was the man, he'd probably give him a time. But it could be a mistake. All coaches make mistakes. I hope that, uh, you know, uh, it's a big game, right? Because against some of the big teams, I mean, he scored some goals. United, four, actually, I think, this season. But we know where United is. Uh, so this is the sort of game that I think if Chelsea are going to have a chance, by the way, then Cole Palmer, Palmer ha is going to have to be at their best because uh, although I hear you, this is a probably best time for Chelsea uh, uh, to do it. I mean, they have zero excuse uh, uh, not to do it. I still think that even with the fact that Kevin De Bruyne and Holland and Manuel Kanji uh, asked all out, you know, I mean, it looks a bigger issue with Holland, who, by the way, was not existent in both legs. And, and I think they can deal without him. They have done it in the past. Uh, they'll do it again. John Stones will come in. Uh, and I still think that Manchester City uh, will find a way to, to win a trophy and beat Chelsea here. against Bayern Munich. Talk to us about what you think is going to happen here. Oh, by the way, we all got our predictions right, did, did we not? We had, for sure, we had this final four. Uh, I didn't. Interestingly enough, the one that I got, I got right was Dortmund. Uh, I don't know why Dortmund of all the uh, other favorites, but anyway, I mean, you know, uh, we've seen this uh, movie before on numerous occasions uh, when it comes to Real Madrid and Bayern Munich, and there's probably reason for that, right? Uh, they are royalty of, of this competition. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and, and, and it's not just for the past, but in particular for uh, what they did in their uh, in the you know in the last matches because I don't think they necessarily were the favorites. I'm not saying that Real Madrid are underdogs, but I think after that result, uh, 
uh, at the Bernabeu 3-3, everybody felt that maybe we're going to see the same story as we did uh, did last season. Manchester City are going to see it through. They didn't through a, a, a extremely good performance from uh, Real Madrid, heroic, uh, in in maybe not a desperate way because some seem to uh, suggest that, uh, and I certainly won't because I thought it was a tremendous uh, display of what Real Madrid are all about. And same could be said about Bayern Munich uh, with Thomas Tuchel, uh, knowing that he's not going to be in, uh, uh, there at the end of the season. Uh, astute tactician, as we all know, right? Uh, Thomas Tuchel, I think if you give him one or two games, so he's done it with Chelsea when he came in January, remember when they won it? Uh, I don't necessarily think that this was a superb Chelsea team, certainly not their, one of their best. Uh, and he saw it through, and, and once again, he did his homework watching Arsenal play against Porto and took care of, um, you know, the likes of Saka or the white game in general and, and, and saw it through. So, again, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, massive two clubs that have been or have met in this competition so many times that I don't even remember. He was definitely helped along, though, Tuchel, wasn't he? Because we actually saw desire from these Bayern players that perhaps we haven't seen too much at all in the Bundesliga this year. This is a competition they showing themselves to want. They worked so hard in that game against Arsenal. Well, they did. I mean, obviously, it helps a little bit that uh, that this is the only thing that's left for the mighty Bayern Munich. Uh, uh, you know, don't forget about that because that plays a big role. I'm not saying if they were the champions of Bundesliga right now uh, uh, that they wouldn't uh, go for it. But I think the momentum and, and confidence would have been so much different. So I think we always knew that this Bayern Munich team has been underperforming. There's a reason why Thomas Tuchel resigned. Um, otherwise, he'd probably be forced to uh, uh, to go. Uh, and, and certainly, you can't look at the season uh, as a good one because it hasn't been. So uh, it's one way of, uh, I suppose, or a chance to salvage a little bit because there's so much quality in that team. Real Madrid's second leg at the Bernabeu, Yanis. I know that's a big, big deal when it comes to a tie like this. Of course, and we've seen uh, what, what uh, Real Madrid are capable of. As they've shown against Manchester City, uh, they're capable of going away, but certainly at the Bernabeu, a little bit like Atleti, right? I mean, they're a different team than when they're home. Uh, and uh, when they're away, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they've gone through a gauntlet of teams a couple of seasons ago when they won it. They beat just about everybody, uh, you know, in terms of the big boys. So uh, uh, it, it certainly is an advantage. Uh, but, but this time around, it's not just an advantage. Uh, um, not just an advantage of second leg, but they are, I believe, slightly uh, uh, a better team than Bayern Munich. So they, they'll be favourites, no doubt. They, they are favourites for me now to, to win it all. There you go. You've just answered my next question. So you've got Real Madrid in the final here. But who will they be facing? The other game is PSG against Borussia Dortmund. And I'll start with Borussia Dortmund because you said that's one team that you did pick. And it's not that surprising when you watch the Bundesliga because one thing we know about Borussia Dortmund is to expect the unexpected. You're just as surprised either way with them if they either play really bad or they play really well. Well, they have the pedigree as well. Uh, the teams that are left have the pedigree to a, to a larger degree or smaller degree, obviously in terms of winning, but they've won this competition. They've been very consistent over the seasons, even if things don't go well for them in the Bundesliga, which is the case as well for them because they're fighting for their lives uh, uh, to, you know, to get back. Although no, because five places or Italy got it. So they're, they're fighting, they're, they're fighting for it right now, uh, but but they are a much different team in the, in the Champions League. And I think, you know, maybe that pedigree maybe a little bit of experience with some of these players, key players that are still remaining with the squad of, uh, of Dortmund, uh, uh, helps a bit. And as I've mentioned, Atleti away from home, not always the greatest uh, a team. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I just felt that, uh, you know, that one goal, remember, Ta because I mean, it was all Atleti in the first leg. And the first half alone, I think it should have been maybe 4 0 for Atletico Madrid, but it didn't happen. Some key substitutions. What I like about this Dortmund team, the couple of players that are so key to them are finally coming good. And one of them is Julian Brandt, one of my favorite players. Uh, you know, we not we talk now so much about Bayer Leverkusen. Remember, you know, uh, when he was leaving, when, when Brandt was leaving Leverkusen, I think it has taken all these years now finally for me to see the brand from years ago because uh, uh, he was the spark plug in the game in the game against uh, Atleti uh, away when he came uh, came in the second half and and here he was absolutely wonderful and and you know if you look at Zabitzer my goodness uh, I mean it's just all of a sudden you know against Gladbach couple of goals 
also had a, the, the, the weird penalty, didn't he? Uh, yeah. Scored, but it was then called back. And then in this game, a great goal and two incredible assists. The the, the cross to uh, to Fulkrug for that header was uh, picture perfect. So um, so you know it's good when you key players uh, uh, contribute and start playing. You know to that degree as well. We've seen their wide games is dangerous with that Amy and all that. So uh, I, I like them against Atleti here. It's a different ball watch, and, and I'm saying game. that. But what are they going? What, what's going to be their problem here against the PSG side with a Kylian Mbappe? And if Kylian Mbappe is on his day, I just think that after all these great years, after the the plastic project, after the Messi's, Neymar, the Mbappes of the world, the, the Galacticos of 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 you know. Well, the second Galacticos, if you will, because you have to consider how much Madrid the, the real Galacticos. But, you know, as close as it comes to that, uh, after that push, which, by the way, was unsuccessful, although we have to say that uh, PSG were in the semifinal and the final of this competition. But now they changed it. Lucho has the experience, an incredible coach. He's trusted uh, the young players because there is a turn turnaround in terms of philosophy at PSG where they no longer want these big, big names. They want to keep some of the young French players that have gone elsewhere why have they gone elsewhere because there's no place for them uh to be uh amongst the galacticos they would never get a chance uh, uh you know so so what i'm seeing right now is that belief it's it's obviously i would imagine a lot less pressure now because nobody expected uh, uh psg to be where they are right now but usman dembele Lucho found a way to kind of rein him in somehow, right? Remember all the issues he's had? And by the way, Usman Dembele uh, uh, just played against uh, Barcelona's former team, and now he's going to be playing against uh, uh, Borussia Dortmund. And remember how he left. Nobody really knows because, if I remember correctly, Dortmund didn't even know where he was and and what happened to him when when he's left. So that's going to be interesting, but it seems that uh, uh, Lucho Enrique has found a way to... Uh, for him to be not selfish. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of goals, but he's one of the most dangerous players in, in all of Europe in terms of his contributions. Uh, so, you know, the story goes on and on and on. And Kylian Mbappé um, um, obviously probably wants to play against his future team, assuming that Real Madrid, by my predictions, are going to be there, right? He's going to be taking the fifth and final penalty shot when PSG meet uh, Real Madrid. I don't you've know. got you've got PSG Real Madrid in the final. Going to penalties? Uh, phew, yeah, I mean, right now it's so early that I could say anything. Later People on forget, today, right? so uh, make sure that you stick um, around with us. Yeah, why, well, you know, the afternoon, um, no, I don't know if it's going to be zone, the home I don't want to see that. I don't want to. I don't because want these it is players going to be an to absolutely so excellent way to their, spend your you know, super Saturday afternoon. Well, we do have to uh, get to it now, I think, Emma. I've got to let you go so that you can get up to the commentary box and delight us all with your analysis of this one. So please do enjoy it and we'll leave you with our commentator, Chris Sharples. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So here we go again then with Barcelona and Chelsea meeting in a Women's Champions League semi-final here on zone, the global home of women's football. Last season, it was Barcelona who overcame Chelsea en route to their third final. In a row, en route to their second European title. And that all started at Stamford Bridge on that occasion, and away win protected at the camp now, saw them over the line, but it's all reversed this time around. And so can Chelsea come here to the home of the world's best, who haven't lost at home competitively in five years, and do what Barcelona did to them almost a year ago.
Graham Hansen with five goals in the Champions League. Graham Hansen's goals against Chelsea last season critical to their success. Not better than Stephanie Frappa, our referee today, arguably the world's best referee in the women's game. She'll have video assistance as well in the shape of Katalin Kucha of Hungary also. For Chelsea, will the back five for them remain the same from their midweek win against Aston Villa? Flurry of quality in front of that back five, though. Only Shook and Newson started on Wednesday. James and Ramirez up top, needing to take chances when they come their way, you feel. And on the bench, great to see Millie Bright available again after lengthy injury. So here we go then, strap yourselves in everyone, the start of what should be semi-finals brimming with drama, tension and the rest. Barcelona defending champions against Chelsea who desperately want to get their hands on a trophy they have yet to lift. Who makes it to Bilbao in some 35 days from now. Emma Byrne knows what he takes to win this competition with Arsenal, the only English team to have done so. Get their thoughts in just a moment as Aitana Bomati making ground. And a cross comes in, which Cuthbert in the end hucks up into the skies. And now Rolfer takes over. Here is Patrick Guerrero as Barcelona straight away in a mean business. Yeah, a bit of a shaky start there for Chelsea. It's a good ball in from Mariona Caldente. Buchanan failed to clear it. And these are the moments that you really want to settle down and get your clearances in. Just looking at Chelsea's lineup a little bit different than what I thought. Luskin stays in the middle. He crosses into oh, a really dangerous area, Carolina Graham Hansen. Well, if she stays on her feet, you could be looking at 1-0. Yeah, just a little bit slow to start, Chelsea. You can see Ashley Lawrence here, who's playing left full-back. She knows Graham Hansen is there, but then just doesn't get in front of her. She needs to go and win that ball. You can't allow Graham Hansen that time. But he can't allow Barcelona to get off to a, a fast start as we saw in Gothenburg when they played each other in the showpiece final. Oh, they are well up for this Barcelona here in Aitana Bonmati already looking as cool as ever on the ball. Here is Engen for Barcelona. And their sixth semi-final appearance in a row, equaling Lyon's competition record. Lyon will be in action later today against Paris Saint-Germain. It's being Barcelona's seventh overall. They dare to dream of another a Champions League success in the homeland this time. But here's Ramirez and now Lauren James for Aaron Cuthbert and the first chance for Chelsea to get a feel of the football. Yeah, it's well won back. Ramirez will keep that ball. She does well and those are the moments that Chelsea are really going to have to utilise because... You know, Emma Hayes has said it in her pre-match as well. She knows they're not going to see as much as the ball as they're used to. But definitely not the best start for Chelsea. Bit of a nervy start, I would say. And time they give it away, the free kick. The challenge on Neve Charles. Might be a bit more of a freshness about Barcelona, considering Chelsea were in action in midweek against Aston Villa winners again. In the WSL to go back to the top of the WSL. Yeah, crazy schedule for Chelsea. Don't really want to talk about it too much because it's a better today's game, but there is a lot of, of game time in these legs out here. But fortunately for Emma Hay, she's got a big enough squad that she was able to rest players midweek. What I do find interesting is how Emma has lined up here. She has Ashley Lawrence left back and Neve Charles is one of her centre, one of her three centre backs, which is something I haven't seen before. Paruelo just couldn't quite take it in a stride and Jess Carter who is matching her every step of the way there. 
Mahrez did mention that they were expecting Barcelona to have a lot of possession today. It could be a case of uh, patience for Barcelona. But they do have a fair bit of pace amongst them, Chelsea, here, to try and get in behind when the time comes. But the turnover there. Though, Stephanie Frappard has given the free kick to Barcelona in no mood to hang around. No, Chris, that's exactly what Chelsea will be looking to do when they win it, it back. Can they get in behind them? That's where Ramirez comes in. She's quick, she's powerful. The Barca players will be very much used to her having played against her at Levante and they'll be looking for that that's the ball that's the exact ball they'll be looking for in behind Rolfo there who tends to get a little bit high they're looking for that space in there to get Ramirez in on it An awareness from Casacol it's going to the nod over uh, Sandra Panos who will be departing Barcelona at the end of the season Panos Casacol has made the number one spot her own after thrilling second half of the World Cup and she got the nod ahead of uh, Visa Rodriguez Charles hand it back to Anna Hampton who's uh, Solid with the ball at her feet, as you have to be, and a modern-day goalkeeper. She's so good. Just even that delivery into that space behind Barca left-back. It's exactly what she brings, and she'll keep possession, and it's so important, as you said, and it's what the Chelsea staff have been looking for for so long. There's Engen, who's suddenly been... Uh, oh, Slipped there by Erin Cuthbert. But she's filled in the void pretty well with Mappy Leon not available due to injury. He's back on the grass, as I, I mentioned earlier. It should be a huge relief whether she'll be back in time for the end of the season, should they get to Bilbao. Yeah, I mean, they won't be thinking about that yet. They, they know that they have a, a job to do here and, and back in London, but... Yeah, she, she's done well, but with a player like Mappy Leon missing, it's a massive loss. It's Graham Hansen in her sort of area. Oh, put behind by Jess Carter. Some thought that might have been going in. But there's the danger, Graham Hansen in behind. Yeah, that's what Chelsea are trying to stop. Happen. They're trying to stop that feed into Graham Hansen. Because if she gets in a 1v1 situation, and this time was against Neve Charles, her stats show that she will come out on top. Just the uh, 17 goals, 16 assists in Liga Refa this season for Graham Hansen. Five goals in the Champions League as well. Not bad at all. She feeds it in here, it's a flick on from Mariona Caldente, and it's bobbling around the place, and it has to hold on to it. I mean, this is one area that Chelsea should be dominating. When that ball goes in high, they should be going and winning it. In this case, it's just position-wise. You can see Erin Cuthbert there is, is playing nearly a zonal system, but she has to go to that ball, so she's always second there, and that's where I would be asking my players to get a little bit tighter and try and get there and win that ball at the front post. Chelsea currently unbeaten in the last nine Champions League matches. Most of these two teams coming through unscathed through the group stage. Chelsea getting the better of Ajax. It's away from home where they really did the damage in the first leg. Barcelona had to work really away from home to get uh, a result in Bergen against Brand before doing the job back at home. Barcelona top in their group for the third year in a row. Cuthbert. 
about how Emma Hayes brings out a bit of an animal in her. She's so important for Chelsea, isn't she? This season more so than ever. She has worked relentlessly in there, and, and particularly these two games last year, I think she was excellent in that midfield. Yeah. She's the one that has to go in and harry and, and hustle and win that ball back, and she's going to need to do that for a full 90 minutes today. There's a bit of a knock, which sort of not play the start against Aston Villa. Which they won by three goals to nil. Uh, Chelsea, although they were helped along the way with Anna Lee being sent off to just four minutes for uh, handling outside of her area. It's a nice ball to try and get Rizzi Cutter it away. Up she goes. Hankin doing enough to keep it in play as well. Racing Cutlery can offer that direct approach, loves to take on defenders, proper old school in a way. Yeah, it was a good play from Chelsea. I thought she might have taken a shot a little bit earlier, but it's good to see her getting high up because that's difficult. It's difficult when you're playing wing back in that position to get higher up the pitch. And you know, she, generally, she plays a little bit higher, but that again, it's, it's that ball in behind, and that's exactly what they're looking for. Walsh for Patrick. Walsh up against many uh, international teammate here this afternoon. Itana Bomati, world's best player. You can you feel the uh, sense of occasion here. Such a packed crowd. And Barcelona looking to make things happen. With Onabadji getting forward now. Oh, it for the pass. Graham Hansen for Onabadji again. Who cuts it back. And Chelsea got to deal with it. And that will go out for a throw rather than a corner. Ona nearly had too much time to think about it there. She did have a chance to, to have a shot. Perhaps the next time we'll see that. But I was just about to say, usually you only have to talk about two, three players in a team, don't you, to be careful of, to to try and nullify but not Barcelona very different here <laughs> it's Badger again first taste of getting this far playing actually in the Champions League back at her home club but uh, some time with Manchester United facing Chelsea in an FA Cup final last season Chelsea losing to Manchester United not so long ago and Anton Heraldes was in attendance at Lee Sports Village Part of the uh, little wobble that Chelsea have had, losing the Conti Cup final as well to Arsenal. Here is Hannah Hampton. Definitely opportunities for Chelsea to play out. You can see that Barca are pressing in a two, and as you can see Chelsea have got three centre backs. So with the goalkeeper, they should, they should be able to play out and try and find those pockets in that midfield. Oh, it's just handed it back to Mariona Caldente. What a uh, thought process was that. Paruelo. Well, that's the chance you're taking with Buchanan unfortunately you're not sure what you're going to get from her and it's moments like that, that you're holding your breath some days she can be absolutely excellent and other days she can make mistakes like that here's Engen and Mariona Caldenti just dropping it reminder no Alexia Puteas from the start Mariana Caldente has been a, an absolute pillar of Barcelona's success. So underrated, really. Lawrence to get forward, but the cover is there. From Monabadja, that might have gone out of play, and it has done. Yeah, it's just, it's just crazy to think that you've got such a fantastic world-class player sitting on the bench that cannot get into this team it's nothing to do with injury it's nothing to do with 
well, I suppose it is for him, but just cannot get a, a game in here in this midfield. And Duncan Corrales has got his three midfielders, like Kira Walsh with Caro and like Tanabon Mati, and that must be difficult to take as well. Who'd be a coach, hey? Caldente, who's, who's had her fair share of heartbreak as well with not starting in particular Champions League finals. She just brings something very different to this team. She finds those lines of passes, she finds those spaces that other players don't find and just offers you those passing angles and so, so clever moving in and out of the lines. Chelsea would come at them playing more vertical and direct than maybe the likes of Manchester City or Arsenal. You look at WSL teams. I think that might have gone down well with that. Well, she won't care. <laughs> she won't care if she gets any kind of result here. But you know what? What is wrong with direct? You've got a player like Ramirez in there who's a team way stronger and probably. for midweek and his wasn't giving much away about Brian James's uh, fitness. She's with that roaming role of hers. That's looking to go for the switch. Decaverate here. Not quickly, but I can see that too, Catacol. Oh, 
by four backs. Chelsea reaching a fifth Women's Champions League semi-final. Just that win in that time when they got beyond Bayern to to Gothenburg. In the end, it was lots of brilliance, really. Sends it in once again. Aitana Bomati. What's she going to do? Take it on herself. against Villa in the week. It was possibly looking pretty well from a time playing here in Spain with Levante. Big money that was spent to bring her to the WSL. She never scored against Barcelona. Well, oh, I did mention that fact to Emma Hayes before the game. I just got the two weeks. Coaches right on the edge of their technical areas. Conclusion. Cosburn with a 
free kick here for Chelsea. It's sent it in. That's some coverage around the back. He clears it away. Chelsea. with the cross. Way back into our direction, and now Brad Hansen has it for Barcelona. Lawrence trying to steal it back. How he goes? The uh, Barcelona for sure. to give away winners from the quarterfinals have already received their prizes. So to be in with a chance of winning a personal message from a Team Visa footballer, share with us the pep talk you'd like to give your team right now. The zone on the DAZN mobile or web app. Here's Edgar. Kill Walsh. Stale's very own. The Paredes. Stale's having four games. Paredes in the Champions League this season. Paredes just a little bit smoke into it. Victorious on this ground in this most magnificent stadium this season. Put far beyond Real Madrid. The first classic out of the campaign. Three winners against them as well. Just showing the level above everybody else here in Spain. Better team, bigger teams, more physical, but do you know what? They just 
they prove you wrong every time and they, they match them and they've just grown and grown in that physical aspect. Now they've got literally everything and they keep adding to the squad as well. for Chelsea. Oh, match and big run in all competitions. Ten match winning run in the league and in the Copa and in the Champions League. As you mentioned since February in that 1-1 draw with Levante. Typically the FA by 13 points from Real Madrid. Beaten in the league since the final day of last season. League final last season, the World Cup as well, through the pain barrier she's been talking about. She's been ruthless in a score again. So we did that last league game against Vera. Here's Ramirez. Here's Lanka. Holding it up. Oh, it's right. There's a penny way. Stay 
history to 1992. And here for a lot of these players, with the uh, Paris Olympics, the horizon. Scored a first Chelsea goal from the set piece midweek. Jonathan, Jonathan. Antonio Aldez. He's just been caught back. He's got a fair way out of his technical zone. The uh, out of the United States as as will be. Figo native, incredible background with coaching and his analytical insights.
Barcelona have been stunned by a wonderful finish from Aaron Cuthbert. First half, perhaps keep those positive pep talks coming in. Who's your standout player of that first half? Who's impressed you the most? Let us know in the fan zone via the Dazone mobile or web app. We'll let you know who came up top shortly. Well, well, well. Just talking about Eric Cuthbert, we were saying where we have much is to Chelsea. I feel like she's been asked to do a more defensive role this season. This Barcelona looked to respond. As a reminder, a team competitively haven't lost at home in five years. Extraordinary. Let's see how they react. Because they haven't really had to react before. They find themselves in new territory. But they won't panic. 22 and draw one of the last 23 in Europe at home. Sparrow, can she get in here with full back for Graham Hansen? Away he goes. Here is James with Anchor. Chelsea are going to have to be careful now because Barcelona are going to come right at them. They're looking to level things ahead of half time. Yeah, they will. And, and Chelsea need to be careful of that area where Mariona Caldente is finding herself. She drifts wide like now. And also she drifts into like the number 10 area, which Chelsea have decided they're going to put someone in there to stop her playing because what's happening is she's finding that space in that number 10 area and just turning and she's able to play Cariello in. And International Player of the Year. Aaron Cuthbert. Here's Lawrence, and away from Badger. This game is uh, straight on towards three points. Pick up as well. To close it to space. The approach to half time. Giant foundation laid by Chelsea getting into the break. The goal up. It's 17 of the last 19. 
Champions League matches now, Chelsea. And the WSL, by the way, they've won 13 matches, but they've scored the opening goal this season. It's going to be the same here this afternoon. I don't, I don't think we can even compare. You never know. Go into another gear, like you just can't switch off. And this is where Chelsea needs to be very, very careful. Like if one player switches off, we've seen a couple of times Luskin just losing her position a little bit, and it's just a matter of time before Barca, as I said, just turn that screw and just find those players. Hampton hasn't really had a set to make yet. It's really to Tickets sold already for the second leg next week. So to the Chelsea website if you're interested in stamping up tickets to Stamford Bridge.
pockets that the players are dropping into and, and stick, stay with the players and keep the ball. Do not give the ball away. It's easier said than done, right? So easy. So easy. Chelsea get us back underway, leading through that Aaron Cuthbert wonder goal. And Chelsea will be uh, attacking the end where the pocket of fans up on the uh, top tier behind the goal of Catacola congregated. Second half performance uh, to uh, take anything back to Stamford Bridge a week from now. And what an occasion it will be at Stamford Bridge as well. Over 25,000 tickets sold. Your tickets now through the Chelsea website to be a part of the occasion and the story at Stamford Bridge. And no changes made, incidentally, by either coach. The break. Staying down here on Marione Caldente. This is Paruelo, hangs it up, Graham Hansen. And Aitana hits it. And Graham Hansen has a go as well. Now the flag goes up. I was just waiting for that flag to go up, to be quite honest, because it was, it was fairly obvious it was an offside. But it, just, it does show that Chelsea need to be wary of the seconds. In the first 15 minutes of the game, Barca were very, very quick to get on seconds, and, and Chelsea needed to wake up a little bit. They'll have to start that way again in this half. Just be careful of where the ball drops. Noise levels rising even more here. And here is Erin Cuthbert. Some goal worthy of the occasion. Goal worthy of a, maybe a, a final, not a lot of semi final. He will be determined to end on a high, winning another Champions League. Geraldes speaking eloquently and talking about his uh, affection for Emma Hayes. Magnificent job that Emma Hayes has done. And that the next coach will have a, a high bar to uh, follow and achieve. But it's his job to prevent her going out on a high as well, winning the only major trophy that she has not won in her 12 years as a Chelsea head coach. She wants that, she wants it bad, even if she does play it down. I'm sure she's been dreaming of it and, you know, probably not the best season for Chelsea. And I know that sounds a bit strange considering they're, they're, they're top of the WSL, semi finals the Champions League, but it has been a bit of a transition for them in terms of injuries and bringing in players. And I just think it would be very, very special if they were to do something here. Ashley Lawrence had been uh, admitting that the players had been talking of the possible quadruple. That is not to be the case now, I mean, Lost the nine Conti Cup final and losing to Manchester United in the semi finals of the FA Cup. Such a, such a difficult thing to do, Chris, to the quadruple. And I'm not taking anything away from us when we won it, but it's fierce competitive now. The league, the amount of games, the calendar is just incredible. It's written counter it. All those slalom runs, James in the way, Chelsea up high here. Lawrence Cup hitting inside and having a go. There was the Chelsea intensity right up in the faces of Barcelona. Course of the Champions League for Ashley Lawrence in over three years, going back to her Paris Saint Germain days. Spoke about the uh, Canadian factor moving to the club.
Here's Enke. Mariana dropping deep as she usually does. time that Barca tried to get Caroline Graham Hansen on the ball. Ashley Lawrence is there, just one step away, making sure she can't get a run at her, making sure she doesn't pick up the momentum with the ball. It's Badger. A better of low posts. So, the full here for Rolfa. And Patry, she's going to take aim. Oh, now that was the use of an arm, the worst penalty. Barcelona have a penalty and a route back into this semi final. Too much time, too much space for Patrick Guijarro. is probably one of the best at long range shots. Mistake from Buchanan. Look at that space that she has, and Buchanan is trying to shield off Barriuelo as well. Yeah, it's, an, uh, it's a handball. It is, a, her hand is in an unnatural position there. But it comes from the space and time you're going to give Patrick Caro there at the edge of the box. So a big moment in the semi-final. Mariana Caldente, their sole scorer of a penalty for the Champions League this season. And Barcelona's number nine will take responsibility now. Big moment. Time to wait a while. Hannah Hampton would have done her homework, would have watched lots of penalties from Caldente. And we're just waiting. It's a long time, isn't it? So whether This penalty is to be taken or not. The check is still ongoing. Everybody set and ready for the penalty to go ahead. Video assistance brought in at the latter stages of the competition. Well, they need to be a little bit more proactive with it and, and have the, the check there and then, right? It seems like they've done that. Wow. And it's enough for her to come over and have, for the referee to have a look at it herself. Yeah, Stephanie Frappa has been called across. And has been recommended to come across to the screen here by Kathleen Kusha, our video assist on whether. Side or not? She's offside. I think Pariuello is standing slightly offside. As the shot comes in. Well, this is a, a, a big moment, isn't it? There's no doubt that it struck the arm. Stephanie Frappe. It's not going to count. Flag up offside. That has not gone down well with the vast majority inside this place. Relief for Chelsea. And that's what Barra brings. Slight, the slightest of offside, but that's it. That heel. That was enough.
Well, there is plenty happening in the fan zone right now. Tisha Trivia in the fan zone quiz for a chance to win a VIP trip for two to the final in Bilbao. All you need to do is answer this question. You scored the most goals in the previous meetings between these two teams, as in Barcelona and Chelsea. Carolina, a Graham Hansen, Alexi Pateas, Guru Wright, and Aitana Bonmati are your options. Cuthbert doing the job here so far and we've had drama already with Barcelona they thought they'd had a penalty well, the tightest of offside calls and it is those small mar margins yeah could get Chelsea through and those are the moments that that galvanize the team as well in terms of Chelsea just getting through the game right in your look a little bit Chelsea looking to become the second English team to win the UEFA Women's Champions League. It's been a long time since you and Arsenal did it in 2007. Long, very long time. <laughs> Different life. Through with uh, Paris FC, Real Madrid, Hagen, the group stage Chelsea. Four teams actually who qualified automatically for the group stage with Barcelona and Olympic Lyonnais and Bayern. Graham Hansen on one of her runs, finding Friedelina Rolfa. Parueno. Oh, that was hit so hard. And I think is absolutely wiped out, Jess Carter. Well, we could hear that from here, couldn't we? Jess Carter has been excellent today. She's really put her body in the line. It, it hits her back, actually, not her head. Perhaps a little bit winded, but she's been so good in the right place at the right time. You can see what Barca are doing. They're pushing Frida Lina Rolfo up a little bit higher than they were. She's, so they're, they're trying to get her on the ball on that side. It just means Ona, Ona Batier has to stay back a little bit more. And, and that's what happens when Rolfo comes back into the team. We don't see Batier getting up enough. Well, that's where the penalty came from. Ona Batier managed to get past the halfway line and, and on one of her famous runs. Might see more of that in the second half. I've got to make sure all the precautions of a potential head injury are carried out, but this crowd, absolutely magnificent. Well, they were still coming in their thousands as well earlier today to get their hands on a ticket to get in here. Barcelona will be they get to Bilbao and be heading there in numbers, you feel, and it looks like Alexia Puteas is going to be making an appearance pretty soon. I think the crowd are sensing that also. They're getting a little bit excited, and I mean, it's not a bad player to be bringing on, is it? <laughs> That's a bit of an understatement. <laughs> I'm just looking, I was looking at the subs warming up, and you know, Chelsea have got a decent squad as well. You've got Gura Wrighton out there, she's warming up, she can bring something different. But with Alexia Puteas coming on, she'll demand the ball. She's extremely good at getting through pass lines, into spaces and committing players, which is probably what Barca need. I also see Claudia Pina warming up, prolific goal scorer. She's just so calm on the ball, and where Pariuelo might take shots when maybe they're not on. This is where Claudio Pina will come on and, and calm that moment in the game and make those right choices. So the game can restart. And Jess Carter eager to come back on. Here she comes. Such a, a progressive defender as well, isn't she? She's actually inside the top ten for touches in the Champions League this season, but also for the most forward carries in the competition as well gets Chelsea moving Ramirez is down now and cleared away 
by Carter. And she's holding her foot there. I think it's just Engen yep. accidentally. I was going to say accidentally. <laughs> Stepping on her. Well, the game restarts. Barca certainly weren't going to give it back, were they? Needs must for Barcelona here. Behind they are to Chelsea in this first leg of the semi final. Team, we've only conceded just six goals throughout their Liga FA campaign. There's always a threat with Chelsea here. Yeah, that was difficult, wasn't it? Buchanan, they gave a loose ball. It was a poor ball into Jess Carter. That's exactly what Emma Hayes is asking. You can see her trying to get Buchanan's attention there. Just have to make sure they don't give presents to Barca. They don't need that. Barca can create their own chances. So Alexia Putez, Lucy Bronze, changes that are imminent. Oh, now then. A call here for Chelsea, perhaps. It was a risky challenge to make. And this will get looked at closely. Vincent clears it away. Ramirez getting to her. Well, she's staying down, actually, Ramirez. You could see the Barca goalkeeper, Katakoi, going over there and having a word with her. As if to say, come on, open your feet. But actually, I actually think Ramirez has a good argument here. Paredes is all over. She makes the swipe. She doesn't get the ball. Surely they're going to look at that. Well, they're going to make the changes. So, Bronze and Puteas, Engen makes way. Another Baggio make way, so a straight swap between Baggio and Lucy Bronze. The armband returning to Alexia here. With rivalry for Lucy Bronze against fellow Lionesses. This is the case for Kira Walsh today. Some former Manchester City players. Yeah, you can see that Engen's come off. Patrick Guijarro's just dropped in there as a centre-back. She's done that before on plenty of occasions. And, and Lucy Bronze just a straight swap for Ona Batier. And for Ona, probably not her greatest of game. She struggled to get forward. It's Ramirez. Waiting for the support to arrive. Leipoltz, Nuskin, back for James now, and Lauren James. Just wondering who was going to eventually pull back the trigger. It was nice play from Chelsea, just being patient in that area. And if there's anyone you want on the ball, it's going to be Lauren James in there. She could have even taken another touch, really. Those are the last two appearances for club and country. It's Manchester United in the FA Cup and against the Republic of Ireland. Did score in the first leg of the quarter-final against Ajax as well. First goal in Europe this season. Zaitana Bonmatiwi barely said her name in the second half. No, I think I think Luke Holds and Nuskin have, have done a really good job on Bonmati. I think the Chelsea team in general have done great jobs and, and individually. Kanner as well. She's done a really nice job here defensively. 
then you've got Alexi Puteas coming on. They, and, you know, Cuthbert's job will be to, to try and stop her playing in that area. Here's Paruelo. Very happy for the game to go on. Paruelo can't keep it down. Chelsea will take that. And yeah, we've just seen evidence of that there. Alexia on the ball, and it's actually Leupold who gets back, and they're going to be, they're certainly going to earn their money out there today, Leupold and Cuthbert in there. Paruelo taking aim. Six goals in the UEFA Women's Champions League this season. Only Caddy Diani has scored more than her. Be in action for Lyon against Paris Saint Germain later this evening in the second semi final. A little short for Rolfa, just allowed Cuthbert to get there. Is Ramirez. Oh, she'll take the free kick. Chelsea can calm things down. Lopez was making a, a huge run through the middle. Yeah, Ramirez does really well. I, I actually think Caldante is lucky not to get a book in there. Because as you said, Ramirez was on the ball, comfortable, and Lopez had made a really nice run down that left hand side. A little earlier, we did ask you which player had scored the most goals in previous meetings between these two. Of course, it was Carolina Graham Hansen. If you got that right, why not take on the quiz in the fan zone via the DAZN mobile or web app? Chance to win VIP experience for two at next month's final. Paredes. Tona Bonmati. Barcelona, they always seem to score. Wolfsburg in this competition, the last team to stop them. All competitions in 2022. Another really important tackle there from Jess Carter. She's done so well today, stopping Pariuelo. Lawrence let this trickle out just to frustrate the masses even more. It's all at the minute going Chelsea's way. They're just trying to frustrate Barca, trying to take their time. Game management is key here today. And you can hear the crowd trying to get Hannah Hampton to hurry up, but that's not going to make that happen. Again, Hannah Hampton hasn't had that much to do in the full context of the game, really. She's not been seriously tested. She might be now, though. Graham Hansen going one way and then the other. Finds the angle for the cross. Just taken away from Alexia there. It's Jess Carter again in there, winning the ball. Well, the referee happy for things to go on. Alexia Puteas for Rolfa. And Cuthbert in the way. Frantic defence from Chelsea. It's good play from Barca. Really nice combination play from Buteas and Rolfo. Just one touch football, and that's what they need. They need to keep the ball moving and move it quickly. Tense it is here. The profit from a set piece, perhaps Barcelona. Anyway, we'll do from Lauren James. Myra Ramirez is looking just a little bit tired out there. So important just to hold the ball up, but to initiate that press and, and to stop the Barca centre backs getting forward. Here's Parajuelo, Buchanan. It's a clear of danger. It's in the final 20 minutes. There's uh, just a one goal in the semi-final first leg last year. That's the difference for Barcelona on that occasion. They protected it 
Back at the camp now, as it rolls reversed, 12 months on. And he goes, that was bronze. It's uh, Paul Matty sends it back in again, and those loose balls Chelsea will pick up on. That's in Canada here, for Grace with Paraguelo. Irene Paredes down there. Yeah, but look at Jess Carter again in there. She's been absolutely brilliant today. And Kanye it has done really well just carrying the ball, just keeping possession. There is Vicky Lopez. An example of Barcelona, Jonathan Heraldes. Giving use the foundation to show what they're all about. To uh, play with the most sub appearances in the Champions League this season. Yeah, great talent. Incredible. Bringing on a 17 year old, 1 0 down. Asking her to, to go in there and unlock that. Getting forward. Try to, to break down this solid Chelsea defence, and she's very, very good at that. A sign from Madrid, CFF. It should be coming on pretty soon. Serraldes so looks to find a way, find those answers to break Chelsea down. Carter has just been enormous. James it's gonna come loose we will get there first Bronze got there first so here's the change Mariona's coming off for Vicky Lopez still question marks about Mariona Caldente's future she says she's pretty calm with regards to the talks that are going on. But as uh, Mariona makes her way off, Vicky Lopez, who made a full senior debut for Spain against the Netherlands in the Nations League at just 17 years and six months. And gone here, and Lauren James is making way for Chelsea. And it's going to be Katarina Macario who will come on as her replacement. She was terrific in the week against Aston Villa. What sort of impact can she make here? She's such a good player as well. Brilliant. She hold up play is excellent. Macario and bringing in players. Uh, Hampton keeping it in. Yeah, Emma Hayes talking about Macario on the build up. And they've had to be patient for good reason. The Katarina Macario's wretched injury has kept her out for so long. Picked up in the uh, final game for Lyon in June of 2022. There she is now. Lawrence. I think Lauren James, she did well just towards the, the end there. I think the reason she was taken off is because she was just tiring and, and giving balls away, particularly that one that went across. She can't afford to do that. It's Anna Bomati, he's giving it away here. I think Lopez is there to intercept. Chelsea won't play again until the second leg next week. And so we've got Barcelona's turn to have a Midweek game. So they look to edge closer and closer to a, another title. Big time winners in Spain, they are. Mara Ramirez, what could she get through? 
What a race this is with Patrick Ejaro and Ramirez has done brilliantly well. Ramirez to finish. Did everything, absolutely everything right. Until the execution. Big moments in this semi-final. Oh, she's such a handful, isn't she? And actually, it's Patrick Ejaro back there and she does well. Patrick Ejaro just to slow her down a little bit. But that's a chance. Ramirez will be disappointed. She at least doesn't make Katakoi make a save there. Those are the moments, though. Those are the moments she needs to work on a little bit more. That in front of goal, she does ever so well to get on the end of it, to hold it up. You can see she's struggling a little bit also. She's, she's worked her socks off today. She scored her first European goal against Ajax in the second leg at Stamford Bridge. Mara Ramirez. Coming into the club. Shoes to fill with Sam Kerr missing. That crucial ligament injury. It's Vicky Lopez now. And that's the space for Barsex, that switch ball. Vicky Lopez is, is hugging this line over here. Oh, the touch from Sama Paruelo just didn't have enough. Back into the path of Alexia Pateas. Aitana Bombati. No way to go. Buchanan did really, really well to read that from Paruelo. She just stepped off her. It was an easy pickup from her. But these are the moments that Chelsea really need to dig in. Because this, these are the moments that Barca come into their own and start popping the ball, especially with Alexi Pateas on the pitch. She just picks up that area and she's so good on the ball. The uh, regular influences for Barcelona just haven't been able to influence enough in this game so far. The likes of Aitana Bonmati, who was absolutely unplayable in the comeback in the final last season against Wolfsburg when they came back from 2-0 down. Uh, a scorer in that final ever pile for Wolfsburg. She's been mentioned as a, a new name that could be coming into Barcelona. Well, it is what they're missing. They are missing an out and out number nine. Yep. Mariuela does really well up there. She's very quick, but she, I don't think she has the instinct of a, a world-class number nine actually think she's better in the left-hand side and cutting in. Sometimes we've seen Alexia Pute is playing up there as a number nine, a false nine, and that's definitely not her position. Rolf is Heather. Let's encounter it. It's been a, a sensation this season. Proper tormentor. Cuthbert loses out. Puteas. Atana caught on the heels again, and it was Nuskan who got back there. One of the most reliable players, one of the most versatile players in this Chelsea squad as well. Shukin Nuskan's played pretty much everywhere this season. And everywhere very well. <laughs> We've seen her play up in, in, in the two nearly with Lauren James against Arsenal. She was excellent. Ramirez dragged back. Patrick might be getting a yellow card here. And she does. And I don't think she can have many complaints. Again, Ramirez just causing trouble. So strong. No, and you're right. Guijaro definitely can't argue about that. But maybe it's the only way to stop Ramirez. It seemed that way. Commissioner Patry's yellow card. And some reports that it's my contact with regards to the uh, national team as to whether they should be returning for the Olympics. I'd be groveling if, I, if we'd a player like Patrick Guerrero. <laughs> Macario produced here. 
10 to go. Macario swings this in. Pateas is there first. Macario. He's in color it away from Alexia Pateas, but not away from Fridolina Rolfo, although he might just be stealing it back. That's been a very nice battle, hasn't it, today? You know, Rolfo seen at the start of the second half getting higher but in general she's been pulled back there to try and deal with Canyarid. I think Chelsea have done that excellently in terms of both the wide players Onabatier taking off that's a huge compliment to Chelsea I think Chelsea's midfield have been excellent in there yeah, Rizzin Canyarid talking about how yes Barcelona were better last season but the uh, development of this Chelsea team physically stronger to get at Barcelona. We've seen that today. Vicky Lopez. Oh. Well, they're all up in arms, and it is an arm. That is the reason why this is going against Barcelona. Well, I think it's a little bit harsh, to be quite honest. But just look at the back press from that Chelsea midfield. Just working so hard to get back with Caroline Grain Hansen on the ball, making her runs as she does so well. That midfield, no, they have to make it back and they have to put pressure on her. There's Vicky Lopez. Alexia Puteas, two time Ballon d'Or winner. Back for Kira Walsh and Aitana Bonmati. Paredes. Bronze, will she get there? She will. How heavy is the touch? Stayed in play. Paruelo. Sharp turn. Alexia's waiting for it right on the edge. Can't be found. Super blocks to stop the cross. Ramirez. There's a card being produced here. Irina Paredes. It just adds to the tension and the frustration all round for Barcelona. That, that's it, isn't it? It's frustration. Because Chelsea are just doing well to get out to the ball, get to the ball first. We talked about second balls and how Barca were doing well, but now it's Chelsea's turn. And that is frustration. And it's a nice way to, to get your team together and, and take a little bit of a time out for Chelsea. Don't forget the second leg is the next weekend, the uh, 27th of April. The uh, late afternoon kickoff in West London at Stamford Bridge. 25,000 plus tickets sold already. You can head to the Chelsea website to get your hands on a ticket if you haven't already done so. What an occasion it's going to be. Still feeling it here, Shukanuska. So is the crowd. They want this game to get underway again. Muskin is on her feet. to rile up 40,000 <laughs> people. Yeah, so close here, Chelsea, to a huge win. Was we'll set up that second leg at Stamford Bridge. 
Here's Macario. Dare they score another one? Well, well, that's the thing. They should have scored, shouldn't they? Ramirez should have. They should be 2 0 up from Ramir Ramirez, but. I mean, it's all to play for. It's kind of the best scenario, isn't it? Barca, who are this giants in women's football, have to go and have to start well, come out of the blocks, and it's what we wanted to see. Vicky Lopez. Barcelona come again, Aitana Bombati to find the space, find the moments. Graham Hansen in Perwillo! Whoa! Was that Barcelona's moment? Good play. Caroline Graham Hansen comes in a little bit more central, but what a ball from her. It's the first time we've seen character get caught a little bit position-wise. Cariuelo had more time. She had more time, she should have taken it down. Play clocking 30 goals in all competitions. And she's too short of uh, clocking a half century in her career in all competitions. Here's Rolfa. Ramirez, how much is still left in that tank? Plenty, it looks like. And off she goes, all on her own at the minute. What a run this is, Ramirez! And there's nobody else there. Incredible from Ramirez. Such a strong player. And Patrick Iharo is probably cursing Jonathan Uraldes for making her go back there and deal with that. Three for Paraguelo. I just caught her yet again with a giant contribution. Incredible. Alexia plays it in. Here is Kira Walsh. And Carter will get it clear. Well, it's time to let us know who your Visa Fan Zone player of the match is. Let us know in the Fan Zone on the DAZN mobile or web app. We'll reveal all at the end of the game. Aitana Bombati. Fridolina rolls up. Across it goes. And across and beyond everybody. Send back in once more. Goal kick. Well, that's more like it from Barca. And this is the player that makes that happen. Just unlocks those little intricate passes. It's the first time we've seen Fridolina Rolfo up there getting that ball whipped across. I'd expect more of that. That's what Barca do. That's when they're at the top level. Just those little passes, drawing defenders in and creating those spaces in the wide areas. Late warnings for Chelsea. And they hang on here. Facing the only one of their 19 different UEFA Women's Champions League opponents that they have not beaten. A pretty good record coming here to Spain. And getting results. Oh. She's laughing and smiling at the haze down there. Why wouldn't you be? Well, that it is all going for Chelsea as we're into the final minute of the 90. Realistically, Emma Hayes would have come here hoping to be still in the game next week. Never mind a foot ahead of Barca. So, of course, she's laughing and smiling. <laughs> it says a lot about her team as well. And the way they set up, when they set up, we saw Neve Charles playing centre back, she Lawrence playing left back, Canarin playing right wing back. 
but it is worked. It's on the Bonmati. Barcelona keep on coming. We're going to have nine additional minutes. Three for Paraguelo if she can get it out of her feet. Back for Alexia Puteas. They just cannot find a way through Barcelona here. As we are now beyond the 90. It's a stoppage time. So much of it still to be played. On Vicky Lopez. Angles it, but too close to Hannah Hampton. The breather for Chelsea. And they will welcome that nine minutes. It's a long time. If you're going to allow Barca to come at you like this. And we can see who are right in there, ready to come on. Give that a little bit more energy on the pitch. Oh, Carter, away with that one. It's in Calarud. It's away from Vicky Lopez. Carrier, or Walkwood, get it out of her feet. Another change could be made. So Guru Wrighton is going to be coming on here for Myra Ramirez, who has run herself into the ground. She has led the line so well, and no wonder she is getting the ovation that she deserves from those Chelsea fans. Well, I would be enjoying this moment if I were her. It just shows how much of a nuisance she's been. Well, actually, the crowd should be cheering that she's going off because she's been an absolute handful. And I said it already, she has worked so hard today. To the corners with a fair bit of time still to play. Macario. But her goal still remains the difference. Rolfo with the throw. To think that Barcelona have averaged scoring four goals per game in the Champions League this season. But they've been wasteful at times. But still, Hannah Hampton has not had a save to make in this game. No, and that says it all, really. Apart from Chelsea being absolutely excellent, and I think their back line and midfield have been... Well, <laughs> their forward line have been excellent also. I think Ars Barca can look at themselves, and have they made the right choices in those situations? Because they have created, it's just... I just don't think they had that finesse at the end, and... Yeah, down to decision-making, basically. Leopold turns the throw. An area where Barcelona do not want to be. This will only anger the beast even more going into the second leg if they've got to chase it. sends it in and Barca will get going straight away five minutes less than five minutes to get something here one from bronze Graham Hansen to an area where there's nobody there and Hannah Hansen. Oh, I think that kind of sums it up, doesn't Just it? Playing the game. Graham Hansen gets on the end. It's a, it's a moment there to exploit, and nobody coming in on that back post. And 
a poor ball in realistically. Goal contributions in Europe this season for Carolina Graham Hansen. But when she did come back and score those goals in the semi final last season, she was back in the nick of time after five months out with injury. In for the run in. I don't think Bears have played her in the game enough. I don't think they've got the ball to her enough. As much as I mend. Chelsea and doing a great job, but there have been moments where that she ha could have gotten on the ball. Alexia Putes. Vicky Lopez. Off she goes. Fresher impetus. Aitana Bonmati. Lina Rolfa. The ball that is Erin Cuthbert in the way she's been everywhere hasn't she Cotter will let this run well there is disappointment here in the week Barcelona's men's team knocked out of the uh, men's champions league to Paris Saint-Germain Defeat going to follow Vicar Aldez and his team. Rolfa with the header. Lucy Bronze. Into into space. Still she has it, and still she goes on. Right in for Macario, who's played just behind her. Oh, that's a great chance, though, isn't it? But yeah, just that little bit behind her, on her left foot. Disappointed she didn't connect with that a little bit more, but how well does Gura right and do over there? Initially, the initial thoughts were just to keep the ball, hold the ball, try to waste a bit of time, but realised she was in a great position to get the ball into the area. Carter, absolutely outstanding today. I'm glad we don't have to pick player of the match. I'm not sure if I could decide between Carter, Cuthbert. Oh, Paruelo. Paruelo. She will get there, but Hampton did just enough. Just enough. Straight to Macario, though. And it breaks down for Barcelona. And Chelsea have got space to the left. If Lopez could get ahead of, she couldn't. Graham Hansen now against Charles. Graham Hansen, oh, Buchanan, massive. Yeah, huge, huge header. Vicky Lopez, but not done yet, Barcelona. Time well and truly against them now. Graham Hansen, back for bronze, and she provide the quality. Paruelo's header, Carter hoists it. Patrick Iharo. Oh, no, no. Melanie Leupoltz. Giving away a free kick, which just allows Barcelona to gather themselves. That's a tired tackle, in. isn't it? One last time. It's a tired tackle. I thought maybe that chance from Pariuela was that the chance, but. Perhaps they'll get another one here. Just waiting as uh, Fulwer is sorted out. Well, that was the most obvious bit of information from the assistant coach there. Paruela swings it in, back across it goes, oh, Alexia Pateas! 
Oh, what a moment. What a chance. She can't believe it. The Barcelona fans can't believe it. Oh, I thought that was going to hit the back of the net. That's it. It's a Chelsea masterclass. It's an Emma Hayes masterclass. They have come to Barcelona and they will take a lead back to Stamford Bridge for the second leg a week from today. Erin Cuthbert's wonder goal just before half time being the difference in the end for the Blues. And a huge moment towards the end there for Alexia Puteas. Had she put that away, you look.